Good morning. Good morning. We are we're not going to quite close the doors yet. I'm Gene Phillips, Professor Emeritus of Japanese Art History here at UW-Madison. Ah. And co-organizer of this symposium with Stephanie Bennett, Assistant Professor here, and the Joan B. Mervis Chair of Japanese Art History. We're delighted to welcome you uh, to our event this morning, whether you're attending in person or um, through our streaming. Um, I will, Stephanie will be speaking to you very shortly um, about the nature of the symposium. In the meantime, I have the very welcome task of extending our thanks to all of those who have made this event possible. Our primary source of funding is the University of Wisconsin Anonymous Fund. But the UW-Madison uh, Department of Art History has also provided financial support with a significant portion coming from resources provided by Joan B. Mervis. Joan is in the audience today, so I would like to recognize her without her generosity. Japanese art history I didn't expect this. Would likely not have survived here, and it certainly would not have been able to flourish. Thank you, Joan. Oof. You should have seen me at my daughter's wedding. Our campus co-sponsors for this event are the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures, the Center for East Asian Studies, the Center for Visual Cultures, and the Chazen Museum of Art. We want to extend special thanks to individuals who have worked behind the scenes. Peggy Hacker, our department administrator, and Jane McCarthy, our department administrative assistant, have handled and are still handling all of the financial and travel arrangements, as well as numerous other tasks. Tanya Kolarik, a PhD student who serves as the department's social media coordinator, helped immensely with those elements and designed the poster. Finally, we also need to recognize those who have provided expertise necessary to the live stream of this event. Brett Vlach, the IT manager for the College of Letters and Science, has been a lifesaver, um, generously giving his time to coordinating the technological side of things. Patrick Sweeney of the McBurney Disability Resource Center has overseen the preparations for closed captioning, with Tony Christie providing the actual captions. Noah. Gil Fillon of Audio for the Arts has set up and is currently operating our actual broadcast along with his assistant whose name is? Maggie. Thank you. Maggie Gil Fillon? Thank you. Um, finally, Emery Jensen is providing technical support, especially in monitoring the live stream 
live stream for questions. And now I'll turn it over to my partner in crime, uh, Stephanie Bennett, uh, who will be continuing the introductory remarks. Can you hear me? Okay. Welcome, everyone, and thank you, Jean, for, for your uh, opening acknowledgments. I'd like to echo Jean's delight in at the opportunity to convene a symposium with today's distinguished speakers. Not only are they all pioneers in their fields and scholars of the highest caliber, but I also have the great fortune of calling them all mentors. First as a PhD student and then as a visiting researcher in Japan and now as an assistant professor at UW-Madison. So at the outset, I want to thank you all for the myriad ways you've supported me in the life of the mind. I also want to extend my sincere appreciation to Joan Mervis, who from day one has been an unwavering supporter of me and of course a long-standing supporter of the art history department at UW-Madison. When Jean first proposed the idea of a symposium on Japanese painting circa 1500, I was intrigued. This topic has the benefit of temporal specificity while also allowing for thematic breadth. More intriguingly, however, it presented the exciting and I might add rare opportunity to assemble a cohort of scholars to delve into a period of Japanese painting history, the late medieval era, that receives scant attention outside of Japan. The years surrounding the turn of the 16th century marked an important inflection point in Japanese history. The Ashikaga shogunate, Japan's primary potentates during this period, held only a tenuous grasp on the reins of power. The internecine conflict known as the Onin Civil War, waged over a decade between 1467 and 1477, not only severely weakened the shogunate's political and financial clout, but it also left the imperial capital and cultural center of late medieval Japan at Kyoto in ruins. In the wake of the Civil War, courtiers, artists, monks, and other cultural figures fled the smoldering remains of Kyoto for the provinces. Their exodus precipitated a steady dissemination of culture from the so-called center to the periphery. In the political vacuum left by the Civil War, regional military clans emerged as contenders, not only for political authority, but also as major patrons of the arts. Our speakers today address three such military clans, the Oji, Hosokawa, and Asakura, in their roles as patrons to some of the period's most celebrated painters, including Sashiu Toyo, Kano Motunobu, and Tosa Mitsunobu. Just as importantly, today's speakers offer valuable insight into late medieval Japanese painting from perspectives that transcend and provide nuance to what have traditionally been predominantly painter-centered narratives. Professor Yukio Lippet recontextualizes one of the monk painter Seshu's most iconic paintings by considering its meaning and function within a Zen liturgical setting. Professor Melissa McCormick examines the famed Yamatoe painter Tosa Mitsunobu's work to recover medieval matrilines and the involvement of female patrons in cultural production. In my talk, I depart from prevailing stylistic analysis to explore the emergence of a new conceptual trope in landscape painting. Stylistic and compositional analysis, however, remains foundational to any consideration of late medieval Japanese painting. Two of our speakers today offer revelatory insight into the formal evolution of painting in the years surrounding 1500. Professor Shimao Arata conceives of what is at once a more comprehensive and yet also fine-grained trajectory for the formal development of ink painting over the final decades of the 15th century. Professor Jean Phillips takes us to the other side of 1500 in his analysis of Kano Motonobu's work in the emaki genre, offering a reassessment of the painter's compositional choices and pictorial narrative strategies. Today's symposium is divided into two sessions, a morning session and an afternoon session. We will begin this morning session with Professor Shimao's presentation titled A Time of Transition in Muramachi Ink Painting, which will provide an excellent visual and conceptual foundation for the remainder of the day. Following Professor Schmel, Professor Yukio Lippet will present on the monumental figure work known as Hueka offering his arm to Bodhidharma, engaging with the crucial issues of ritual setting and Buddhist iconography, issues that underlie much ink painting of this period. 
Before lunch, I will present on the genre of landscape painting in the late 15th century. After lunch, we will reconvene in this room for two presentations. Immediately following the lunch break, Professor Melissa McCormick will provide it a much needed perspective that engages with issues of gender in late medieval painting history, particularly the patron activities, patronage activities of women in the Asakura clan. Last but certainly not least, Professor Jean Phillips will address the all-important Kano School of Painters, focusing on the work of the atelier's second generation head, Kano Motonobu. Each presentation will be followed by 10 to 15 minutes for questions, so we kindly ask that you reserve your inquiries for that time. Additionally, the final 40 minutes of the symposium will be dedicated to a panel discussion among today's presenters, during which we will address some of the larger conceptual issues at stake in today's symposium, including questions of artistic geography, the defining cultural dialectic of Wa and Khan, and the changing status of painters during this transitionary period from the late medieval to the early modern era. We invite all of the, those of you who are able to attend our culminating discussion. And finally, I'm pleased to inform you that live captioning, uh, as Jean said, is available for today's symposium. And you can use the link on the screen, that's why it's up here, to access those captions uh, from a phone, tablet, or laptop in the room. So I would like to now invite uh, Professor Jean Phillips to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Arata Shimao, Japan's leading scholar in the field of late medieval ink painting. He is currently a visiting professor at Columbia University and very recently retired from Gakshuin University in Japan. He is also a member of the Board of Trustees of the Nezu Art Museum and is on the Council for the National Agency for Cultural Affairs. Professor Shimao is a prolific scholar, having published countless scholarly articles and six single author books since just 2012 alone. While there is considerable breadth in his scholarship, his work on Seshu, about whom you'll be hearing more uh, later, um, is, I'm sorry, um, has gone far in shaping our current understanding of this eminent Muromachi period ink painter. He was deeply involved in the curation of at least two major exhibitions held to commemorate the 500th anniversary of the artist's death. I might add that one of his older articles on how Seshu used his art and writing to shape his image remains a personal favorite of mine. Continuing in a personal vein, while I have benefited greatly from Shimao San's scholarship, my greatest debt to him is for rescuing me from the sheer torture of having to sing House of the Rising Sun <laughs> alone with absolutely no musical sensibility in a karaoke bar. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming a great scholar and a generous spirit. Please.
Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Jean. And uh, uh, thank you for remembering my, our karaoke. <laughs> and, and actually, Professor Jean Philippe was, um, I was in UC Berkeley for half a year. It's about uh, 35 years ago. And then Jean was a uh, graduate student and a tutor of mine, and uh, he, he helped my English a lot. And, <laughs> and sorry, uh, my English is still not good, so good, so uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, <laughs> just please, but uh, uh, and uh, anyway, I'm delighted to be invited to such an exciting symposium. I believe a symposium focusing on uh, Japanese painting around 1500 and uh, it's unprecedented even in Japan. Probably this is the first time in the world. Um, and uh, it's an important, important time of understanding how painting developed in the late Muromachi period and I would like to express my respect to Professor Jim Philip and then Stephanie Bennett. And, and uh, and my talk today focuses on how karae, meaning a Chinese style painting, painted by J Japanese painter, changed around the year 1500. Res researchers on Muromachi period painting seem to distinguish 16th century from early one, ones very easily. For instance, they would say this is from the 15th century and that from the 16th century. So I want to show that first. And uh, to your right is 15. The left is 16. Just I show you the each slide for five seconds. So <laughs> please check the difference of the 15 and the 16. Hmm. It's clear, right? <laughs> and this is a little bit similar, but. Uh, they look at the birds. And landscape is also like this. The right one is a very famous painting by Sechu. And uh, this is two, mm, two famous examples. But, uh, the upper one is by Seshu, and uh, the lower one is by Motonobu. And uh, of course, this is a, you know, and it's a, the painting has a real date and a stylistic date. So this one is a, a sort of old one, but the real date is just 1,500. So many things that, you know, the situation is complicated, but uh, uh, today I'll make it so very simple. And uh, as uh, uh, Stephanie-san introduced, the Muromachi period uh, begins in 1392, Ashikaga Yoshimitsu, uh, the Ashikaga uh, Yoshimitsu consolidated power by revolving the conflict between the southern and northern courts. And the Yoshimitsu, who buried Zen Buddhism as a uh, I'm sorry. Zen Buddhism, as a cultural background of his rule, 
developed and refined Gozan meaning, Gozan meaning five mountain system. The Zen culture, especially those from the Gozan temples, flourished by adding Chinese in, in Chinese literati elements to either Zen culture. In the world of art, uh, this is a Shokubuji temple, the central Zen temple in Kyoto. And uh, in the world of art, Yoshimitsu created an extensive collection of uh, karamono, or Chinese painting and crafts, and they refined that art of karamono decoration, karamono kazari, to showcase his authority, creating a new system of power representation. This also led the inner emergence of karae, where Japanese painters adopted, adopted Chinese painting as a model to create their style not. Uh, the collapse of this Muromachi shogunate system began with the Onin War in 1467, as Stephanie introduced. And the daimyo from across the country split into East and West factions, converging on Kyoto for a decade of battle, reducing the capital to ashes. This significantly undermined, undermined the shogun's authority and diminished the status of Gozan Temple, uh, making a major turning point in the Muromachi period. The year 1500, the theme of this symposium is 30 years after the start of the Oni War and 20 years after its conclusion. Why is this period considered a time of major transition? And one character of art history is that the art metry, the individual artist, decides what is expressed in, this, in their work. Of course, this includes uh, various factors like the social context which the artist was in, the intention of patrons or clients, so on. However, the final form of a work is determined by the artist's mind, eye and hand. While art history can be viewed from a broad East Asian perspective, it also applies to the microstoria or microhistory, as suggested by Carlo Ginzburg. Ginzburg? <laughs> okay, <laughs> Carlo Ginzburg. Uh, a method of observing the world through the eyes of an individual. Here, the issue of generation of each artist belong to become crucial. For instance, famous cultural figures in the latter half of 15th century, such as the painter Sishu and the Renga, Renga master Sogi, and the supported founder of the tea ceremony, Shuko, were nearly contem contemporary people. So the date of birth and the death is almost the same. These three who thrived in the post only war era were already in the mid to late 40s when the war before out broke out. Art cannot change overnight, uh, even if the political situation changed a painter cannot change his artistic style overnight. They want to lead in the post-something war, something era, are usually those who grew up in the previous era. And uh, these post-owning war figures had mostly passed away. Um, by around 1500. At this time, those born when the Onin War broke out were in their mid-30s. Of course, the social context surrounding 
the artist was also changing. As an example of understand of this situation, let's take a look at Shoke. Uh, sh the Shoke, a Zen monk painter, lived in Kamakura. And, and uh, Shoke was trained under Geiyami in Kyoto and wrote a painting style in Kyoto back to Kanto. Uh, due to time con constraints, I would like to talk mainly about his landscape, landscape painting. And Shoke went up to Kamakura, to Kyoto, in 1468, and spent three years training under Geiyami. Geiyami, who succeeded his father Noami, who died in 1491 during the Oni War, managed and displayed the Shogunate collection of Chinese painting general generously um, allowing Shoke to learn from them. He was born in 1431 and 48 years old at the time. Uh, trained under Noami, uh, so Geami was trained under Noami before the only one. And, the and uh, Shoke's exact birth and death years are unknown, but based on the situation, I will mention shortly he will uh, probably uh, 30s or uh, even in 40s. And this horse and groom demonstrates the achievement of Shoke after the training and the Geiyami. Here, Shoke copies a Chinese painting like, uh, for instance, uh, this type. <laughs> They're very similar. It's almost a copy of this one. And of course, yeah, this one is uh, by a UN artist. When she, UN dynasty artist in Cleveland Museum. That, yeah, but, mm, uh, very <laughs> good technique. Of course, uh, Shoke could not reach the, <laughs> that area level, but uh, still he the oh, very good line. And this one is on silk, and uh, this one is on paper, so that's the difference. And also, he learned uh, Nanso in Tai, the style of coach painter uh, in Southern Sun. And probably this type. Yeah, he did pretty well. <laughs> and, uh, and however, why was Shoke uh, able to study and uh, Shogun's confident and access the Shogunate correction? Such opportunities would not be granted to a uh, mere Mere Zen monk painter from Kamakura. This context has been clarified the studies by uh, Masahiko Aizawa and Shinji Hashimoto. In fact, the political uh, turmoil in the Kanto region where, where Shoke lived was far more severe than the Oni War. The Kyoto War, uh, lasting 29 years from 1454 to 40, 1482. The situation was too complicated, so I will make it uh, simple. And so uh, I, I cannot explain uh, all of this. So this is Kanto area. The center is Tokyo. <laughs> and, and <laughs> Yeah, still, still me looks like, but uh, <laughs> Murumachi Shogunate appointed a Kamakura Kubo. Here is Kamakura, and, and the Kama, Kamakura Kubo to 
governed Kanto and selected a local samurai from the Uesugi, Uesugi clan as Kanto Kande. <laughs> Sorry, there's no English with that. And however, the conflict arose when the Kamakura Kubo opposed both Kanto Kande, Kanto Kande and the Muromachi Wakfu, Muromachi Shogunate. moving Koga and becoming a Kogakubo heroes. This is, uh, you know, the succeeded Kanto Kande, and opposed to both Shogunate and uh, Kanto Kande. And the uh, new Kanto Kande <laughs> came from Kyoto. Sorry, it's a little bit complicated, Kyoto. But he couldn't get into Kamakura, the opposed by the you know, samurai in Kanto. And here is a very complicated, uh, you know, the relation. And, uh, you know, that war uh, <laughs> continued for 29 years. But, uh, you know, but uh, nego negotiation for peace, peace talks, Commerced in 1478. The same year, Shoukei went to Kyoto with a truce between the Kogakubo and uh, Kanto Kande in 1482. A peace treaty was made between the Shogunate and the uh, Kogakubo. Um, so, the Uh, probably the, <clears throat> you know, the showcase going up to Kyoto, there's something related to this political situation. Uh, and but, uh, during the Kyoto War, the painting world in Kamakura was almost cut off from Kyoto, leaving Shoukei mostly unaware of the painting scene, scene there. He died directly and purely experienced the early days of a post war war painting in Kyoto. This is the reason why I chose this time. Uh, Geyam was also a painter called Kokushu, representative painter of Japan uh, in his time. He's Shiagoi. Shiagoi is a court painter of Sasan San. Period, it's uh, on 17th century, so uh, 13th century. So it's about a uh, few hundred years before. But the, Gea, but the Chicago style landscape painting had a significant, Im uh, his Geyam's Chicago style landscape painting had a significant impact. Their basis was a landscape hand drawn by Shiagoi, which was called Kake no Kokoku. Mm. The sort of uh, national treasure <laughs> of Shiagoi hand skull. It's a masterpiece in the Shogunate collection, the symbol of Shogunate collection. So, Shoke also enthusiastically learned Shiagoi style landscape from Geyami. And uh, this viewing of waterfall was a farewell gift from Geyami to Shoke on the occasion of his returning to Kamakura. All, also executed in Shiagoi style. Unfortunately, this is the only uh, painting extant by Geyami. But uh, we can tell the uh, form, formal properties and the iconography from this landscape painting in the sign of uh, gay eye. And there is a scene of waterfall here. It's like this. And comparing with the gay army's waterfall, the, you know, the shape of the Rock. 
and uh, tree, trunk and branch of tree, the treatment is very similar. And uh, this is a fair gift to Shoke. So someone's returning to, you know, his house is uh, depicted. And uh, And these shaggy style landscape scroll elements appeared in later painting in both China and Japan. And this is a Chinese example in the Liaoning Museum that is attributed to Xiaogui, but not in his style and painted probably in late 15th to 16th century Ming Dynasty. And this scroll is Ganjo Museum has a signature of Daijin. Actually, Stephanie kindly take a photograph of this one and uh, <laughs> brought to <laughs> me. And, and, and the Daijin is a coat painter in Nari Min, but the date is probably late Min, or possibly early Qin. But anyway, and this is a uh, treatment of this scene. So at present, more than 10 landscape scrolls de derived from Shiagui, which are in different style and some of which have attribution of uh, other painters. They're showing that the Shiagui mode was widespread in the 15th century, Giyami and Seishu were in the strand. And uh, I'll skip this. And Shoke mastered Gay Ami's Shiagui style. One of his re representative works, landscape at Nez Museum, is delicate tree crafted and closely resembles Gay Ami's style in rock formation and the shade of ochre and blue. The two seals on this work, and. Uh, Here, uh, Kenko and Shoke are often seen indicating they were painted in his time in Kyoto or shortly after. And here, we cannot see the trace of feel the atmosphere of the original Shiagui. And Uh, the elements of Shiagui were diluted in the process of the formation of the st style of Geiyami and uh, the tutelage of Geiyami. And so this is a Japanese copy of Shiagui, but still has a feeling of this. And you can feel that, you know, the difference of the style this and this. And of course, uh, Shoke must have seen the other painting by Shiagui in the Shogunate collection. But, uh, but their influence cannot be seen in his work. Uh, um, for instance, uh, this sample of Seishu. Seishu directly introduced uh, from the Chinese painting. Uh, this is... Uh, small painting in, in the mat. And uh, um, there is no date. I don't put, I didn't put any date because, uh, you know, the Metropolitan said that this is Southern Sun, <laughs> Southern Sun. <laughs> but <laughs> I think this is a 15th century mean, so <laughs> uh, I couldn't put in the date, but that uh, now, the, it is very clear that similarity. That we cannot see the showcase painting in that element. Uh, 
uh, this marked a significant change in the uh, creation of karae or Chinese style paintings by Japanese painters during the Momoch period. Karae was basically about a, a painting made from painting. Where Kyoto artists typically painted uh, clearly in the modes of famous Chinese painters. For example, Professor Burr's uh, by Noami, a father of Geyami, his query shows that this is a Muchi style. Sorry, I'm going to show that example. But. And the industries of fan painting after Chinese painter, Seishu created a menu of famous Chinese painters like Muchi, Eugene, or uh, eight painters. And so the, this has a two names. This is Liang Hai and Seishu. So this shows that uh, this is uh, uh, Seishu style Liang Hai, or Liang Hai style Seishu. <laughs> <laughs> so it has uh, this remains 20 paintings that copy by Kano Otsunenobu. And seven, well, we can see the real one. But, oh, of course, the, uh, you know, the, a everything is, uh, you know, Seishu copies an authentic painting of Chinese. For instance, uh, this is a Muji style, but uh, this one is a very famous Muji painting of uh, Shashan Bashi, the interviews of Shashan. But uh, almost no relation. <laughs> and, and also, uh, he arranges in his way so that I'm not sure that this is the original of this one, but uh, this is by Seishu, a copy, still copy, but, uh, and this is uh, Shiagui, attributed Shiagui painting in Edo period. Probably he saw this type of, and arranged to this, and uh, it comes to this. Now, this one's far from the original. Chinese painting. But still, uh, he is based on the, some Chinese painting. And so the, we call Hitsuyo Seisaku. It's, uh, you know, the creation under the name of the famous Chinese painter. So the Shiagui style by Geyami. So Geyami looked at the uh, Shiagui hand scroll from Chinese, made it the uh, Chinese painting. But the Shiagui style by Shouke is completely through the Geyami's painting. He didn't refer to the Chinese painting, but the Japanese painting. So that's a big change in the way of creation in Muromachi ink painting. And so, uh, so we showcase Shiagui style. It's completely through this type of Geyami. N not the shagui paint itself. And uh, Shouke's style gradually changed after returning to Kamakura. Landscape in the uh, MFA, Museum of Fine Art Boston. Yeah, this is a very good painting. I like this one. But uh, something is, you know, the feeling of the simplified. <laughs> you can see. Okay, the formation of block, and the, you know we call shun, the you know shade of the rock, 
to uh, make a three-dimensional effect. And this is a Kenko Shoke. And usually, the, after return to Kamakura, he used only one seal. So this, these two seal shows that uh, he, when he, when he sh wanna show that uh, I'm in the tradition of the Kyoto or a tradition of Chinese or something, okay, and uh, very seriously painted. In the case of seriously painted, and uh, this is a simple timeline, but uh, no skip. And uh, this is 1499, so almost uh, 20 years after get back from Kyoto. And and it's clear that uh, you, the composition and the depiction is getting to be simple. And this is another thing. So, uh, Shoke changed his style to, you know, adapt to the a sort of, uh, how to say, and uh, Kanto taste. <laughs> so the, probably the, the style like a horse or uh, that kind of uh, birds and flowers, that's too, you know, that too strict to for the uh, samurai in Kanto. <laughs> and then, for instance, uh, this type appears in, uh, uh, we don't know the date, but this is also Shoke. And the, and the, and the difference is very clear. This is uh, composition is a little bit unstable, and even the, you know, the boat is a little bit angular. In it compact this is tissue by tissue. So there is a big rock. Big rock and here there's a <coughs> figure on donkey. <laughs> and this is also the you know, <laughs> the composition is very unstable. But still uh, after fifteen hundred, Shoke painted like this painting. This is very elaborated and uh, of course make it uh, the simple type. But still he has a, you know, it shows that he keep, kept the technique from, from the Kyoto era. And uh, also this one has uh, two seals. It's very rare in his <coughs> rating. And then moving to his disciples, uh, many painters inherited Shoke's style, including the Keisong or Keisu or Keisenka or Koei, or we have almost uh, over 10 names. But uh, nothing about uh, biography is unknown. Just uh, we call it Zengaka, a painter with no biography. Just uh, <coughs> we can tell the existence from the seal and seal or signature. So this is a landscape by Keson. So the feeling is very different, and then uh, you know the major difference is uh, you know depiction of the rock. Shoe. So many, so many brushworks here, and then, and in this snowy mountain is like this. Uh, this is uh, na another example of the shoes by uh, Shoke style in the Metropolitan Museum. Sorry, this is only the detail, but uh, this brush is too st too strong to you know. Uh, for the expression of the snowy mountain, but uh, he wanted to show this line almost. And uh, this was another one. This is more clear. That, uh, 
what you want to do with this. <laughs> okay. oh, of course, the composition is a, a basically showcase style. But uh, this part is too strong, so that, you know, we cannot see the depth of the space from the foreground to the midground. And this is another quest. This is not a strong brushwork, but it has the same tendency, sort of. And I'm not critis criticizing this phenomenon. I love the style, too. <laughs> I, I, well, this is very muromachi. <laughs> and uh, I like this. But, and, uh, And, uh, but uh, that first considering why this phenomenon occurs in this, it is clear that this direction now is different from the representation, represent, representation of the object. Again, Japanese landscape painting in Chinese style was painting created from, uh, created from painting. Painter made up scenes of China that they had never seen while looking at Chinese paintings. The Chinese landscape paintings were Kyochu no Kyugaku. Kyochu no Kyugaku. Sorry. I'll, oh, I'll skip that. Sorry, I missed the slide. But the, uh, It's a Kyochu no Kyugaku. Shonjong Chiyoha. Hills as mountains in the mind. And the landscape reconstructed in the artist's mind. So the, in Chinese criteria, so the copy of, copying of the, you know, what we see in front of our eye it's, it's not evaluated. So the landscape should be a sort of a reconstruct one. So the painters look at the mountain from the, from the distance and go into the mountain and look at the trees and the streams and something and uh, integrate it and make up his image of landscape. And, uh, sorry, I'm the position. So, the, you know, the Japanese landscape painting is uh, following the Haruo Shirane-san, sensei, the Columbia University. It's a well-known concept of the secondary nature, not the nature itself, but the something arranged from nature. It could be considered a third nature. When they drew while looking at Chinese paintings, as Agei Ami and Seishu did, they could feel the reality of the hills in the mind of, origi of the original painting. And, and imagination for landscape comes into play and is reflected in their expression, like the Guillaume's one. Once, but once the reference to Chinese paintings vanished, the circumstances changed. Again, looking at the uh, Guillaume and Shoke side by side, we can notice the brushwork of Shoke is uh, slightly more organized and simplified than the that of the Geiyami. For instance, uh, uh, usually in Chinese painting, the leaves are 
a ch big change. This brush stroke and the shape. Two, uh, they think that three is a lot. The in in sh in shoke, this is completely the same. The repeating the same brushwork. So that is a very big change in the you know expression of the ink painting. So then, showcase style by Kason. It's a gay. It came from the gay yami style by Shoke. <laughs> <laughs> and the game yami style by game yami style was a, a come from the shagui style, so it's very you know long way. But uh, uh, Kason succeeded the shoke style, completely Japanese ink painting landscape. And uh, Kason probably does not know the Chinese Chinese painting attributed to shagui. Then this kind of thing happens. Uh, after 1500, I'm sorry, I, I have 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, uh, after, after 1500, similar phenomena seem to occur elsewhere in different ways. Uh, as a Korean Create example of another type. Take a look at landscape of Bukante. This painting immediately bring to mind Seshu's. This one. Uh, this is a landscape by Seshu. And um, or uh, or this one. But, uh, Treatment is completely different. So we can see he's doing a, you know, horizontal and vertical. This is his principle, right? So it is not that, you know, the uh, principle of the original painting that he created. This is his berries. He's following that his simple feeling. That's a big change. So even in the this one, is up he applies a vertical and horizontal. And uh, also in Kecho, birds and flowers. We can feel the same feeling, right? And it, it's very simple, and it's very calm. And so the sparrow is very well done and uh, elaborated, but uh, it's almost stationary. It stops in the air. And the, in the butterfly scroll, this is very simple diagonal composition. And this is a shoke kachozu, a land from the, you know, Satan san style. And the, you know, the method and the principle of the formation of the motifs is completely different. And uh, th this cannot be seen in Chinese birds and flowers. Okay. And this is another example of a Saiyan. And, and to <laughs> I have to in a hurry, so. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, <laughs> I'm going to omit the you know, explanation of, of the painter. But uh, they are basically the, with no records of biography. This is the same. 
And you can see that um, the flower present serves as an extrude. And uh, this is a this painting features worktail on bamboo and sparrow on willows with the unlike kind of vertical and horizontal approach. Here all motifs contribute to the curve, the combination of inclines depicting simplified bamboo and willow leaves. Along with the movement of birds, creates a beautiful flow of graceful curves. Among these, the Rini, the uh, the linear bold ink of birds serves an effective ac accent. The descending wagtail. I, I love this one. This is like a, you know, this is Jack Chews. <laughs> Jack Chews. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but this one. More elegant. So, the also in this case, the depicted world the diverged from mere reproduction, and what effectively achieves this fundamental essence of ink painting line drawn by brush, and the color of ink. So this is a basic factor of the ink painting, the line. But the line is line, and the ink is ink. We can see here, also we, we are seeing the, you know, the shape of birds, but at the same time, we are looking at, oh, Beautiful ink color or the beautiful line. And this is gay eye. The gay eye is uh, uh, different from these, but uh, Yamamoto Hideo uh, pointed out that uh, he is uh, the same person with Oguri Soke, Aguri Soris. So it was uh, reported to be a child of, uh, or adopted child, adopted child of Oguri Sodan, who succeeded Shubun in painting for the Muromachi Shogun. However, style of painting with gay eye seal, gay eye seal, varies widely, suggesting they might not all by one artist. However, the person who painted this piece was probably an artist who lived in Kyoto. But What's this case? The painter's point is this line. And also a sh she. This is a Chinese painting of Nansong. The, this is the origin of this iconography. But the, this one is very cleanly organized. And uh, make it a sort of a, a beautiful pattern. And Shikibu, okay. And uh, this is Shikibu Terutada. And probably was in Kanto area or Nagoya or Kan Kan Tokai area, like Nagoya. And the same, this is. Mm, more complicated, the composition and uh, of the coordination of the present flowers is very but still has the same view. And and then Shikibu is important that uh, you know, he developed a, a visual composition principles to like here. This is a monkey screen. And the shape of monkey 
derived from Muji. But, uh, but uh, there is no trace of Muji style in composition. What stands out in is a kind of rhythm and the flow of the bamboo and the uh, you know, pose of monkeys and the line of rocks. The pose of monkeys, branches, and leaves of pine and bamboo, rocks with added wrinkles, and birds all harmonize a great complex rhythm and the flow. There is no element that feels unnecessary. To feel such a large screen as in the Rokkyoku Iso, uh, with this composition, requires a significant skill. And it's a uh, difficult to phrase, but w one could say that the Shikibu reached the point of the having visual principle of a sort of a ab abstracted screen composition. Uh, I'm not, this is a proper word, uh, expression now. Then, then, Sesson. Uh, I couldn't stop here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and uh, they started with probably like this type. <laughs> like the. Uh, uh, we see here. But he reached this. This is dragon and tiger and dragon and tiger. But now, the, you know. And so. And so the, the dragon's body is fra fragmented into pieces. There are dismantled parts are cleverly arranged to form a harmonious shape, combined with soaring waves and swelling crowds to create a unique space. Sesson acquired from beyond to simply depicting the subject, he gained the visual principle of, he's also uh, gained the visual principle of abstract screen composition. And uh, and uh, I want to add uh, Motonobu and uh, Soami, but uh, uh, it's almost time, so um, I'll skip that and uh, leave it to the round table. And, uh, w and w what happened in the, uh, in the around 15 is that kind of change. So this is the... Um, and uh, so, okay, sorry, some. <laughs> anyway, and uh, the around 1500, probably a bud of this kind of, and flourished in the, through the 16th century, and then get into the Momo Azuchi, Momoyama. And uh, for instance, uh, Hasegawa Tohaku, well known with uh, Shorinzu, he was from Nanao, Noto Hanto, Noto, but uh, it's, a, uh, it's a route by Hatakiyama, the powerful daimyo, and he has uh, some good collections of Chinese. So it is, uh, and uh, he's, he succeeded that. Uh, Hasegawa family, and so the even Hasegawa Tohaku was uh, appeared from that kind of context. <laughs> I, I'm sorry that uh, the time. Uh, thank you very much.
Hello. We don't really have time for questions right now, but we will be having the round table this afternoon. And so if you have any questions for Professor Shamal, you could ask them then. Uh, we want to just uh, move on to the next speaker. And uh, our next speaker is Yukio Lippet, the Jeffrey T. Chambers and Andrea Okamura Professor of the History of Art and Architecture at Harvard University. Uh, he, too, is a prolific scholar who has authored and co-authored 11 books and exhibition catalogs that are truly substantive and scholarly. The range of topics on which he has published or is currently working borders on the unbelievable, extending in time from the Shoso Inn in the 8th century to the modern architect Kenzo Tange, and in subject matter from painting to carpentry. He has won prestigious awards for his first single author book and one of his many articles. I am pleased to note that for all his scholarly productivity and achievements, he has not shied away from service. From 2013 to 2018, he served as the, as the Johnson Kulukundis Family Faculty Director of the Arts at Radcliffe Institute for, of Advanced Study. In 2018, he was appointed Harvard College Professor for a five-year uh, term for distinguished contributions to undergraduate teaching. If I may add a personal note, that doesn't involve karaoke. I would like to present Kyo with an embarrassingly delayed thank you for a contribution to my own scholarship that he made more than 20 years ago. I had given a presentation on two sets of paintings of the Ten Kings of Hell, and a comment he made afterwards, I believe in a cafeteria line, changed my thinking on an important element of my work. So, Kia, thank you. Please join me in welcoming this outstanding scholar and colleague. Thank you. I'd like to uh, start off just by conveying heartfelt thanks to the organizers of uh, this, this really happy symposium. Uh, Jean Phillips, who's, who's um, just whose presence and writings on painting circa 1500 have done a lot to make this uh, subject area very interesting. And to Stephanie Bennett, who uh, we had the privilege of working with closely at Harvard University for many years, well, a scholar of the highest quality who's held in very high regard by all of us in Cambridge. Um, I'd like to also just express admiration for Professor Shima Arata, whose, um, whose work on Seshu, the subject we're, I'm about to speak on today, has really, really just shaped and defined uh, the field and everybody who works uh, in it. So, so thank you. As the title suggests, my presentation concerns the work you see here, uh, which needs no introduction, the painting titled uh, Huike, Offering His Arm to Bodhidharma, by the monk painter Seshu Toyo, a painting which I will occasionally refer to by its well-known and less cumbersome Japanese title, Ekadampizu. Since at least as far back as the early 16th century, it has been in the collection of Sainenji Temple in Aichi Prefecture. It is an exceedingly famous work, one that renders something like the primal scene of Zen transmission from Bodhidharma, the first patriarch of Chan or Zen Buddhism, known of course as Daruma in the Japanese tradition, to Huike, the second patriarch of Zen. 
as the story goes, and indeed we'll be taking a closer look at this story later on, after visiting Emperor Wu of Liang in southern China, Bodhidharma crossed the Yangtze River north and traveled to Shaolin Tzu Temple on Mount Sung, where he meditated for nine years against a cliff wall. Hui Ke, upon hearing of the religious master's uh, presence, went to visit him and begged for insight into Buddhist teachings. Bodhidharma took no heed of his solicitations until Hui Ke took a sword to his arm and did the unthinkable. He cut it off, thereby demonstrating to the master his unshakable resolve, after which Bodhidharma accepted him as his disciple and eventually his successor, the second patriarch of Zen Buddhism, the figure through which the true Dharma would be transmitted to all future generations. The drama and sheer bizarreness of Seshu's painting mark it as easily among the most singular and powerful works of the Zen painting canon as reflected in its many notable visual qualities. The erratic setting of this timeless cosmic grotto, bristling with brush marks and moss dots and hanging vegetation and axe cut texture strokes. The shared and absolute stoicism of the faces of the two figures, despite Hui Ke's extreme demonstration of resolve in the uncanny, otherworldly, faintly inked outlines of both patriarchs, especially of Bodhidharma, behaving in very un-ink painting-like ways by lacking much inflection and exuding a penumbra-like glow as if the master was projected onto or imagined into the scene. It's important to note that the painting is unusually large in size, measuring, as you can see here, 183 by 112 centimeters in dimensions, which makes it approximately as large as one tatami mat, but much larger, of course, when one includes the mounting. Indeed, here, Bodhidharma is approximately life-size. A live encounter with the painting can feel like it places the viewer directly in between the strangest of interpersonal dynamics or uh, perhaps described more appropriately as the non-personal, non-dynamic between the two patriarchs. All of these qualities have made Ekadampizu, Kweka offering his arm to Bodhidharma, a justly famous work. And it is unusual within Seshu's own corpus. Of the monk painter's six paintings designated national treasures, and I suspect you'll be hearing about uh, some of them in Stephanie Bennett's presentation later on, the other five are landscapes. Ekadampizu was only made a national treasure in 2004, the first of Seshu's non-landscapes to be thus designated, and this has instigated a reevaluation in recent years. Despite the prodigious commentary that has accrued around the scroll, however, I would submit that many questions about it remain unanswered, including some that are as fundamental as can be, and it is these questions that I hope to consider further during my time at the podium. One question, for example, that could still be addressed more robustly, perhaps, is the nature of the scene being represented. This scene appears straightforward enough. It is Ekadampizu, Hueke cutting off his arm, or as more commonly translated into English, again, Hueke offering his arm to Bodhidharma. Well, here I hope to problematize the idea that the subject matter is as straightforward as it has typically been made out to be. This question is tied to a second one. Why is it so unusual? Well, most typically, Bodhidharma paintings depict the first Zen patriarch staring at a cavern wall uh, on Mount Sung for nine years, in Japanese, the so-called Daruma Menpeki or Menpeki Daruma. Such renderings position Bodhidharma either frontally or more commonly in three-quarter profile as witnessed in this array of very famous uh, examples from medieval Japan. The Bodhidharma is almost never shown in profile in these other paintings, but it is in Seshu's painting. And even among variations of Bodhidharma imagery, such as the many paintings that render miraculous episodes surrounding the Zen master, the overwhelming majority of works show him crossing the Yangtze on a single river, a reed, excuse me, the Doyo Daruma, or holding a single sandal, Sekidi Daruma. Although, as we'll see a bit later on, paintings of Hueke severing his arm are not entirely absent from the record, Seshu's scroll departs from these in many ways and is in terms of the visual qualities described earlier, otherwise utterly unique within the corpus of surviving Zen paintings. 
And this issue, in turn, is titled, tied to the final question concerning Sessu's painting that I hope to examine or re-examine here. What does it mean? Once again, the rep response would appear to be straightforward. Ekadampiza, Hueka, offering his arm to Bodhidharma, is typically understood to show showcase the remarkable fortitude, uh, conviction, or perseverance of Hueka, who overcomes Bodhidharma's long silence and sequence of refusals to his initial entreaties, uh, setting the stage for a seminal moment in religious history, nothing less than the transmission and therefore the birth of Zen in East Asia. Now, the basic contours of this idea of Hueka's conviction undoubtedly are reflected in this scene. And I would, of course, absolutely affirm that the painting engages the story of Dharma transmission and succession from Bodhidharma, the first patriarch, to Hueka, the second patriarch. But what I uh, hope to attempt here is not so much a, a new interpretation of the painting, so much as a reframing of the terms according to which its meaning is talked about and conceptualized. So in order to proceed, my discussion will progress uh, sequentially through the following rubrics, titled respectively uh, historiography, which includes uh, discussion of some of the most notable commentary about the formal features and religious meaning of the work, uh, the cave, that is to say the setting of the work, the arm, by which of course uh, I'd refer, I refer to the specific motif of Hueka's severed limb, and finally, the meaning. How do we go about thinking about the scene in relation to the teachings associated with Bodhidharma? So let me jump right in with the first rubric, that of historiography. Although the literature on Seshu is overwhelming and the literature on this painting alone quite extensive, I'll summarize it here in broad strokes in terms of two categories of form and meaning. In recent decades, great strides have been made in understanding how to situate the formal features of Ekadampizu within the history of Japanese and East Asian painting. Most notable is the observation that the painting seems to bear remarkable affinities with the work of the earlier monk painter Kichizang or Kisang Mincho. As first discussed at length by Uchiyama Kaoru in 1993, Seshu's daruma bears some relationship to that of Mincho's famous red robe daruma at Tofukuji uh, Monastery, painted uh, pretty much 100 years earlier, the one that you see here. And although there are notable differences between the two works, such as the frontal pose of this painting vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Seshu painting and the red robe of the Daruma on this painting. Nevertheless, the deep-set facial features and unusual outlines with which the patriarch is depicted are uncannily similar. Uh, Professor Shimao Arata, who we just heard from, has described this beautifully as an emphasis on line irrespective of representation that begins to emerge among Japanese painters in the early medieval period, as witnessed in Mincho's work on the right, and that achieves unrivaled singularity and independence in Seshu's painting on the left. Now, this similarity between the two paintings is more than accidental when one thinks about Seshu's relationship to Tofukuji Monastery, the monastery to which Mincho belonged. Uh, before moving to Kyoto and training at Shokokuji Monastery, Seshu is uh, believed to have apprenticed at Hofkuji, which is a branch temple of Tofukuji in uh, Bichu province. And as the historian Ito Koji has demonstrated, later in his life, Seshu often moved within networks of Tofukuji monks. It's therefore very much within the realm of possibility that Seshu uh, had direct knowledge of and ample opportunity to study closely the works of his predecessor, Mincho. Now, while the facial features of Seshu's patriarch, patriarchs uh, may take their cue from Mincho's work. It could be that their horizon of reference ultimately encompasses Chinese paintings in the tradition of Yan Hui, who is a 14th century painter known for his kind of grotesque Taoist and Buddhist figures, such as the two immortals, Xiaoma and Tieguai at Qiongi Temple that you see here. And perhaps this comparison is visually suggestive uh, of this idea. You see the similarity here in the deep set features of the face, the bulging eyes, and the rendering of the facial hair. Indeed, with regard to the subject matter of Seshu's painting and its setting, uh, earlier commentary has observed the importance of considering Seshu's awareness of Chinese painting and of situating Seshu's work within a larger interregional East Asian context. 
this uh, well-known Chinese painting here from the 13th century in the Cleveland Museum of Art, for example, renders the same scene of transmission or non-transmission within an outdoor landscape setting. And I'll have occasion to return to this work later on. But in terms of formal features, there are several other Chinese paintings that offer actually much greater formal resonance in terms of the relationship between the two patriarchs in the Seshu painting and the manner in which Bodhidharma is positioned within the cave, such as this detail from a 13th century hand scroll attributed to Liang Kai in the Shanghai Museum of Art titled Eight Eminent Monks. And even more importantly, uh, this hand scroll by the Ming court painter Dai Jing, you just saw a few works by Dai Jin by uh, Professor Shimao from the first half of the 15th century. So even though neither of the two scrolls I've just shown show Hui Ke with a, with a severed arm, here the Dai Jing painting uh, is similar to Seshu and it's in the fact it's monochrome and in the fact that Bodhidharma's robe is in white. Moreover, Dai Jin was a painter active at the Ming court it is entirely possible that Seshu was familiar with, with his work or similar works from his stay in China from 1467 to 69. I would propose that even more could be done to position Ekadampizu within a matrix of East Asian paintings in which figures are positioned snugly within cavernous settings. Take, for example, these Chinese Lohan paintings from different eras and the manner in which a portion of what is essentially a rocky daze or throne in which they sit contours their body, much as we find in Seshu's painting. And among later paintings, there are works such as Ubin's uh, album leaf of Bodhidharma from the year 1610 that has yet, to my knowledge, been considered in relation to Seshu's Ekadampizu, but is even more subjective in its formal resonance, especially in the way the, the cave contours the front of the seated Bodhidharma. Indeed, Wu Bin's work points to the likelihood that there, there uh, was an as of yet poorly understood lineage of Chinese paintings of which many may now be lost of holy figures in tightly fitting caves, much like Seshu's Bodhidharma. In these works, it's as if the figure kind of emanates the cave and actively molds it or carves it to its own aspect. Now, with regard to the interpretation of Ekadampizu, the literature to date seems to revolve mostly around the idea that the scene reflects, again, the remarkable perseverance of Hueke in the face of Bodhidharma's ongoing refusal to engage him. Now, again, this interpretation appears straightforward enough and is reflected, for example, in the abundance of general English language commentary on the work found in the writings of Zen popularizers like D.T. Suzuki and Hisamatsu Shinichi, or books written for a general audience such as Barnett and Birdo's Zen ink paintings. But it's also found in specialized writings uh, such as Fontaine and Hickman's Zen painting and calligraphy. It's a catalog to the 1970 exhibition of the MFA Boston. And here I quote, Hui Ke then severed his left arm with his sword and advanced to show it to the meditating master as a sign of his willingness to endure whatever fierce vicissitudes he might encounter so long as the master accepted him as a follower, Bodhidharma acceded. Or in Brinker and Kanazawa's Zen Masters of Meditation from 1996, Hueka severs his left arm as proof of his determination to make any sacrifice for the sake of the Chan succession. Now I'm gonna to return to this uh, interpretation later on, but for now, suffice it to say that while tenacity may be an admirable quality in a Zen practitioner, in fact, the extraction of tenacity as the general message from Hueka's act oversimplifies a more complex narrative of encounter and somewhat uh, mischaracterizes the views of the Zen exegetical tradition, it's, uh, literature itself on Hueka's act of self-mutilation. So how might this be the case? Well, the first step, I believe, is to re-examine the visual qualities of the painting, in particular, its setting, the cave. It's remarkable just how much artistic attention has been devoted uh, in the painting to the description of this grotto-like space itself, its contours, its surfaces, its details. All the more so because in textual accounts of Ekadampizu, no cave or grotto is actually mentioned. The only phrase used to describe Bodhidharma's meditation is mempeki, that he meditates by gazing upon a cliff wall, the top of Mount Sung. So the painting is essentially fully recast the cliff 
as a cave or grotto. And as this close-up conveys, the cave setting practically sizzles and crackles with energy. In fact, the texture strokes employed to describe its surface are unusual in Sestri's work, which is generally characterized by longer axe cut strokes. Here, he even uses mineral pigment, uh, doksho or malachite green, to highlight parts of the vegetation. As a result, the rocky surrounding becomes highly charged. It, it practically comes alive as an organism. And there is, if you look at the scene again as a whole, a great emphasis on the burrowing of space into the interior. One might say, actually, it is uh, actually both a wall and a cave here. There's a wall in the sense that Bodhidharma is very kind of a tightly, snugly fit against a kind of contour line of the cave, but it also burrows into the interior. And in turn, the cave's animism stands in striking contrast to the stillness and stoicism and simplicity of outline of the figures, in particular that of Bodhidharma. And just as importantly, the cave has the effect of shaping the space around it and pulling the viewer into the implied extended setting of this Zen encounter. When we stand in front of the scroll, we, the viewer, are there with them on Mount Sung, and the entire temple hall space of display of the painting is transformed into a grotto. Uh, to me, this effect is similar to some extent to that of early Buddhist ritual paintings of the Parinirvana, such as the famous Otoku Nehang. It's a Parinirvana painting dated to 1086 on Mount Koya, in which the viewer is transported into the scene of the Buddha's Nirvana, witnessing his last moments. Uh, this effect is worth pondering further. I won't be able to go into the details of what has been speculated about uh, Seshu's painting's original paint, uh, patron and set setting, but suffice it to say here that an inscription on the back of the scroll relates that after Seshu's death in 1532, the warlord Saji Tamesada of Owari province donated the work to Sainenji Temple, that's its home today, a temple that Saji, the warlord, sponsored. And uh, the scholar Egaitsu Michihiko has argued uh, that um, this uh, Saji maybe have some relationship to the Ishiki house. The Ishiki uh, warriors were patrons of another of Seshu's paintings, the Amano Hashidate painting, and perhaps we can, we can ask uh, Professor Shimao about this relationship later on. Whatever the original home of Seshu's painting, however, I believe that a painting of the size and nature of Ekadampizu must have originally been intended to serve as an icon in a ritual setting. And it makes the most sense that that ritual setting was of the Bodhidharma assembly, which is held by every Zen monastery, at least according to the rules of purity or Shingi, the Zen monastic codes, on the fifth day of the 10th month of every year, the purported death date of Bodhidharma, the first Zen patriarch. The cave setting is important to this role uh, of the painting as a ritual icon. Now, it goes without saying that temples evolve from early grotto shrines, Buddhist temples, that is, uh, such, uh, such as you see at Ajanta and Dunhuang and elsewhere. And uh, in the Buddhist literature, temples are often likened to grottos, particularly by Zen monks, as witnessed in the signatures of the Edo period monk painter Sengai. Uh, Sengai was someone who, who uh, served as the abbot of a monastery known as Shofukuji in Fukuoka, and he famously referred to Shofukuji in his painting signatures as Japan's first grotto, by which he meant Japan's earliest Zen monastery. Here, a temple is specifically likened to a grotto. So Seshu's painting is, an ex is a powerful example of world making. It takes us to a special place in Zen cosmology, the top of Mount Sung, to the primal scene of Zen transmission, but in doing so, resituates the scene powerfully and viscerally within a cave or grotto instead of neutrally against a cave wall. So the, the, in Japanese, the term would be kutsu, dokutsu or kutsu instead of heki. In the case of Ekadampizu, however, the cavernous setting takes on added significance because of the close association of the grotto or cave in East Asian and Chinese cultural context to the mind or shing, that would be kokoro in Japanese, which is a central concept in the teachings of Zen Buddhism and of the Bodhidharma in particular. In Chinese visual culture, the cave was associated as a place of learned cultivation or of a Taoist return to original unity. 
And accordingly, from as early as the Tang period, in fact, much earlier, uh, pictures of grottoes were closely associated with the theme of the mind, as suggested by works such as Lu Hong's Ten Views from a Thatched Hut that you see here. This association between the grotto or cave and the mind was not exclusive to Buddhism, but was common to Taoist and Confucian or literati culture in general. Thus, we witness it in iconic works of literati painting in China, such as Li Gongling's Dwelling in the Lungmian Mountains, of which you see two scenes here of figures ensconced in grottos. The close association and conceptual slippage between the grotto and the mind is a central feature of the design and composition of Ekadam Pizu. The mise-en-scene of this encounter is crucial because the cave is where, in Zen Buddhist thinking, the mind is stilled, where the pure mind or the non-self is discovered. Next, I'd like to address the all-important motif of the cut or severed arm. As we've noted, in comparison to other Chinese examples of the subject, Seshu's painting is particularized by the degree to which the severed limb is showcased and highlighted. And note here, actually, that in this close-up, that the hand, in my view, actually uh, displays more personality than Huika himself. And the use of uh, red pigment uh, it, it calls attention to the kind of bloodiness of the, of the motif more generally. Now, the severed limb is also found in earlier depictions of these two patriarchs. But these depictions are primarily in lineage paintings that depict success and genealogies of Zen patriarchs, all derived from Chinese Sung period precedents. So take, for example, the 13th century iconographic drawing, Six Patriarchs of the Bodhidharma Sect in Kozanji Temple. In this work, Huika's arm is laid almost as an offering before an outsized bodhidharma, here oddly seated in a chair and facing Hui Ke. Or the MOA scroll, uh, scroll in the MOA Museum in Atami, Patriarchs of Buddhism dated to 1154 and attributed to the monk Zhuang. Here, once again, bodhidharma is seated in a chair and Hui Ke's severed arm is laid on a table between the two figures. Or the famous long scroll of Buddhist images from the Dali Kingdom dated to the 1170s. Uh, this is a Chinese painting. It's in the Taipei uh, Palace Museum. What you see here uh, is in this scroll is a sequence of six uh, that depicts the six Zen patriarchs as earlier paintings. And here, too, Huika's arm is laid on the table as an offering between Huika and Bodhidharma. Now, uh, what's important to observe about all of these examples is that the encounter between the two patriarchs, between Bodhidharma and Huika, conforms to a pattern in which a religious master is seated in a chair and faces a disciple. And this pattern is repeated over and over for different patriarchs, for other patriarchs of other sects of Buddhism. It's iconographic motifs such as Huika's arm that are oftentimes the only visual means aside from inscriptions, of differentiating Bodhidharma from other masters. You wouldn't tell who is seated in the chair and who is facing them without the, without the limb. So in these works, Huika's arm is iconographic. It serves to differentiate Zen from other sects and to differentiate Huika from other patriarchs within the Zen transmission. So how then does this iconographic portrayal get introduced into an otherwise iconic painting of Bodhidharma meditating against a cave wall for a work that was most likely hung for ritual observance of the Bodhisattva assembly in a monastic context. What is its meaning? Well, this question merits attention because the presence of the severed arm in a Bodhidharma pictorial icon, and that is to say a painting used for ritual, suggests that it is more than merely iconographic. And as stated earlier, it's also something more than a merely a signifier of fortitude and conviction. The other pictorial qualities of Ekadampizu, the, the manner in which the cave is rendered, the odd composition, and the otherworldly and erratic bodhidharma, all suggest a more complex matrix of meaning into which the pictorial motif of Huika's arm has been inserted. Now, in order to consider the semantics of the scene further, it's helpful to go back to perhaps the most elaborate and important source of bodhidharmas and Huika's biographies the Jingde era transmission of the lamp, Jingde Chuandeng Lu. It's a Chinese text dated to 1004. There, the account of Huika's arm cutting is found in the entry 
on Bodhidharma in Book 3. And because the account's lengthy, I'm only going to summarize it here, but nevertheless attempt to do justice to its flow, the narrative's flow, and most salient points. Uh, so it starts off saying Bodhidharma is described on Mount Sung at Shaolin Temple, meditating all day against a wall. People cannot understand this. Uh, but there's a monk named Shung Wan, that's Hui Ke, who's steeped in the learning teachings of Taoism and, and Confucianism, who comes to visit him morning and night and wants to receive instruction, but Bodhidharma ignores him. One evening, a great snow falls and Hui Ke remains standing so that by morning, the snow is knee high. And finally there, Bodhidharma takes pity and asks him what he seeks. Guang re replies that he seeks the way of, of Buddha. But Bodhidharma responds that it will be impossible to grasp with someone with a shallow mind and lazy heart. You can't really say that directly to students these days. <laughs> Guang then takes his sword and severs his left arm and places it before the master. So this is the famous act to which Bodhidharma then says, all Buddhas aspiring to the way forget their body for the sake of the Dharma. So you may also be of such a stamp. And then the master renames him Hui Ke. So this is all well and good except that the most important part of this entire encounter as recorded in the Jingde transmission uh, record and other texts is actually the next part, a famous uh, dialogue that constitute, uh, known as the peace to your mind dialogue. There it's Hui Ke asks, the Dharma seal of all Buddhas, may I hear of it? Bodhidharma says, the Dharma seal of all Buddhas, the Dharma is not something obtained from men. Hui Ke says, my mind is not yet at peace. Can the man master grant it rest? Bodhidharma, bring the mind to which peace can be granted. Hui Ke, searching for the mind everywhere, I have been unable to get a hold of it. Bodhidharma, then I have given peace to your mind. Okay. Now this exchange constitutes one of the most famous in the Zen literature, one that showcases the idea of the wandering mind, so difficult to grasp because it is fickle, changing from one moment to the next. It's the source of the parable of the 10 ox herding stages, for example, in which a Zen practitioner is likened to an ox herd attempting to rein in the wandering ox. Hui Ke has achieved peace here only when he has understood the true nature of the mind, which is crucial to the path of spiritual awakening. Now, subsequent commentary by Zen monks has always understood this exchange to be the most important component of the encounter between Bodhidharma and Hui Ke, not the arm cutting. The famous koan anthology, The Gateless Barrier, makes no mention of the arm, arm cutting, but instead refers to the encounter of the two patriarchs as Daruma Anshing, or Bodhidharma giving peace to Hui Ke's mind. This emphasis is consistent in Zen literature right up through the writings of the great 20th century Zen scholar Yanagida Seizan, who writes that the significance of the Hui Ke account lies exclusively in the fact that um, Hui Ke is seeking to pacify his own mind. And most importantly for our purposes as art historians is the fact that Kano Ike's Ko Soshu, it's a, it's a text of 1632, which is basically the earliest Japanese compendium of painting subjects, the explanation of painting subjects. There is a subject titled The Second Patriarch's Mind Pacified, which is described as follows. The Second Patriarch, Hui Ke, stands in the snow with his left arm out and his right arm holding a sword. He cuts his farm and offers it to the Bodhidharma. At that moment, the Bodhidharma speaks for the first time. Now, as the entry I just described from the Ko Soshu manual suggests, several different moments from the Bodhidharma Hui Ke encounter are collapsed into one and possibly confused in many of the paintings we've seen. Hui Ke is both standing in the snow and uh, cuts, off, cuts off his arm eventually at which time the Bodhidharma is incorrectly described as speaking for the first time. Bodhidharma actually speaks to him when he uh, is standing in the snow. And extant paintings of the subject are ambiguous on this score, perhaps purposefully so. In the Cleveland and Daijin paintings, for example, Hui Kun is shown standing in the snow, but not with a severed arm. Here's a close-up of both just to confirm this. And in Ekadampizu, it's perfectly unclear whether Hui Ke is standing in the snow as his lower half is cropped, perhaps intentionally. Here, the importance of the moment shown is rather that it takes place before the exchange about putting Hui Ke's mind at ease. Indeed, I'd propose that the semantics of this, of all these scenes, but of Ekadampizu in particular, need to be interpreted backwards from the dialogue about mind pacification. 
recognition of the true nature of the mind is the first step towards true understanding. But that's far in the future for Hui Ke, uh, and has not yet taken place at the moment of the arm cutting. As such, the arm cutting bears no importance. Some may understand it as perseverance, but that would be a low-level interpretation. Its true significance is that it has no significance, because form is emptiness. This scene, therefore, is really about emptiness, the ultimate teaching of the Bodhidharma. This idea is reflected in the face of Bodhidharma, who is resolutely not looking at Hueka's arm. The non-looking is all important here, because it signals a radical non-acknowledgement of Hueka's sacrifice. Indeed, the whole disposition of the Bodhidharma, with his back to Hueka, embodies an absolute negation of Hueka's dramatic gesture. And the idea that form has no meaning is embodied in the manner in which both patriarchs are rendered, almost as mirages whose very substantiality is called into question by the vagueness and faintness of their outlines. This may have been a difficult notion to grasp, even for a community of Zen practitioners. That's why it's perhaps best to understand the structure of the painting as presupposing a stratigraphy of different responses depending upon various stages of spiritual advancement of individual viewers. Those with advanced knowledge would recognize the emptiness of Hueka's act. Those with less advanced knowledge would champion it as a manifestation of his steadfastness. In this regard, Ekadampizu can be likened again to paintings of the Parinirvana in which those who are spiritually enlightened, such as the bodhisattvas uh, in and around the head of the Buddha, remain stoic at the Buddha's deathbed, knowing that his death is not a death, but instead an entering into Nirvana, the ultimate goal of Buddhist practice. Whereas those of lower spiritual awareness mourn the Buddha's final moments quite visibly, in some cases histrionically, especially the lion in the lower right corner. The proper response to Ekadampizu is akin to Mahakashapa's smile when the Buddha raised a flower to his congregation. Those who are most spiritually prepared are the ones in the know. So let me summarize how I'd propose to reframe the meaning of Ekadampizu. It is perfectly acceptable to understand Seshu's painting as an exercise in perseverance on the part of Hui Ke, but that would constitute, again, a lesser response. The correct, higher response to Hueka's offering of his arm is not to respond at all, like the Bodhidharma. To remain stoic, unimpressed. To focus not on the lesser problem of form, of flesh, of the human body, but instead to focus on the larger, higher, loftier problem of the mind, of the self or non-self, of emptiness. What is showcased here is not an engagement between master and disciple, a union of teacher and student, but rather the obliviousness of the first patriarch, his complete and utter lack of any sign of recognition. Instead, Hui Ke is here given a cold shoulder for the ages. It is a painting about disregard, about inattention itself. And in turn, what Ekadampizu underscores so remarkably well is that despite the fact that paintings of Zen patriarchs are often described in terms of categories and iconographies, they are anything but static. They're always changing and can be full of nuance in which small details add up and can have big implications. And the sophistication of Ekadampizu adds further fuel to the idea that Seshu was not just a landscape painter, but also a knowledgeable monk painter or ebushi who designed and crafted ritual icons of considerable sophistication. And that this painting is one that embodies as profoundly as possible the Bodhidharma teachings and continues to earn its reputation as one of the most compelling paintings created anywhere in the world circa the year 1500. And that certainly is something we can all smile about. Thank you. Hello. We have some, we have some time for questions. And I have a microphone. Uh, would anybody like to ask a question? Feel free not to ask any questions. Also. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, you're totally get to. Thank you. Thank you. At the risk of, I'm Charo Diachavari in Japanese light here. Um, at the risk of asking a lesser order question about formal issues, I would love to know your thoughts on the formal features of the cave and the ways in which those moon-like shapes might uh, speak to the wandering mind and its phases or not. So curious about the physical structures of the cave in your reading. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Well, for, um, the, the cave is, I'm delighted by the question because the, the cave, as you've surmised, is an important part of my understanding of the painting. But uh, one of the interesting things, first of all, about this cave that connects it to Professor Shimao's discussion earlier is that it has some similarities to the so-called Shagoe tradition of cave painting in the sense that it burrows into a recessed interior uh, through these forms that are kind of parabolic uh, arches and um, um, you know, very strong geometric uh, rock cut uh, contours. Uh, the, the, um, so, so one might say that in terms of the formal features, it repurposes a kind of cave that is pretty common in landscape paintings, especially of the official Southern Sung style, as uh, then um, kind of turned into a tradition by East Asian painters in their centuries towards uh, a painting of the of the Bodhidharma here. Um, it uh, it's, I, I think it's clearly a cave of the mind at the same time. So the way in which it, it contours the front side of the Bodhidharma, uh, I would propose, is um, suggestive of this idea that it's kind of, um, it's kind of like the, the penumbra-like glow around the Bodhidharma itself, kind of emanating from the, the Bodhidharma, like there's this fractal effect emanating from the patriarch where it's kind of um, shaping the cave to its own will. And so that idea of the mind is, again is all important because it's 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 the, it's if you had to choose one word for to summarize the teachings of Bodhidharma, it would be the mind. It would be the idea that one has to find one's own pure, pure mind, the Buddha mind, which is the seed of all potential uh, enlightenment in everyone. Um, there's some really interesting features of the cave. It's it's um, it's uh, so it departs from Seshu's normal way of painting rock cut. Uh, earthen surfaces, um, and Stephanie, you may have more to say about this as well, but it it's, consists of a lot of short strokes. There's a lot of um, art artistic attention devoted to it. It also uses malachite green to dot the vegetation. It's a real grotto. You can see vegetation hanging from it. Uh, the use of mineral pigments is unusual because this is a work on paper, and it probably takes its cue from Mincho's earlier work, which also uses an abundance of malachite green on a on a rich religious icon which is which is on paper so so there is some precedent but it's still remarkable the degree to which um, it's just very descriptive in fact uh, it's in again stark contrast to Bodhidharma Bodhidharma couldn't be more simple it's a very uh, simple uninflected wan pale figure the face is given attention but not the body and that's in contrast to this very um, um, you know kind of organic uh, animistic cave. Thank you. Thank you for such an interesting talk. I'm Hilary Snow. I'm at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Um, one of the things I really appreciate about this discussion is also the way you ground it as a ritual icon rather than just an aesthetic object. And I wonder if you could talk more about what goes into the Bodhidharma assemblies and other sorts of paintings or other sorts of objects have been used in those. Um, it seems like this is a particularly unusual example, but what might be more common? Well, so we don't, we don't actually know too much about what was used in uh, the Bodhidharma assembly, but, but there are a couple of important uh, sources, primary sources. So one is the sh the, what's known as the Shingi, which are the rules of purity or Qingwei in Chinese, which are a set of uh, text that, that lay out the, what essentially is the Vinaya code for Zen monasteries, the rules by which monastics have to live. And among other things, it includes detailed information about the calendar of ceremonies that's held in a monastic community. So the Bodhidharma assembly is a, it's a, it's a kind of a commemorative uh, ritual in which the congregation and, and patrons may also gather 
uh, to commemorate the Bodhidharma. So, so we don't have a, it, and it follows uh, what, what religious historians would call the syntax of Buddhist ritual, which is there's a daze, there is oftentimes uh, a set of de decorations on the daze, um, there's a liturgy that's read, and it usually involves uh, an icon, which is the f defined here as the focus of ritual. And there could be a number of their Bodhidharma statues, and there are paintings. And uh, I think what one imagines to be the paintings that were used in these rituals are the frontal images of Bodhidharma, usually in three-quarter profile, meditating against a wall. Those are the ones that are most common. And there is a famous example, for example, at uh, Ko Kogakuji, which one Im imagines was um, probably used in a ritual context like that. So having this painting, and so, so having this painting in which Bodhidharma is in profile with Hueka behind him being ignored is, to say the least, highly unusual. It's the, the same basic composition is found in lineal paintings, which basically are, you know, um, listing the patriarchs or uh, kind of hand scrolls of the kind we see, saw earlier is common, but to use that as a focus of a large ritual work, 180 centimeters in, in height, with the mounting two meters, 20 centimeters plus, is again, to say the least, um, highly unusual, merits some kind of uh, explanation, understanding of why it's so. Um, uh, hello, hi, I'm Yu Hang Li, I teach Chinese art history here. Uh, thank you for this uh, wonderful uh, talk. Um, um, so my question, uh, so I want to, uh, to go back uh, to your, uh, you introduced the size of uh, this painting, which is uh, very big and adding the mountain part, uh, almost, um, I don't know, like war paintings in some way. So uh, one, um, the the viewers standing in front of uh, this painting, they uh, can see uh, the depiction of the arm or hands uh, very uh, clearly. Uh, so on this painting, besides uh, the uh, the detailed uh, brush works uh, of the caves. Uh, another, the second detailed, uh, besides uh, this Bodhidharma's face, then we see the hands is really accurately <laughs> depicted. So I'm wondering whether um, uh, this hand gesture is just uh, like a, a kind of visual tropes uh, or part of iconography uh, of this um, meditative uh, practice. Is there any other meanings, uh, or how do we see uh, this, uh, this, the hand gestures here? Whether there's particular meanings, yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Well, I guess partly um, the positioning of the hand at the bottom of the scroll and the scale uh, is part of the kind of um, staging of the scene in such a way that I think it's really meant to put the, the viewing assembly in the space of the of this uh, encounter itself, or non-encounter itself. So the, the, it's very unusual the way Huika's body is uh, kind of bifurcated where it is. And that uh, technique of cropping and even a little foreshortening for me suggests a few things. One is that you know he's uh, standing knee deep in snow, and uh, that's implied by the, the cropping of the body, uh, that we're all kind of standing in the snow there with the figure, and that um, the hand at the bottom of the scroll is the motif that is just placed right in our faces, and that we are, again, according to my understanding of the scroll and the, the, the Zen um, exegetical tradition regarding the scene itself is something that is in your face but that you're supposed to ignore, <laughs> basically, because that you're, put, you're, you're supposed to understand that um, form is emptiness, right, uh, in, in, in short. And so I think uh, absolutely, as your question suggests, the, the positioning of the motif and the very design of the composition is very carefully constructed to, um, you know, to, to choreograph this, um, this uh, encounter and experience for not just Hui Ke, but for, for all of us viewers. I think it's very legitimate, actually, to to th uh, to think of the moon as 
present in this image. Um, so, so it's uh, you know there's no there's no actual moon rendered here, and we would normally read the white as as um, snow on the ground, and that's another weird thing about this image. I should say that it's somewhere between, as I said, cliff wall and grotto, and uh, you might say Seshu is fudging it, <laughs> to use a technical term, by uh, depicting snow on the ground in, well into the interior of the grotto, which shouldn't be the case. It's, it's, it's either an outdoor scene or, or an indoor scene, and this is kind of ambiguous in that regard. And of course, the white robe of Bodhidharma is actually probably related in some way to lay, uh, lay Buddhism. Uh, the white robes are associated, at least in China and the Song Dynasty, with lay Buddhist practitioners. But um, one could also understand the, the whiteness as moon glow. Uh, so, which is a very common technique in Buddhist painting, that you don't, do, the moon is a symbol of perfect enlightenment in Buddhism. And you can either depict the moon as such, or you could depict the reflection of the moonlight in the various motifs of a landscape, for example, as a reflection of uh, enlight or Buddhist teachings bathing all of the sentient world in some sense. So this is something that you could very legitimately read as a kind of a nighttime crepuscular scene in which moon glow is kind of animating the entire uh, setting. Yeah. We're, we're going to take time for one last question, and then we have to move on. So um, I was very interested in what you said about the significance of the grotto or cave to the mind, and as a pictorialized place within the mind to retreat to. Um, would you say that the cave in this painting symbolizes the place in Huike's mind more, or the Bod Bodhidharma's? Uh, well, that's a, that's a um, it's, it's, it's both an easy and a difficult question to answer at the, at the same time. So I should say that the more general idea that a cave, that a grotto is a place, is a, is a kind of a retreat where one goes, is, um, you know, is often referred to as, as Taoist in classical Chinese culture. So there are lots of depictions of, of grottos in, you might say, Taoist, uh, Taoist or Taoicizing uh, landscapes. But um, it's, I think of it as more of a kind of a shared imagery that eventually, you know, in B B Buddhist caves, um, literati cultivation can take place uh, in caves uh, and so forth. So in general, I think it's just a, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a generally appropriate setting for a Zen painting of this kind, uh, especially of the Bodhidharma whose teachings um, refer to the mind. And I, I would say it's kind of not, um, uh, to, to be honest, I'm not sure, I don't think it's located in either. It's a cave of the mind, but it's a cave of the mind that's exteriorized from all of the practitioners, uh, including us, because the, the mind is something um, that cannot be associated with the modern psyche. Right? So that's the most difficult challenge of thinking about the mind in Zen Buddhist thought, is that it is not a psyche. A psyche is something that we associate within our, ourselves and constitutes our identity. Uh, but the mind in general is something that um, is, uh, well, I, I, just to keep it brief, is, is, is an illusion that's caused by our karma in previous lives. So that we ourselves think that we have a strong sense of identity. We're so particular and individual. We have a mind. We have a self. That's all an illusion. And so the challenge is how to use your mind, which is illusory, to get outside of your mind. Right? It's a nearly impossible task. But that's why, um, that's why Zen Buddhism is such a, <laughs> such a tough thing. It's also why I'm not an ordained Zen monk, because I don't precisely know how to get there either. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for uh, continuing to stay with us. Our third and final speaker of the morning is Stephanie Bennett, who is nearing the end of, I believe, her second year uh, here as assistant professor, and as I mentioned before, Joan B. Mervis, chair of Japanese art history here at the University of Wisconsin. She is a scholar of enormous promise specializing in medieval painting with a particular focus on 
someone you have heard a great deal about already, Seshu. She is particularly interested in Sino-Japanese cultural relations in the pre-modern period, and much of her scholarship is interregional in nature. She is com currently completing her first book, manuscript, tentatively titled, Profession of the Brush, Seshu Toyo, and the Painterly Profession in Muromachi, Japan. She is also working on a subsequent book uh, project on the development of landscape, the landscape genre in Japanese painting history. When it came time to search for my replacement here, I, of course, had no agency, but I can tell you in all honesty that I could not have been happier in the choice my former colleagues made. Please join me in welcoming this rising star in the field. Thank you very much, Jean, for that very kind introduction. Okay, thank you everyone for attending today. And thank you to Jean Phillips, uh, my co-organizer for this symposium and to the other esteemed presenters um, who I'm very happy to have here today. My talk uh, this morning is titled The Taoist Grotto Heaven in Late 15th Century Japanese Landscape Painting. And so it makes a nice uh, kind of continuation of Professor Lippitt's talk and it was very nice to hear about the kind of Dao, uh, Zen inflection of the cave, um, which is kind of a different direction than I'll be taking it today. Pictures of mountains and water. This is the term by which landscape painting is known in pre-modern East Asia. Landscape painting, or san suiga in Japanese, is among the most foundational genres of Japanese painting. Although landscape imagery features prominently in Japanese visual culture from early times, particularly as pictorial allusions to celebrated sites in the literary canon, and as the backdrop for narrative and religious subject matter, the 15th century marks an especially consequential turning point at which landscape imagery begins to assume greater visual and conceptual independence from other subject matter. The history of landscape painting in Japan has been predominantly approached through one of two frameworks, that is through the relationship between a landscape scene and accompanying textual inscriptions, like you can see in this uh, example on the screen where you have the landscape below and a series of poems and a prose pe preface inscribed above. Or secondly, in terms of the landscape's stylistic relationship to Chinese landscape styles. In today's presentation, I propose an alternative approach. Specifically, I'm interested in how landscape painting signifies independently of accompanying text and how landscape painting creates meaning independently from style. It is my contention that the years surrounding the turn of the 16th century, the temporal focus of today's symposium, offer important insight into these questions. This period also coincides with one of the most tumultuous eras in Japanese history, an era marked by incessant warfare, social instability, and political fragmentation. The framework through which I propose to explore the fate of landscape painting at this turbulent moment is the theme of the Taoist Grotto Heaven. In applying this thematic lens to Japanese landscape painting circa 1500, we are not only offered insight into the ways in which landscape painting responded to the contingencies of its time, but also insight into larger currents of late medieval Japanese culture 
that are difficult to excavate through other means. As a pictorial motif, grottos or caves begin to appear in Japanese landscape paintings in the latter half of the 15th century, with the last several decades of the century producing especially prominent examples. The appearance of the cave motif merits exploration not only as a new pictorial subject, but also as a new conceptual locus for landscape painting in this period. On the screen here, you see a constellation of paintings uh, that can either be definitively or contextually dated to the decades post-1470, and which reflect the contemporary prevalence of the cave motif. Um, and I probably should have included Ekadan Pisu too, <laughs> but um, we can imagine that it's here among this group. In my presentation today, I will be focusing on two of these works, the ones highlighted there. One, an exceptionally famous landscape painting known as The Long Landscape by the monk painter Seshu, and the other, a relatively obscure painting by the little-known artist named Geai, uh, whom Professor Shimao has already introduced to us. In fact, uh, we've seen both of these paintings already today. As Professor Shimao observed earlier this morning, the morphology of the cave motif in late 15th century Japanese landscape paintings is strikingly similar to the forms of caves that appear in roughly contemporaneous Chinese landscape paintings. Works like the one shown above, which is attributed to the 15th century Chinese painter Daijin, seem to have provided an important prototype for late medieval Japanese painters who adopted a similarly foregrounded and inverted V-shaped form for their gaping grottos. Official diplomatic relations between the ruling Ashikaga shoguns and the Chinese court in the 15th century meant that there were various channels through which such paintings could have become known to Japanese painters of this period. The painter of the long landscape, in fact, Seshi Toyo, traveled with a Japanese diplomatic delegation to China, as Professor Lippitt mentioned, uh, in 1467, rendering him a prime candidate for the introduction of this grotto imagery to late medieval Japan. Now I'd like to briefly introduce the concept of the grotto heaven. The cave or grotto in Chinese culture is indelibly associated with the concept of the grotto heaven or dongtian in religious Taoism. The origins of the grotto heaven as a Taoist trope can be traced to around the fourth century of the common era when they become an integral concept in the upper clarity tradition or Shangqing tradition of religious Taoism. The Upper Clarity School conceptualized the Grotto Heaven as a fundamental and numinous component of Taoist sacred geography, second only to the Five Peaks in its cosmological importance. Within the Upper Clarity tradition, the Grotto Heaven is imagined as a transcendental space located beneath the surface of the terrestrial earth or in the cavernous interiors of mountains. The void of the cave has been variously understood as the abode of immortal beings, a sacred repository, and indeed as the source of life itself. As many scholars have observed, the etymology of the term dong alludes as much to the ideas of connectivity and penetration as it does to the ideas of a self-contained space. The Taoist grotto heaven thus signifies both place and passage. It is not merely a static feature, but also a site of transformation. By the Tang Dynasty, the cosmology of the Taoist Grotto Heaven had been neatly systematized into a sacred geographical network consisting of 10 greater Grotto Heavens and 36 lesser Grotto Heavens, all believed to exist within the mountains of the Chinese Empire. The 8th century Emperor Xuanzong mandated by imperial decree that all mountains throughout the empire bearing cavernous grottos establish al altars and temples for the proper conducting of Taoist ritual. It is difficult to ascertain the degree to which religious Taoism permeated late medieval Japanese society. One of the reasons for this difficulty is the extent to which Zen Buddhism and its practitioners dominated cultural and spiritual discourse in this period. As scholars of religion have noted, not a few Japanese Zen monks viewed the Taoist canon and related texts with skepticism and even hostility, often denying the influence of religious Taoism on their spiritual beliefs and worldview. In reality, of course, the situation was more complex. References in poetic anthologies and in extant paintings, like the two that you see on the screen here, uh, which refer to themes such as the peach blossom spring, the unity of the three creeds, and related subjects like the three vinegar tasters, 
or the Three Laughers of the Tiger Ravine, which is one of the examples on the screen, all allude to an awareness and even acceptance of Taoist themes, figures, and beliefs, albeit in subtle and sometimes elliptical ways. The historian must thus turn to other means and sources to excavate evidence of the ways in which religious Taoism had sedimented in the late medieval Japanese consciousness. I argue that the Japanese landscape paintings featuring grotto imagery provide compelling evidence of this phenomenon. The first of my two case studies is the long landscape. The long landscape is considered Seshu Toyo's magnum opus and a masterpiece of medieval Japanese painting with a sizable legacy of scholarship to match. Most discussions of the painting have focused upon its stylistic qualities, particularly its perceived stylistic relationship to works by famed Chinese landscape, landscapists. The subject matter of the painting, on the other hand, has largely been treated as generic in nature, akin in its thematic neutrality to many other landscapes that have no readily identifiable narrative or subject. I would argue, however, that despite its large scale and pictorial diversity, which may indeed suggest a certain semantic openness, the long landscape does in fact encode a more particularized meaning in its forms. Seshu made this painting in the winter of 1486. It is widely thought that it was commissioned by a military lord named Ochi Masahiro, who governed a wide swath of territory in southwest Japan during the late 15th century. At almost 16 meters in length, the long landscape presents a sweeping panorama of mountains and water. The work begins with the figure of a man, who you see here, shown with a walking stick in his hand, and he's followed by a young attendant. Together, they ascend a winding path through the mountains. Over the course of the scroll, the path leads them through villages, streams, and forests. The pictorial climax of the painting occurs in a scene that is nearly two-thirds of the way through the composition, depicting a crowd of people gathered in a village square that appears to be nestled in the gaping mouth of a cave. The painting then comes to a close with a scene of a snow-blanketed city. The cave scene constitutes the painting's climax by virtue of its dramatic and somewhat surreal setting, its motivic density, and its profusion of color, especially for something that is considered uh, an ink painting. This is the presumed destination of the scroll's walking protagonist, an explosion of energy and dynamism that punctuates the stillness and quietude that has characterized the journey through the landscape up until this point. We are thus left wondering why there is a throng of people here and why this gathering is occurring in a cave. One clue to this mystery is the profusion of blossoming trees that crown the cave opening at its apex. Here, contorted trunks with fine branches festooned with red-colored flowers are shown growing from the cliff. Scholars have puzzled over the presence of the seasonal motif in this scene. The long landscape does incorporate a modicum of seasonal imagery, most obviously in that final snowy scene, but the theme of seasonality is otherwise so subtle as to be almost unrecognizable, and more importantly, it doesn't appear in natural temp temporal progression. I would suggest that looking at the long landscape from the perspective of seasonality risks missing the significance of this seemingly seasonal motif altogether. Instead, I argue that the presence of the red-hued blossoms in this scene was intended as an allusion to the Taoist grotto heaven in what was arguably its most popular and enduring manifestation, the grotto heaven of the Peach Blossom Spring. The origins of the Peach Blossom Spring Grotto Heaven derive from a prose preface and poem by the fourth and early fifth century recluse and acclaimed poet Tao Yuanming. In Tao Yuanming's tale, a fisherman loses his way along a stream lined with blossoming peach trees. Mesmerized by the profusion of flowers, the fisherman follows the stream to an opening in the mountainside where he is overcome by curiosity and enters through the aperture in the rock. Once inside the cave, the fisherman is transported into a bucolic valley inhabited by people who fled the brutality of the historical Qin dynasty. Within this grotto heaven, the refugees live a peaceful and self-sustaining existence. When it come ti comes time for the fisherman to return home, the people of the Peach Blossom Spring request that he keep the location of their grotto a secret. 
Although the fisherman acquiesces, as soon as he returns to the city, he informs the local magistrate of his discovery, and together they set out to return to the Utopian Valley. Much to their dismay, however, the location of the peach line stream and its cavernous opening are never found again. Significantly, as early as the 8th century, the Utopian Valley sequestered in the cave had been recognized as one of the 36 lesser grotto heavens within the expansive network of Taoist sacred geography. Indeed, Tao Yuanming's tale is considered the first literary work to incorporate the grotto heaven as its primary narrative setting. Throughout the long history of the Peach Blossom Spring tale, the red-hued peach flowers have consistently been the most important signifier of this grotto heaven in both its literary and painterly manifestations. It is, after all, the red flowers that beckon the fishermen into the cave and which reappear inside the sequestered valley as a marker of its otherness. Poets in China and Japan alike consistently emphasize the red color of the flower in their poetic allusions to the theme. This is just one example, uh, a poem by the 15th century Japanese monk Shukue Soha, uh, a contemporary of the painting's painter, Seshu, in which uh, the monk emphasizes the vermilion splendor in a poem that he wrote on a landscape painting that specifically likens the painted scene to the famous Grotto Heaven, writing in that final line, the plum trees on the opposite bank blush red like the peach. Paintings of the Peach Blossom Spring by artists in 15th century China and in Joseon Dynasty Korea also showcase the red blossom trees as a chromatic marker of this famed grotto heaven. The painting uh, above is attributed to the 15th century Chinese painter Shenzhou, while the painting below is the only extant work by the Joseon Dynasty court painter Angyon. And in Angyon's painting, you can uh, see particularly clearly the red pigment with a little bit of white in this case that's been added to the trees of the Peach Blossom Valley. These roughly contemporaneous paintings also incorporate other common imagery with the long landscape that suggests an identification of the cave scene in the long landscape as an evocation of this Taoist grotto heaven. One of the defining qualities of the grotto heaven derives from perceptions of this spa sacred space not as a subterranean cavity encased in rock, but rather as an interiorized counter-universe. In his Declarations of the Perfected, the Taoist philosopher Ge Hong characterized the space of the grotto heaven as an inversion of the outside world, wherein day is night and night is day. Despite this inversion, there's a marked parallelism between the external profane world and the interior world of the grotto heaven. Many descriptions of the grotto heaven underscore the this-worldliness of its environment. And indeed, when the fisherman enters into the peach blossom spring grotto heaven, he encounters not a mythical otherworldly environment, but an environment striking for its mundanity. Rather than the palatial halls and soaring towers redolent of some descriptions of paradise in the Chinese tradition, the fisherman encounters village dwellings and neatly tended rice fields. Tellingly, the grotto scene in the long landscape is approached, you can see in the image above, uh, upon the viewers traversing of a kind of sleepy fishing village and surrounding fields. This vignette in the long landscape closely recalls a similar scene in the Chinese painting of the Peach Blossom Spring with its arched bridge overlooking fields beyond, indicating the extent to which this bucolic imagery was associated with the identity of the Peach Blossom Grotto heaven in contemporary visual culture. It is not only the grotto heaven of the peach blossom spring, however, that is characterized as an interior counter universe, indistinguishable from the terrestrial world of man. The record of marvels, or Lu Yiji, compiled by the late Tang Taoist Du Guangting, recounts the story of a monk from Tiantai who comes upon a grotto in Linhai County, or modern day Zhejiang province. The monk follows the narrow path into the cave, and as the path broadens, mountains and rivers begin to appear. After a while, the monk comes upon a market and its inhabitants, just as in the world above. This description of the grotto heaven's decidedly this-worldly environment offers a compelling comparison to the village scene of the long landscape, where villagers are shown mingling outside dwellings and a wine shop, virtually indistinguishable from those in countless other landscapes. The difference is that this village, with its wine shop and dwellings, is lodged in the opening of a cave. 
Yet another description of the Taoist Grotto Heaven from the fourth century Taoist Treatise Record of Collected Traditions, or Shri Ji, offers another point of reference for Seshu's pictorial evocation of the Grotto Heaven in the lo long landscape. The record of collected tradition relates the tale of a Taoist adept who goes into the mountains to gather herbs for the preparations of an elixir. In the mountains, the adept inadvertently wanders into a cave where he encounters a group of people clad in rainbow-colored garments. In the long landscape, the villagers in the grotto scene are shown wearing an unusually wide array of colorful robes, recalling the descriptions of the grotto heaven residents in the record of collected traditions. Just as with the red-hued peach blossoms, chromatic splendor is a defining characteristic of many grotto heaven environments, invoking as one scholar has put it, a, a rich sensorium of vivid color. <coughs> the craggy rockery that constitutes the grotto setting in the long landscape is, of course, highly effective in conjuring this cavernous environment. The scene of the bustling village and the red flowering trees is framed by the dramatically arched chasm in the mountain. The jagged rockery, as you can see, is punctuated by circular corrosions, evidence of the corrosive forces of nature that created this cavity in the mountain. Through these apertures in the rock, figures are seen ascending and descending a steep staircase leading into the geological interior. Ungyun's contemporaneous painting of the Peach Blossom Spring similarly features jagged rockery to underscore the identity of the bu bucolic valley as a realm situated inside a cave. The rockery in the long landscape assumes a distinctive form, however, notable for the preponderance of circular corrosions that punctuate the rock, and very similar to uh, the, the rockery in um, Huayka offering his arm to Bodhidharma. I propose that this formal choice, that is to include these circular kind of holes in the rock, heightens the painting's allusion to the Taoist notion of the grotto heaven, Indeed, as related in the early Taoist text known as the Scripture of the Five Talismans, it was within the grotto heaven located underneath Lake Tai, or Taihu, a lake long celebrated for its famously holy rocks, um, and I mean holes in the rocks, that the sage king, Yu the Great, concealed some of the sacred Taoist scriptures, a story which I will return to at the end of my talk. Since at least the Tang Dynasty, influential literati and poets in China thus projected the concept of the grotto heaven onto these prized porous rocks harvested from Lake Tai, viewing them as the perfect material microcosms of the cavernous universe. In Seshu's penchant for these Taihu-like circular apertures, the painter was perhaps imparting yet another layer of grotto heaven valence to his monumental landscape. Within the visual culture of late 15th century Japan, the long landscape was not an anomaly in foregrounding the trope of the Taoist grotto heaven. To demonstrate this point, I'd like to introduce a second case study that illuminates the consciousness of the grotto heaven concept in Japan at this time, and which alludes to the centrality of this concept in ma late medieval Japanese landscape painting. The painting in question is a relatively obscure hand scroll painting, although everyone here is uh, familiar with it because we've seen it um, earlier in Professor Shimao's talk. And this is a landscape attributed to a little known painter named Gei. Gei uh, is known today through a handful of extant works, including this landscape in the hand scroll format. His dates of activity are elusive, but fragmentary clues suggest that he was active about one generation after Seshu, which would place his creation of this work in the early 16th century. Gei's landscape bears notable compositional similarities to Seshu's long landscape. The painting presents a vista of mountains and rivers alternating between panoramic views and zoomed in foreground scenes. Like the long landscape, this painting takes the viewer through scenes of fishing villages, Buddhist temples, rice fields, and most importantly, caves. The form of the main cave in Gei's landscape is strikingly reminiscent of that in the long landscape, the inverted V-shaped opening crowned at its apex by a wild cluster of trees. 
Unlike in the long landscape, however, the cave in Gei's scroll is approached by crossing an arched bridge that spans the rushing torrent of a waterfall. In front of the cave, instead of a bustling village like we saw in the long landscape, there is instead only a small group of figures, two grown men who sit on rock seats facing one another, and three boy attendants who are shown preparing a charcoal brazier to warm a refreshment, most likely tea. Immediately behind the seated men, two doors are visible inside the cave. Thus, while the Gai landscape shares its cavernous setting with the long landscape, it particularizes that setting with a different array of iconography and motifs that expand the imaginary of the Taoist grotto heaven even further. As scholars of Taoism have noted, the motif of a flowing stream is an important iconographic attribute of the grotto heaven, alluding to the mountain's significance as a wellspring of life. This association between the cave and the life-giving waters that issue from its interior has been central to the identity of various grotto heavens and indeed is central to the pictorial identity of the Gai landscape. Specifically, the scene of tea preparation or water preparation outside the entrance to the cave in the Gai scroll closely recalls a description of one such grotto, the warm water grotto or the Wen Tang Dong, as described by the late Tang Taoist master du, du Guangting in his text known as Record of Marvels, which I mentioned earlier. According to the Record of Marvels, the warm water grotto was located near Kaizhou Prefecture in modern day Sichuan province. Du describes the site as follows. There's a sweet source to one side, it's water warm and white. Visitors to the grotto brew their tea there. In front flows a stream, its rushing waters are swift and it roars as it flows out of the grotto. A bridge 20 or 30 feet long and some 10 feet wide spans the stream. It is made of neither, that is the bridge is made of neither stone nor clay and is of impressive construction. The cave scene in Gai's landscape hews closely to Du Guangting's description of the warm grotto, water grotto with its waterfall and rivulet, its impressive bridge and its tea drinking visitors, suggesting more than a coincidental correspondence. The two conspicuous doors visible within the cave's interior in the Gai landscape are another distinctive motif that poses questions of interpretation. The Taoist overtones of this motif are apparent in the appearance of a very similar motif that is kind of a door lodged into the side of a mountain that appears in 15th century Chinese landscape paintings that relate explicitly to the concept of the grotto heaven. And the example I'm showing you here is yet another painting attributed to the um, court painter uh, or the 15th century professional painter Dai Jin, which shows us uh, a Taoist adept, presumably deep in the mountains, search, and the title of the painting is Searching for the Tao. The implications of the door here are that it marks a threshold between the terrestrial world and the numinous world of the grotto heaven beyond. The imagery of, the, of a door in association with the grotto heaven is not without precedent in textual sources. The scripture of the five talismans, which I mentioned earlier, relates the tale of King He Lu, ruler of the Wu kingdom, and his search for the sacred scriptures believed to have been concealed deep inside Mount Bao, Baoshan, in the middle of Lake Tai. According to the narrative, as, as it is related in the scripture of the five talismans, this king dispatched a messenger, the recluse of Baoshan, to plumb the depths of this grotto heaven. Upon his return from the mission, the recluse reported, I still do not know the limits of the cavern. I had probably walked over 7,000 li when I came upon a myriad holes and miscellaneous caverns. These sandy passageways came from all directions to converge in one spot. Its shape was just like a door. The recluse of Baoshan goes on to vividly describe the fantastic sights he witnessed on his journey beyond this door inside the grotto heaven located under Lake Tai. In combination with the flowing stream and the tea drinking visitors or tea preparing visitors, the motif of the rock encased doors thus appears to deepen the grotto heaven character of Gai's landscape. Before I turn to a discussion of the larger cultural implications of this grotto heaven imagery in late medieval Japan, I'd like to first make the case that despite the relative obscurity of the Gai landscape, the painting preserves the imagery of 
what was the most prestigious landscape painting in late medieval Japan. Textual records from this same period refer to a now lost painting, which Professor Shimao also mentioned in his talk, that went by the vaunted appellation painting of the realm, or kokuhon. This prestigious painting was most likely a hand scroll landscape uh, imported from China and kept within the elite painting collection of the Ashikaga shoguns. The fact that the painting was referred to by this singularly distinctive title, Painting of the Realm, attests to its perceived value and prestige among the highest echelons of power in late medieval Japan. Although this esteemed painting did not survive into modern times, something of its original likeness can be gleaned from a detailed description of a painting that was made based upon the prestigious hand scroll. This record, which dates to the 1480s, provides a particularly evocative description of a cave scene from the painting of the realm. The description reads, in front of the doors inside the cave is a figure accompanied by a companion to whom he talks. They use rocks as seats. One child attendant stands behind them, hold, beside them, sorry, holding a cup of wine that he is about to offer to his master. Another attendant fans the flames of the brazier to warm the wine. Beside the brazier, a stone platform has been set up. On this is placed a wine jar. Another child attendant arranges three or four small dishes and heaps them with refreshments. With the exception of the identification of the beverage here as uh, wine rather than tea, the description of the pictorial content of the painting of the realm is an uncannily close match to the cave scene in Gei's landscape. The pictorial overlap between the two paintings suggests that the painter Gei was aware of the prestigious landscape painting in the Shogunal collection and that he incorporated its imagery into his own hand scroll landscape. By the same logic, the striking correspondence between the two paintings suggests that the imagery of the grotto heaven we have observed in Gei's landscape was part of the pictorial identity of the period's most treasured landscape painting. Over the span of 11 years, between 1467 and 1477, the Japanese archipelago was engulfed in a bloody war that pitted the period's most powerful potentates against one another. The city of Kyoto was decimated, its shogunal residences, imperial palace, and Buddhist monasteries reduced to ashes. Aristocrats, artists, and monks fled the city for regional centers, some never to return. The Civil War dealt a destructive and definitive blow to the Ashikaga shogunate's already precarious hold on power. The period following the Civil War until the ultimate demise of the Ashikaga shoguns in 1573 is referred to as the Warring States Period, or Sengoku Jidai, for the political fragmentation and accompanying instability that characterized this era. Tellingly, it was within this climate that the grotto heaven imagery emerged in Japanese landscape painting. In considering the implications of this imagery for late medieval painting, it becomes necessary to consider the likely patrons or audiences of the two paintings that I have introduced today. Although nothing is known about the patron of Gei's landscape itself, the aforementioned connection between this landscape and the most prestigious landscape painting in the shogunal collection, the um, Kokuhon, enables us to posit the Ashikaga shoguns as a potential audience for the, for the grotto heaven imagery of the kind seen in the Gei landscape. Similarly, in the case of Seshu's long landscape, it was likely the powerful military lord, Ouchi Masahiro, for whom the painting and its attendant imagery was intended. In attempting to decipher the meanings that this imagery held for, the three, for these Japanese potentates circa 1500, I, pr I propose approaching the significance of the grotto trope through three lenses that is the grotto as abode of the immortals, the grotto as a sacred repository, and the grotto as a utopian paradise. On a fundamental level, the imagery of the Taoist grotto heaven would have appealed to Japanese potentates for its indelible association with immortality. As the interior counterpart to the sacred mountain, the cave has been conceptualized since ancient times as the abode of transcendent beings or immortals. The immortals who are believed to inhabit caves are a particular category of transcendent being in Taoist cosmology known as earth spirits, or di xian. Unlike other immortals, the earth spirits do not ascend to the celestial realm, but rather roam the earth, uh, roam freely in the mountains of the terrestrial world. 
their immortality is achieved by maintaining pure concentrations of chi, or vital energy, in the body. This is the same vital energy that is preserved in distilled and unadulterated states in the geological strata of mountains. The conditions of immortality for those who reside in the space of the Grotto Heaven is reflected in either slowed or suspended temporality, what we might consider a kind of timeless stasis. Perhaps as important to the Grotto Heaven's association with immortality is the nature of the mountains themselves as the most potent source for the raw ingredients required in alchemical elixirs. As we've seen, craggy rockery is a primary signifier of the grotto in landscape paintings. The stalactites and stalagmites of the cavernous interior, rich in calcium carbonate, were believed to be constituted by high concentrations of chi that dripped from the rocks like life-giving milk. This rockery was also the source for other ores that could be extracted for alchemical preparations. As in the Gei landscape, flowing water was also deemed an important source of chi, uh, and an important, therefore an important iconographic feature of the Grotto Heaven, um, the stream issuing deep from within the, within the mountains and thus uh, imbued with its own kind of numinous power. Through the consumption of these minerals, as we see in the preparation of water in the Gei landscape, Taoist adepts ingested distilled concentrations of vital energy that was beneficial uh, in their quest for immortality. And we know, for example, that uh, at least one early uh, Taoist treatise that specifically associates uh, the Grotto Heaven with immortality and alchemy, um, the text known as Master Embracing Simplicity, or the Bao Puzi, uh, was known in 15th century Japan. Anxiety about mortality is seen in other realms of visual culture in late medieval Japan. The late decades of the 15th century witnessed, for example, a proliferation of paintings depicting the god of longevity in different guises, a phenomenon likely associated with the pervasiveness of violence and death during this period, and the concomitant desire to commission paintings that could provide apatropaic and protective powers. The close association between the Grotto Heaven and immortality may have imparted the imagery of the Grotto Heaven in landscape painting with a similarly auspicious and protective function. In addition to its auspicious and perhaps protective uh, connotations of immortality, the Grotto Heaven may also have appealed to Japanese potentates and patrons for the politically legitimizing nature of its identity as a repository of sacred teachings. According to Taoist cosmology, during the formation of the universe, the sacred teachings descended to the earth as rays of light, whereupon they solidified and were recorded by the gods in a sacred text or script on golden tablets. As the embodiment of the sacred teachings, these texts related the mysteries surrounding the world's inherent nature and its primordial structure. The sacred texts were thus believed to impart divine protection and legitimacy upon those who possessed them. The gods ensured that only the worthy would be granted access to these numinous scriptures. One legendary figure who was granted this honor was the ancient sage king, Yu, heralded as the first king of the Xia dynasty and the miraculous tamer of the floods in Chinese mythological history. According to the scripture of the Five Talismans, the sage king transcribed these texts onto scrolls and stored them in different grotto chambers throughout the land. It was these very texts that King He Lu of Wu dispatched the recluse of Baoshan to find among the labyrinth network of caves underneath Lake Tai. Upon arriving at the palatial walled city within the grotto, the recluse described his discovery of the sacred scrolls as follows. I prepared myself and entered, walking about and looking around within. On the northern dais of a jade chamber, there was a single scroll of plain red silk. I could not understand the writing of the scroll, but I bowed repeatedly. The sacred teachings thus came to be conceptualized as numinous scriptures and potent symbols of divinely endorsed kingship. Only the worthy among terrestrial rulers is granted access to the scriptures and blessed by their powers of protection and divine mandate. In the Taoist imaginary, it is the grotto heaven that shelters this sacred knowledge from the profane world. As a motif in painting, the grotto heaven may thus have connoted a source of political legitimacy for Japanese potentates, who in their possession of these scrolls were on some level laying claim to this source of divine mandate for themselves. 
The employment of the hand scroll format for these paintings may also have provided a compelling material metaphor. As Professor McCormick has uh, written about extensively in her scholarship, the hand scroll, um, as a format of painting, the hand scroll engenders a personal and private mode of viewing, whereby the viewer holds the painting in his or her hands and unrolls it section by section, a process somewhat akin to reading a book. When not being actively viewed, the hand scroll remains in its rolled up state, its contents concealed from view. In these ways, the hand scroll landscape may have served as a suitable material metaphor for a sacred scripture, recalling the single scroll that the recluse of Baoshan discovered in the depths of the Grotto Heaven. Like the sage teachings, the Grotto Heaven landscape constitutes a form of guarded knowledge, accessible only to those for whom it was made or those who have been deemed worthy of its ownership. This interpretation of the Grotto Heaven landscape may cast the distinctive signature that Seshu applied to the long landscape in a new light. In the 12th month of 1486, Seshu appended a lengthy signature at the end of the long landscape. Much scholarly commentary has centered around the verb that Seshu used to indicate his authorship of the painting. Uh, and this is the, the term hijutsu. As the art historian Tanaka Toyozo has demonstrated, the use of this term in the context of a painting signature is virtually unprecedented before this time. The term hijutsu possesses a Buddhist meaning in which it was used to characterize the act of translating and interpreting uh, scriptures from Sanskrit into Chinese. Historians of painting have thus proposed that Seshu's employment of this rather cryptic term in this context was an allusion to his stylistic interpretation of a prevailing landscape style in contemporary China. In light of the interpretation that I have proposed, however, I would argue that perhaps Seshu's use of this term had greater implications than merely referencing his artistic process. As the possessor of this grotto heaven landscape, Ochi Masahiro was thus also possessor of the sacred teachings that it literally and figuratively embodied. The scroll itself, akin to the sacred scriptures that Seshu here has interpreted for his patron in visual form. In both its pictorial and material dimensions, therefore, the Grotto Heaven landscape could serve as a potent symbol, a numinous object of political leg legitimization in a time when the political landscape was decidedly unstable. And finally, perhaps as central to the Grotto Heaven's legitimizing role as a repository of sacred teachings is its association with utopia. As the scholar Wolfgang Barr has noted, the Grotto Heaven is the most Taoist of the Chinese conceptions of paradise. Nowhere is the identity of the Grotto Heaven as utopian paradise more pronounced than in the Peach Blossom Spring narrative. Upon entering into the cave, the fisherman is struck by the ordinariness of the hidden valley where cocks crow and dogs bark just as they do in the outside world. As Bauer has observed, the this worldliness of the Taoist grotto heaven reflects a desire to bring heaven from the celestial realm down to earth. The grotto heaven landscapes produced in Japan seem to teeter on this ontological threshold. Their mountains and rivers, villages and fields are no different than those in countless other landscapes. Yet each painter's embedding of the grotto imagery introduces a subtle uncertainty. Perhaps we are not meant to understand these landscapes as reflections of the world we know, but rather as representations of the counter universes that exist within the caves. The idea of an alternative world, not entirely dissimilar from the mundane world, but one importantly free of war and suffering would have been an appealing vision for the painting's potential patrons. In the, wake of prolonged civil, in the wake of a prolonged civil war, such a vision would have been all the more aspirational. In the third month of 1487, just a few months after Seshu uh, appended his signature to the long landscape, Ochi Masahiro embarked on another painting project, a series of landscape paintings that were to be installed in his residence. As was customary at this time in the late 15th century, Masahiro requested that a group of monks compose poems to accompany each of these landscape scenes. The landscape paintings themselves do not survive, but one of the poems, uh, actually several of the poems, of which this is one, um, are preserved in the anthology of Zen monks. And this one is by a monk named Osen Keisan, and he writes, 
One ambles in the midst of plentiful breeze, where deep in the verdant shadows a dwelling nestles against the mountain. Only now can the people of southwest Japan live in peace, for the ocean does not stir up waves and the boats are at ease. Osen's poem lauds Ochi Masahiro's political victories in the wake of the Onin War by likening the bucolic imagery of the landscape painting to Masahiro's territory in southwest Japan. And here, um, for those of you who might be looking at the characters, uh, Chugoku, the characters Chugoku don't refer to China, um, but rather to the region of uh, southwest Honshu. In the 10 years since the end of the Civil War, Ochi Masahiro had indeed established a period of unprecedented stability and peace throughout his lands. Thus, the Grotto Heaven imagery of the long landscape was perhaps not intended so much as an aspirational vision as it was an allegorical one that equated the Ochi Lord's territories with the utopia of the Grotto Heaven itself. Through a close examination of two paintings, one a celebrated national treasure and the other a comparatively obscure work, I've sought to offer new interpretations of these monumental landscapes that not only illuminate the meanings embedded in their forms, but which also allude to a larger consciousness of religious Taoism in the culture of late medieval Japan. In so doing, I've tried to propose a method by which we can approach this history of landscape painting in ways that are not entangled in stylistic analysis or dependent upon accompanying inscriptions. In these examples, the pictorial language of the landscape speaks for itself, as long as we are attuned to seeing it. In the late 15th and early 16th century, the imagery of the Grotto Heaven begins to emerge in Japanese landscape painting, particularly within landscapes made in the hand scroll format. While the appearance of this new pictorial imagery no doubt reflects the exposure of Japanese painters to new types of visual material. It also suggests new ways in which landscape painting created meaning at this juncture in history. The year circa 1500 marked a tumultuous transition that bridged the late medieval and early modern eras. Within this historical context, the imagery of the Taoist Grotto Heaven spoke to areas of deep anxiety and concern for Japan's potentates, including their own mortality, political legitimacy, and the fate of the country. In their multivalent evocation of the Grotto Heaven universe, this new breed of landscape painting offered an alternative framework through which Japanese potentates could lay claim to political authority, and much like the cave itself, offered a vision of hope, of light beyond the darkness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for this really beautiful talk. It was it was really lovely to see this. Um, I'm curious, so I, I don't know this context at all, so I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about um, the patrons' involvement in these in these works and how how much say um, he would have, how much knowledge he would have, his relationship to, to um, painting generally. Yeah, thank you. Um, so for the Gei landscape, the painting that's shown here above on the top, um, we don't know anything, as I mentioned, about the particular circumstances of this painting's production at all, unfortunately, besides the fact that it's probably by Gei, and that's due to the seals that are impressed on it. But um, the reason I think that we can speculate that this kind of imagery, the cave imagery, would have been something uh, known to the Ashikaga shoguns, who are the Prime, kind of primary political leaders of this time is that correspondence, that kind of striking correspondence between the imagery as it's described uh, from that really prestigious hand scroll that we know uh, was not only in the shogunal collection but was something of kind of particular prestige. Um, and in the case of the, the shoguns, um, they probably would have had a, a fairly um, if they were involved in commissioning a painting like this, they probably would have had 
um, a fair degree of agency in, in the subject matter. We have a lot of evidence of, uh, especially from the late 15th century, of uh, the, the shogun kind of expressing strong opinions about what kind of subject matter is suitable in what kind of context. Um, and in terms of how much they would have known about kind of the Taoist tones of uh, the Grotto Heaven, that's much harder to ascertain because um, we do know that s some Taoist texts were in Japan at that time, but they're just not mentioned very much in comparison to, of course, Buddhist texts or other, other texts, Neo-Confucian texts and so forth. Um, in terms of the long landscape, um, we also, we don't really know anything about um, the specifics of its production besides the fact that it was completed, it seems, in the 12th month. And the reason that it's um, considered to have been commissioned by Ouchi Masahiro is because um, at that time, Seshu, the painter, seems to have been with working within that sphere. And unfortunately, we know even less about the Ouchi's kind of um, literary or philosophical inclinations than we do about the um, than we do about the Ashikaga shoguns. But the Ochi, um, and maybe this is something we can also talk about in the panel, they were located in southwest Japan. They were headquartered there. And so they had a lot of um, pretty direct contact with the various de delegations who are returning from China. And so there's a way in which the culture of southwest Japan was in some ways more kind of cosmopolitan, more kind of up-to-date with um, continental culture than even the capital. So in some sense, it's even more likely that a patron of a painting like the Long Landscape in Southwest Japan uh, would have been knowledgeable of this kind of imagery, but also some of these kind of ideas surrounding the, the Grotto Heaven trope. Thank you, Jennifer. Oh, there's a student. Oh, there's this right here. Um, um, so now we've seen one painting by Seshu with Buddhist iconography mm -hmm. and now one with Taoist themes. Do you know if Seshu had any particular affinity for one religion or religion in general? Well, certainly he, he was an ordained Zen monk. Um, he didn't have a, a very... Uh, kind of illustrious career as a Zen monk. He remained at a relatively low kind of bureaucratic status, but he himself was um, a Zen monk. And so certainly uh, the kinds of Zen um, connotations that Professor Lippitt has you know, illuminated for us would have been something kind of very uh, familiar to Seshu, kind of very central to his, um, to his life. The Taoist uh, elements, again, a little bit harder to say. We do, we do know that the Ochi, who again were probably Seshu's patrons, worshipped uh, a very syncretic deity um, that was essentially um, a, a kind of manifestation of the North Star, so a kind of Taoist uh, avatar. And so there's, that's one reason to believe that the Ochi did have some kind of investment in kind of Taoist ideas, although although they did worship this deity uh, in a in in a Buddhist context too. Um, we also know that Seshi was very interested in Neo Confucianism, so there there is evidence of his sort of more um, syncretic interest beyond just Zen Buddhism. And I would say that um, that these paintings are probably further further evidence uh, of that. Thank you, Rue. Uh, Stephanie, thank you. I, I learned so much, and I think you have a very um, persuasive, um, very well visually laid out uh, thesis. And I had a few um, s small questions. One is in Seshu's uh, long landscape scroll, which is on the screen the, at the bottom, the portion, the two um, openings in the wall and the figures kind of 
uh, ascending and then one descending mm. the staircase. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that because it's very unusual yeah. in even within the Grotto Heaven iconography. Yeah. And yeah. one ascending, one descending. What are your thoughts about that more specifically? And then another uh, small question concerns the role of, um, just in talking about religion, mountain worship in Japan. So yeah. Yamabushi, and we know that actually some warlords, and this is something uh, Melissa knows quite a bit yeah. about too, the Hosokawa and others are, are heavily involved in mountain ascetic yeah. Uh, yeah. practice, which has interesting um, resonances with with Dallas Grotto Heaven. Um, just if you have any thoughts on either of those. Yeah, thank you. Um, about the figures and the stairway, I, I can't say that I have seen any other paintings, Chinese or Japanese or Korean, that show that particular motif or vignette of figures kind of ascending and descending the stairways. Some of the, the very elaborate descriptions um, from these Taoist texts that talk, and you, you could kind of get a, a feeling from the parts that I cited that the, the descriptions tend to be very detailed and kind of um, lay out every step of the, the journey. So in some of those kinds of descriptions, there is reference to um, stairways um, but not so much as there is kind of this, the, the image is more of a labyrinth of kind of, um, of, of caves that sort of expands horizontally rather than um, this kind of ascension into the mountain. Um, but I would say that here, the fact that Seshu shows the figures, not just because the, the, the village is really at the opening of the cave, right? And we don't get much sense of the interior. And as you pointed out in the Bodhidharma painting, um, there's, a, there's a sense of that it kind of ends, right? There's not really a sense of, of where the cave proceeds beyond those um, dwellings that are shown there. So by placing the figures on the staircase and showing them kind of in movement, I think it's kind of a way in which he's gesturing to that idea that this is a realm that you can enter into. Um, but, you know, it's a very uh, unusual, unusual scene. Um, and then in terms of, oh yes, mountain, uh, mountain worship. So that's a very interesting point. And um, I know that in Yamaguchi there are very famous caves. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure to what extent those are related to mountain ascetic practices. I haven't, unfortunately, looked into that yet, but that's something that I'm very interested in, the, the potential connection between the grotto imagery and the long landscape and the Ouchi's own um, kind of territorial geography um, with respect to these famous, one, the one famous cave, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but um, very famous cave. In, in Yamaguchi, and I wouldn't be surprised if there was also a, a strong element of mountain ascetic practice um, in relation to that, too. Thank you. Okay. That concludes the session portion of our program. <laughs> 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 Um, we're going to have a break for lunch. What time do we reconvene? One twenty. is our reconvening time. I hope you'll come back. Professor McCormick and I are going to be talking about quite different art, quite different subject matter. So um, enough of this black and white. We're going for color. <laughs> so anyway, we do hope you will join us again. Um, the room is going to need to be locked up over the lunchtime uh, because of all the fancy equipment here. So um, I'm sorry that you can't just sort of hang out here. I hope you'll go and have a nice lunch.
Hello? Hello? Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for returning um, for our two presentations this afternoon. Uh, if you are watching the YouTube live stream and you have questions, there's a bit of a lag. Um, so if you don't mind uh, posing your questions, we will then document them and try to uh, return to some of them in the panel discussion, or at the very least, we can pass the questions on to the relevant speakers. So I'd like to now uh, introduce our first speaker this afternoon, Melissa McCormick, the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of Japanese Art and Culture and Harvard College Professor in the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations at Harvard University. Professor McCormick's prolific scholarship has focused on the history of pre-modern Japanese painting, particularly concerning the interrelationship between text and image, questions of scale and format, context of patronage, and especially the role of women in artistic production, patronage, and reception. She is the author of a pioneering study on Japanese illustrated hand scrolls titled Tosa Mitsunobu and the Small Scroll in Medieval Japan, which was published by the University of Washington Press. Among her various areas of expertise, Professor McCormick is a leading scholar on the literary masterwork, The Tale of Genji, and its history of pictorial representation. In 2018, she authored uh, an illuminating monograph titled The Tale of Genji, a visual companion, published by Princeton University Press, which is brimming with insightful analysis and has become an essential resource for study of the tale. Professor McCormick was also co-curator of the first major loan exhibition in North America on the artistic tradition inspired by the tale of Genji, a landmark exhibition held at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York in 2019. And that exhibition was accompanied by uh, a stunning catalog um, co-authored by Professor McCormick, um, as scholarly as it is beautiful. Professor McCormick's scholarly publications beyond these major works are simply too numerous to acknowledge in the context of a short um, introduction, but they range in topic from medieval Genji paintings to the work of the 19th century Buddhist nun, poet, potter, painter, and calligrapher, Otagaki Rengetsu. Her publications have appeared in esteemed scholarly venues such as the Art Bulletin, the premier Japanese art historical journal, Koka, and the Journal Review of Japanese Culture and Society, among many others. Professor McCormick is not only an outstanding scholar, but she has also been recognized for her contributions as a teacher, honored by the title College, a Harvard College Professor, the highest teaching award offered by the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University. In short, Professor McCormick has been an immense inspiration to me since my early days. As a graduate student, her intellectual rigor and erudition offering the highest standard to which a scholar can aspire. It is with great pleasure that I welcome Professor McCormick to the podium. Thank you, Stephanie, for that kind introduction. And thank you to the organizers um, and to Professor Shimao and Professor um, Jean Phillips. I also like to extend my gratitude. They were both mentors of mine as graduate students and beyond, and their publications on this period of Japanese history have also been guiding lights throughout my career. And uh, Stephanie now, newly minted, a newly minted colleague, I'm so grateful to her and to have her um, share my passion for this period in, in Japanese history. Um, today, I'd like to start with a, a prologue um, to establish a historical framework for this talk on gendered authority in the late medieval period. I will jump ahead with this brief introduction to a, the time when this portrait was created, 
which dates to the early 17th century. It depicts a married couple, Date Masamune on the right, and Tamura Megohime, otherwise known as Yotokuin, on the left, with an inscription by the Zen monk Ungo Kiyo at the top. The work functioned as a mortuary portrait of two individuals who were important patrons of the august Zen Buddhist temple, Myoshinji, and its branch temples. The couple's identity as patrons meant that the inscription called for high praise. Thus, the inscriber, the priest Ungo, proclaims the virtues of these two people in the form of parallel couplets, in which he changes only a few words to render each verse gender appropriate, as you can see here. So on the right, a wise general, ruler of the outer realm, a hundred battles, a hundred victories. With sword and brush, he spreads virtue near and far. And on the left, a wise wife, ruler of the inner realm, 10,000 words, 10,000 actions. With knowledge and love, she emits the fragrance of virtue. These matching virtues of man and woman follow parameters that are somewhat expected. Ungo, the inscriber, exalts the male warrior's ability to control the, out, the world outside using the graph, the word ji, which can mean to control, to conquer, to govern. In Date Masamune's case, the outer realm is potentially broad, referring not only to the world beyond his domain, but to the world outside Japan. I will remind you that Masamune was known for having funded the 1613 diplomatic mission to Europe to negotiate with the Pope in Rome and the King of Spain. In the third line, the inscriber further explains that Masamune ruled the exterior through military might, or bu, in balance with the sage understanding of letters, or bun, bu and bun being the two well-known ancient intertwined components of successful rule in times of war and peace. The woman in the portrait, Tamura Megohime, or Yotokuin, who married Masamune at the age of 13, is praised for ruling the interior, which the inscriber says she does through knowledge and love or compassion, qualities that are presented as counterparts to Masamune's strength and study. She does not spread virtue throughout the outer world, but rather emits the scent of virtue inside, a reference to the orchid flowering in the shadows. Interestingly, the encomia are inscribed so that neither appears strikingly superior to the other. The verse for Masamune on the right has been written in left to right reading order, while the text describing Yotokuin moves from right to left. The inscription directs the reader to start in the middle, moving back and forth, alternating between the matching verses for the man and the woman. In form and content, the inscription shows the kind of yin and yang nature of these two figures and their roles in life and society. I want to emphasize two kind of takeaway points about this painting. The first is that it articulates a gendered binary in its rhetoric, but that division is not the commonly perceived one for pre-modern societies that posits masculine autonomy and feminine subjection. Instead, the counterpart to the male ruler is affirmed as a ruler in her own right, entrusted with autonomy over household affairs. A specific role is carved out for the wife that renders her non-threatening, still subsumed within a patriarchal structure and within which she can bolster the family and its lineage. And second, while positing this binary, the form of the inscription enacts an ethos of inter interdependence between these two societal identities that valorizes the woman's circumscribed role. As mentioned, this painting is later than the period under discussion for this symposium. It dates, again, to the early 17th century, about 100 years later, when pronouncements about gender roles became reified under the government's adoption of neo-Confucian moralistic conventions. In the master narratives of women's history of pre-modern Japan, this period is seen the, the circa 1500 is seen, oh, I'm sorry, the 17th century is seen as an endpoint to a long, steady decline of rights and financial autonomy for women, where the total subordination of women becomes official policy under the Tokugawa shogunate. 
In such accounts, the early 16th century, the time period we're focusing on today, is often either neglected or viewed as a bleak prelude to total patriarchal control. There is a perception that women circa 1500 across all classes went without much autonomy and were certainly absent from cultural patronage and production. It is difficult to find artworks made by women in that period. They do exist, but they're anonymous. And women seem to have been systematically excluded from literary gatherings of the day. This stands in stark contrast to the Heian period, for example, when women authors produced the most impactful texts in the history of Japanese literature. The absence of women in the 16th century, specifically in accounts of Sengoku Daimyo, or warlords of the 16th century of those families, has led to the perception that the documentary record is insufficient to tell the stories of late medieval women or to integrate women's history into general history. Today I offer a case study to show how much there is to be learned about female historical, historical actors in the early 16th century. I hope in the process to demonstrate that even the separate but autonomous role suggested in this painting is insufficient to capture the complexity of women's lives and the shifts in authority that occur from changes in social status, religious identity, regional location, financial wealth, and stage in the life cycle. I will focus on the women of the Asakura family, first providing you with historical background and context, then describing one artistic project that these women shaped, and I'll conclude with the discussion of the importance of recovering medieval matrilines and women's networks and understanding this historical period to the fullest extent possible. Alongside the Ouchi, whose activities and aspirations have been so helpfully detailed today by Professor Bennett, the Asakura family represents one of the most important warrior clans um, whom I consider to be co-creators of painting and literary artifacts in this period. Their most transformative contribution to the history of Japanese art is a new genre of folding screen paintings depicting the capital city of Kyoto which no symposium on art circa 1500 should be without. The Asakura family commissioned this new genre of painting from the artist Tosa Mitsunobu in the year 1506. It's a different kind of painting of the realm than the one that Stephanie showed earlier. In 1506, the, the Asakura screens, or the 1506 Asakura screens do not survive, sadly. So I am showing you the next oldest pair from roughly 20 years later as a stand-in. At the top of the slide is a quote from the diary of the courtier Sanjo Nishi Sanetaka, in which he describes this new commission. Kandoji Motonaga came over. The Asakura of Echizen have newly commissioned folding screens that depict the entirety of the capital across the pair. A new design by Tosa Mitsunobu. It is a most marvelous thing, fascinating from first glance. The courtier registers his wonderment at the paintings and their novelty, which seem to signal that in this passage, we are witnessing the birth of a new painting genre, which would develop in myriad ways over the next several centuries throughout to the present day and it would impact the way landscapes and urban spaces were depicted from this period onward. But this novel approach to depicting Kyoto was not the brainchild of the artist alone. Screen paintings in the late medieval, pe late medieval period were created through a collaborative process that involved patrons, artists, and advisors. In this case, the Asakura patrons, provincial daimyo who ruled the province of Echizen, would have had much to say about what was and was not included in these paintings. And I hope to show you today, give you some sense of why we should also consider how the women of the Asakura family might have gazed upon this work and influenced the way it was shaped. To give you a sense of how this family was able to commission this new kind of painting, I'm going to now give you a little bit of background about the area that the Asakura uh, ruled. So let's travel to the province of Echizen, present-day Fukui Prefecture, about 100 miles north of Kyoto, as you can see on the map here, which is not far from the coast of the Sea of Japan. 
This aerial view shows the location of the city of Ichijodani, where the Asakura developed their capital, nestled in a valley about 20 miles inland. The Asakura began ruling Echizen province in 1471 when Asakura Eirin was appointed Shugo, or military governor of the province, after years of battling two other warrior families for supremacy in this region. As you can see from this list of Asakura chieftains, they would reign over the regional capital for nearly 100 years, until 1573 when Oda Nobunaga decimated the city and its res residents. This would be the period right before the television show Shogun takes place, in case any of you are watching. But today, I'm, I'm going to be focusing on a period when this regional capital flourished. By the early 16th century, the Asakura had developed an urban environment that gave its citizens no reason to leave. It was a full-service city with multiple religious institutions, with areas of manufacture for necessary goods, commercial shops of all kinds to cater to everyday needs, supplied by trade routes over land, sea, and inland waterways. The so-called Warring States, or Sengoku era, into which circa 1500 falls, was not one of constant warfare for all regions. As the historian Morgan Patelka has stated, quote, the Sengoku period, it turns out, was for the Asakura and their subjects an age defined less by war and destruction than by stability and prosperity. And his book, which I highly recommend, shown here, attempts to demonstrate how this was the case from the ground up across all walks of life in the city. This statement about the prosperity of the city holds especially true in the years that correspond to the family headship of Asakura Sadakage and his son, Asakura Takakage, the generations that I'll be focusing on today. This father and son pair of successive family heads had much to build on from previous generations, and the city grew at a rapid pace under their headship. This reconstructive imagined view of the city of Ichijodane at its peak might give you some sense of how it thrived in this era. A central part of the city's allure was the culture created there, sponsored by the Asakura, but also by their vassals, who by the early 1500s had financial, substantial financial resources at their disposal. Cultural production and literary and artistic activities of the highest level were centered in the residences of the Asakura main family line, which you can see are sited here at the foot of the mountain to the east. The residential complex was surrounded by a moat on three sides and had at least 16 structures. It was in such spaces as the Asakura Palace interior, shown here, that all manner of events and meetings would have taken place. Meetings were the production of literature and poetry and painting co-mingled with politics. It was here and at the many Buddhist temples in the city that the Asakura received erudite visitors from the capital, specialists in Chinese and Japanese classical learning. Zen priests, knowledgeable courtiers, and performers of theatrical productions based in the capital and in Echizen. And it was here that all the styles and genres of painting that made up the visual world of this period could have been glimpsed. The large kaisho, or meeting room, in this building was known to have had some 13 wall paintings, likely ink paintings done by a member of the Soga school of painters who were famously sponsored by the Asakura. These wall paintings have recently been uh, recreated on site in Ichijodani, newly painted by art students, based on Soga school wall paintings in the Shinjuan subtemple of Daitokuji. The Asakura's patronage of painters from the Soga family of Echizen seemed to extend back into the 15th century, as with this Bodhidharma painting by a Soga painter signed by the famous Zen monk Ikkyu also known to have been sponsored by the Asakura. It has even been suggested that our beloved Seshu visited Echizen, judging by a painting of Mount Yuang in China, that Seshu is recorded as having painted for Asakura Kokyu, an Asakura family member who served three successive clan heads as a retainer. 
In addition to Sino-Japanese ink painters, the painter Tosa Mitsunobu frequently worked for the Asakura. Mitsunobu held the title of Director of the Painting Bureau and was the highest ranking and most prolific painter of the late Muromachi period. Here is his portrait of the theatrical performer, the purported founder of the style of Kowakamai dance, Momonoi Naoaki, whose troupe worked for the Asakura in Echizen. And of course, it was Mitsunobu who executed the magnificent new design of the screens of the capital for the Asakura in 1506, when the family was under the leadership of Sadakage. The Asakura screens, now lost, were no doubt just as complex and multi-layered as the later screens shown here. They should also be understood, however, in the context of Sadakage's aspirations for Ichijo Dani and his family's legacy. At precisely this time in 1506, the 34-year-old ruler of the domain was expanding on his predecessor's accomplishments and strengthening the city by building, for example, stone paved roads that would connect this vibrant region with the capital more readily. One can imagine the Asakura's desire for a realistic view of the capital to envision their own city while providing a stunning visual connotation of the capital to which the elite residents and visitors of Ichijo Dani were to, they, to where they were traveling on a regular basis. It was, moreover, a visualization of an urban landscape that members of the Asakura family were deeply connected to. These were not individuals who were gazing upon the capital of Kyoto um, as outsiders. They could view these screens as patrons of many of the institutions that were depicted, from Buddhist temples to the imperial palace. And by 1506, the Asakura had vast financial sums at their disposal, and they frequently outspent other patrons by conspicuous amounts. The history of Asakura patronage is only ever presented through the lens of male rulers of the family, and by using genealogical charts that only show the male members of the clan. Entirely excluded from this picture are the women of the Asakura family and their kin. As a result, um, the understanding of this cultural era remains only partial and impoverished. Now I'd like to show how the picture changes when the women and their matrilines are put back into the genealogy. One could say that the most important patronage activities conducted by Sadakage only happened after a pivotal event in his life, his marriage to the daughter of Saito Myojin in 1491. In that year, Sadakage was 19, his new wife was 13, and the Asakura paid 20,000 kanmon, which was a lot, for the event. The woman left her family home in Mino province and entered Echizen in a marriage procession. She was transported in a palanquin, escorted by five men on horseback, and she had an entourage of over 30 people. She would give birth to several children, it seems, including the heir to the family line, Takakage, in 1493, at the age of 15, just two years after her marriage. While she was busy birthing the heirs to ensure the continued lineage of the Asakura family, she also was hard at work on another task that seems to be one of her major responsibilities, fortifying and further building the Asakura, Asakuras and the Domain's library of texts. So in addition to infrastructure in Ichijo Dani, the Asakura also invested in the scholarly traditions that would enable its current and future household members to um, possess the kind of knowledge that would allow them to understand the various artworks they were commissioning and all of the art forms that were taking place in Ichijo Dani. To sustain and develop the rulership of the domain required access to knowledge and to sources for this continued education and new manuscript, uh, manuscript production of all kinds. By the time of the city's destruction in 1573, the number and diversity of volumes accumulated over the course of 100 years in Ichijo Dani must have been huge. While most of the texts were lost to the conflagration set by Oda Nobunaga, occasionally surviving texts appear, and some of these were procured by Sadakage's wife. This manuscript of the 10th century work, The Tales of Ise, is said to have been passed down in the Asakura house, 
and seems to correspond to one commissioned by Sadakage's wife in 1498. She was 20 years old at this time, and she enlisted the esteemed courtier Sanjo Nishi Sanetaka to produce a single volume of the Tales of Ise. Sanetaka complied and was happily rewarded by the young woman several weeks later with a luxurious bolt of cloth for his labors. This marked the beginning of a relationship in which Sanetaka was asked to produce numerous literary manuscripts for Sadakage's wife and the Asakura house, sometimes directly by her and sometimes mediated through his courtier colleague and first cousin, Kandoji Motonaga. A particularly busy period of activity occurred between 1509 and 1512 when the courtier wrote, edited, and collated numerous texts pertaining to the tale of Genji for Sadakage's wife and the house. The texts included commentaries on the tale, excerpts of favorite poems, brushed by the emperor, and most importantly, full chapters of the 11th century work. At this time, Sadakage's wife was about 30 years old. By 1512, the Asakura had acquired a full set of the tale of Genji. So if you've read it, it's over 1,300 pages in English translation. It was a long book, and it was divided into 54 chapters, which were all produced in separate volumes at this time. So in 1512, Sanetaka records in his diary that he brushed the calligraphy for a lacquer box to contain the chapters of the tale of Genji for the Asakura. The Genji box to which Sanetaka referred no longer survives, as far as we know, but it must have looked something like this example. Genji, Genji mini libraries were not uncommon, but virtually all of those that survive date from the Edo period. The lacquer makie cabinets can bear abstract and pictorial designs in gold in a variety of techniques. In this example, a gold and metal lacquered cabinet is outfitted with six drawers to contain nine booklets each for a total of 54 chapters. Sanetaka mentions providing the calligraphy for the Tale of Genji cabinet, by which he means specifically the writing that appears on the individual drawers, which you can see clearly uh, in this slide here. These are the chapter titles. Um, so there are chapter titles for nine chapters, clearly labeled for optimal organization and ease of use. As I mentioned, virtually all Genji cabinets or mini libraries date to the Edo period, but the entry from Sanetaka's diary makes it clear that the phenomenon started as early as 1512. Moreover, it seems that at some point, elite provincial daimyo all needed their own sets, as suggested by this slide, showing you cabinets owned by the Ochi and the Mori daimyo families of Western Japan. To acquire a new full manuscript of the Tale of Genji was a complex endeavor, to say the least. The commissioner needed to enlist the services of someone to help them coordinate the project, a, a general contractor, so to speak, um, and also to enlist calligraphers who would write out all of those chapters. Often at times it was a joint project, not just one calligrapher. And those people had to be really knowledgeable about the tale of Genji. They had to make sure there were no mistakes in the text. And they also provided light annotation. In the case of Sadakage's wife and the members of the Asakura house, that person coordinating this Genji project for them was the courtier Kan Kandoji Motonaga. So I'm just showing you here a kind of cast of characters of this project. So Motonaga is circled here. Um, was the primary mediator between members of the Asakura house in Echizen and artists and calligraphers in the capital. As we have seen, Sadakage's wife also had contact with the courtier Sanjo Nishi Sanataka, as shown here, and his portrait by Mitsunobu is there. But Mot uh, Motonaga, in this case, for this Genji project, was the one in charge. So luckily, both of these men, Motonaga and Sanetaka, both of them kept diaries. They're amazing documents. Sanetaka's was for over decades, and he never failed to miss a day virtually. It's incredible. And they recorded passing references to the project. Um, so even in the case of the calligraphy for the lacquer Genji box, Sanetaka asks Motonaga to come over and inspect his finished project before it's sent to Echizen. Um, 
I should also note that both of these men are first cousins, so they're especially close. And at some point during the Genji project, um, their son and daughter got married, so they became in-laws as well. So it's a, it's a tight-knit circle. So these men were responsible for finding a Genji manuscript to copy, um, brushing full chapters themselves, asking other calligraphers to make chapters, and then checking the text for errors. Sanetaka had spent many, many years studying the tale of Genji. And if any of you have the impression that the tale of Genji is a simple romance or is sort of just about a lurid prince who gets around, um, that's not how the text was perceived among many people in the 16th century, where it, it was inc an incredible document to people to learn from and to learn from in terms of learning statecraft, um, all sorts of things, and profound kind of philosophical insights as well. Sanetaka had spent much of his life studying the tale of Genji, and he even authored his own commentary, which he also provided to the Asakura. So uh, then, in addition to all these texts, the Asakura had to get the people to create the cabinet and so forth, and they had to have um, perhaps someone to decorate the covers of all of these chapters. So one would have every reason to assume that the Genji manuscripts went the way of the capital screens painted by Tosa Mitsunobu for the Asakura. Surely such fragile paper books were destroyed in the fires of Ichijodane of 1573, if not before. Or were they? In 2019, a remarkable Genji genealogy emerged and went on display in the Nakanoshima Kosetsu Museum of Art, a book that I believe was very likely part of this full set of 54 volumes made specifically for the Asakura house in 1511. As we'll see, this manuscript becomes a key artifact for recovering the role of female patronage activities by the Asakura women and making them a part of Asakura cultural history. Briefly, what is a Genji genealogy? It's a supplementary text that helps a reader navigate the epic tale of Genji and its hundreds of characters by charting the interrelationships between them. And you can see uh, how it works here. The book is made in an accordion style format, created sort of like a hand scroll um, where you would read laterally across. So one moves from right to left, tracing the red lines and a character's offspring through the generations and a laterally unfolding family tree. And this is the way most genealogies were done in the medieval period in Japan. If you've ever read the 54 chapters of the tale of Genji, you can understand why people were so eager for a copy of their own to help them make sense of the complex tale and the bewildering number of characters and their connections. In fact, ge genealogies uh, abound today. Here's one from uh, Richard Bowering's Handy Guide to the Tale of Genji. And usually English translations of the Tale of Genji start each chapter with a list of characters and who they are. Sometimes these charts can get creative as in this manga-esque version with images for each character beginning with chapter one, which can already start to become confusing. In 1488, the courtier Sanetaka created a brand new Genji genealogy after much study, where he took a new approach to charting the characters. The genealogy became all the rage as individuals in the capital and throughout the provinces requested copies. Sanetaka met the demand, brushing copies himself of this important Genji study guide that he had thoughtfully created. And there are many copies of Sanetaka's genealogy that survive today in his own hand. Given all these copies that he brushed for his contemporaries, one might expect that this volume, too, would be in Sanetaka's hand. A close analysis of the calligraphy reveals, however, that it is not in the hand of Sanetaka. Rather, it resembles the calligraphy of the courtier Kandoji Motonaga the person who was coordinating the Genji manuscript project for Sarakage's wife. Motonaga had worked with Sanetaka many times, including on this uh, hand scroll, The Legends of Kiyomizudera in 1517, with paintings uh, done by no, none other than Tosa Mitsunobu. In this case, Motonaga brushed the last five sections of the second scroll 
And so we can have great examples of a baseline for understanding his calligraphic style, which is what I did to compare the new Genji, newly discovered Genji genealogy with other examples of his writing. And this um, should show the similarity. So the fact that the genealogy was by Motunaga suggests the possibility that the Genji genealogy might correspond to one that was noted in Sanataka's diary on the sixth month of 1511. On that day, Sanetaka said in his diary, Kanroji Motonaga came over, bringing with him a new copy of the Genji genealogy. We discussed it, me offering my own humble opinions. According to the entry, Motonaga consulted Sanetaka on a new copy of the genealogy. This seems to suggest that this is a copy of the text that Kanroji brushed himself. Since the contents would have followed Sanetaka's learned and popular version, one can see why Motonaga would have needed his consultation in 1511. So he's essentially brushing it for the Asakura, bringing it to Sanaitaka and saying, please check this, it's essentially your work. So this also seems to suggest that um, the Asakura included this guide to the tale of Genji in their boxed set. It would be a handy way to unlock the key to the entire narrative. But being the cultural patrons that they were, with the power to enlist the most important artists of the day for their projects, the Asakura, or patrons of their stature, of course, would not miss the opportunity to use the book covers as a platform for artwork. So we can only imagine how must the front and back covers of these Genji books have looked, given the power of the Asakura and their patronage. Interestingly, this is what they look like. The cover of the Genji genealogy has a painting on the front and the back by none other than Tosa Mitsunobu, the painter who created the first capital screens for the Asakura family. And the, the painting here on the cover of the genealogy depicts the renowned meta-narrative about the author of the Genji Murasagi Shikibu conceiving of her tale. The covers illustrate the famous legend of how Murasaki Shikibu began writing the tale of Genji while in the sacred grounds of Ishiyamadera. She received inspiration from the benevolent Kannon at the temple and experienced a moment of epiphany while contemplating the moon. The moon is now uh, faced on the front cover of the book, but it appears here reflected in the water on the back cover of the genealogy, a reflection in the water. The two covers thus create a paratextual frame of authorship, which resonates with the contents of the genealogy, which is a kind of microcosm of the tale of Genji. You can imagine the active readers turning to this volume as they read and studied the tale with the full manuscript that they had just commissioned. And if the gen uh, genealogy covers look like this, we can imagine then what those individual chapters looked like. And fortunately, there are many um, examples of Genji paintings by Mitsunobu. There is the album of uh, Genji paintings in the Harvard Museum, which was made for the vassals of the Ouchi clan, for example, from 1510, the same period. But more to the point, we have actual Genji chapters, surviving Genji chapter books in the Ide Mitsu Museum and in the Tenri University Library. So these have been known for a long time but everyone just assumed they were sort of, you know, random surviving chapters of the tale of Genji. And they also uh, survive along with a multitude of sketches by Tosa Mitsunobu here at the bottom, showing scenes for all the various other chapters of the tale of Genji. So you can imagine what the full set might have looked like. Okay, so the Ide Mitsu volume um, I believe, was a part of this original set made for the Asakura in 1511. This volume um, appears also to be written in the hand of Kandoji Motonaga. Here again is a chart adding the Ide Mitsu volume to the examples of his hand 
from the Kiyomizu Dera Engi and the genealogy, and I hope you can see the similarity across all three texts. All three volumes also are the same dimensions. All three have distinctive red labels with a stenciled design and what appears to be the calligraphy by the reigning emperor Gokashiwabara. Here again is a final calligraphy chart comparison demonstrating the resemblance to the emperor's calligraphy. So the number of people at this time with the financial resources and interpersonal connections to commission such works were limited. How did the Asakura family of provincial governors and specifically Sarakage's wife have enough clout to engage the services of the highest ranking members of the aristocracy and even the reigning emperor to uh, build the family's library of classical texts in Echizen? One answer is sheer economic might. It was at precisely this moment in the second month of 1511 that the Asakura donated 50,000 hiki, another big sum, to support the emperor's enthronement ceremony, which had been delayed from the time um, he ascended the throne in 1500. But I would argue that financial resources alone were not enough, and that for a fuller answer to this question, we need to turn to the identity of Sagakaga's wife and her kin. Unlike, um, most uh, historical family charts and genealogies that scholars make and use today to tell the history of the Warring States period, the Genji genealogy is not entirely male dominated. The fictional female characters are necessarily integrated into the diagram. Of course, female characters must be included in a Genji genealogy because they're integral participants in the story. So taking that genealogy as an inspiration, I would like to insert a few more names into the women of women into the male-dominated Asakura lineage chart to show how crucial their perspective can be. So populating the lineage chart with more women's names opens up a whole new world of interpersonal connections. It becomes apparent, for example, that perhaps even more important than Sade Kaga's wife's father was the identity, identity of her mother. She was a powerful woman. Um, she was a woman known as the nun Dite, or Dite Ni. It was she, in fact, who mediated the first commission by her daughter from Sanetaka for the tale of Ise book that I showed you. And importantly, as you can see through this dotted line, she was an adopted daughter of Kandoji Chikanaga, the father of Motonaga. So the man who'd been coordinating that Genji manuscript was in fact had a sibling relationship with the wife's mother. And once you see this, you start to realize, aha, this is why it was so easy to write letters to these courtiers in the capital. They had these familial kinship relationships that are completely obscured by male-dominated lineage charts. Diteni, the mother of Sarakaga's wife, can be seen here in this simple portrait. In 1496, Dite's husband, Sarakaga's wife's father, Saito Toshikuni, his brother, and three other Saito men died in battle all at once. After this sudden loss, Dite turned to the monk Goke Sotong to pray for their repose. She took Buddhist vows, shaved her head, and received the Dharma name of Dite. The portrait here was likely painted by a Tosa artist and is housed at Myoshinji Temple. It captures Dite at the age of 79 in 1533, three years before her death. She's depicted wearing a light inked robe and an ink dyed kesa sitting on a tatami mat with her hands in prayer. Soon after that, she donated the funds to construct a residence at Myoshinji for the monk Goke, called Tokai-an, circled on the map, and she became the most important benefactor in the temple's history. Right around the time when the Genji manuscript requests by her daughter were being made from Ichijodani in 1509, Dite purchased a tract of land in Ninnaji's Shinjoin Temple for the purpose of rebuilding Myoshinji. And she also purchased and then donated lands scattered in the surrounding area. The letter shown here by Dite documenting the transaction and the donation survives at Myoshinji. 
Her ability to donate and to purchase and donate land runs counter to most descriptions of women's rights and inheritance in this period, which assumed that such transactions had to be approved by male family members. Dite's gift allowed the temple area to expand to the west and north, doubling its former size to occupy a vast area that includes the massive structures you will see today if you visit Mio Shinji, the main gate, the main hall, and the multi-purpose hall. The temple need, needed permission to build from the emperor, which they received in the year 1510, and the request was facilitated by none other than Kandoji Motonaga. So Dite, the mother of Sadakagi's wife, also prepared her daughter well for acting as a patron for a Genji manuscript. An entry from the diary of Dite's adopted father, Chikanaga, mentions her stopping in Kyoto on her way to Ishiyamadera. This is an entry that I just found like last week. <laughs> and what's amazing is that um, this diarist, her adopted father, not only says that she came by Kyoto on her way to the temple, she had her daughter with her. And it's just incredible that he, I, that he made note of that for history. So one can easily imagine why Diteni, before she was a nun, when she was a young mother, would want to take her daughter with her on such a pilgrimage to Ishiyamadera, which you can see the gate of there. The Temple of the Sacred Rocks had long been a pilgrimage site for females, for, for women, and for women who needed to, and wanted to conceive children. After making the short journey from the capital, they would spend more than one night ensconced in the main hall of the temple, and a fortunate would become the recipient of a symbolic dream, heralding conception and a successful birth to follow. After arriving at Ishiyamadera, Diteni and her daughter would have entered through the main gate. They would have passed by the uniquely spectacular tabular spar rocks that give the temple its name. And they would have ascended the steep staircase to the main hall to worship before the image of Kannon. There they would have viewed the famous Genji room, where Murasaki Shikibu was said to have authored the tale of Genji a room which had been designated as such much earlier in the medieval period. To visit the temple was to learn the legend of Murasaki Shikibu's authorship and to round out one's education on the tale of Genji. If you go uh, today as well, you can see the Genji room, which now has a life-sized image of Murasaki Shikibu, and as well as now a, a robot um, who tells the story of the, the authoring of the tale of Genji. The legend of Murasaki's act of authorship uh, was an answer to the questions of how she was able to create such a work that surpassed all others in literature uh, in its complexity, length, and erudition. 16th century texts continued to suggest that Murasaki was a bodhisattva, bestowed a higher level of insight that elevated her work of literature to a text of profound philosophical significance. In creating this image for his patrons, Mitsunobu homed in on the act of writing, showing the female author in the act of contemplation and depicting her writing utensils with exacting detail. Brush in hand, ink well primed with ink, golden water dropper, and a black lacquered box decorated with gold. Mitsunobu also created the oldest ever vertically oriented image of Murasaki at Ishiyamadera. The next oldest would be in 1560, a hanging scroll icon made by Mitsunobu's grandson that launched a new genre of images. And he represented the temple rocks in a way that would appeal to patrons who had seen the real thing. In reality, these rocks, their shapes, sizes, variegated textures, and patterns of mineral segregations seem to capture the process of their becoming, of the thermal metamorphosis of limestone and granite. Although usually described as whitish gray, the color of the rocks appears dramatically different depending on the light and atmospheric, atmospheric conditions. Mitsunobu uses shades of blue to depict them and applies the darkest hues to the outer edges of the rocks and to interior nooks and crannies. His characteristic wavy ink outlines and moss dots imbue the boulders with an aura of agitated stillness. This particular cluster in the painting supports the Sanju Hashyo Gogensha, 
the tutelary shrine of Ishiyamadera, which enshrines kami and sovereigns dating from Jimmu to the 38th emperor Tenchi. Mitsunobu's painting depicts the structure in great detail and suggests that the building may, what the building may have looked like before it was refurbished in 1602. Note the architectural elements painted in bright and red green and the red torii gate that connects to a perimeter fence with the same green lattice and white plaster walls, as well as the undulating gable, karahafu, above the entrance. To single out this structure among the buildings at Ishiyamadera for representation is unusual, and it suggests the artist's personal experience of the site as well as the wishes of his patrons, either explicitly stated or assumed. One might even suggest that it participates in a new aesthetic of, of an architectural reality effect, which features so prominently in the extant capital screens. So might we consider Asakura patronage, including the women, as a driving force in shaping this important aesthetic of the Sengoku age? The book covers of the Genji genealogy frame the act of authorship within a nexus of religious and spiritual forces, Buddhist deity and kami worship, and they can be tied to a general auspiciousness as well as imperial sovereignty and the Buddhist powers of the Ishiyamadera Kanon manifested in the form of Murasaki Shikibu. The Genji Keizu thematizes the miraculous quality of Murasaki's authorship and achievement, and no doubt gestures to the lofty aspirations of the patrons who commissioned the work. An artifact like the Genji genealogy, combined with an integrated examination of mainstream warrior history within, with women's history, enables a more holistic view of the period. Furthermore, the networks of women circa 1500 through kinship ties and imagined connections through acts of female authorship reveal a wide range of approaches to wielding influence and exercising autonomous judgment at different stages of life, from impacting the course of history for a major religious institution like Myoshinji to patronizing one of the most important artists of the day who shaped the way people saw the world, elite women circa 1500 played a more expansive role in the production of artifacts and in the larger culture than we currently imagine. Thank you. Is there time for Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. So uh, remember the cabinets that I showed you from the Edo period, those were most likely made as part of a bridal trousseau. Um, and so although we tend to associate those luxurious bridal trousseau with the Tokugawa period and the daimyo marriages that were being authorized by the shogunate in the Tokugawa period, it looks like with this example that's only documented in text form from uh, Sane Taka's diary, that it was a phenomenon that happened before the Edo period. And so I would guess that Sarakage's wife was not just building a library perhaps to stay in-house in Echizen, but it might have been for the occasion of one of the marriages of one of her children. Um, and so I was just recently trying to see like, so who was getting married in 1512, uh, right? Um, to see like, who was she making that cabinet for? It could have been um, her, the heir to the line. It could have been one of her daughters, for example. So there's a good chance that maybe it got out uh, before 1573. There are only two chapters that survive. There's another that was sold in the early 20th century. It's, there's a black and white tiny picture in an auction catalog. But if any of you see any others, I, I have hope that maybe the more will appear. Hi, um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you think that this kind of patronage by women in this family was like exceptional or if it was happening in other families also. Um, and also if you think that um, this kind of patronage might have been gendered as a kind of like household management practice. Um, thank you. Yeah, great questions. Um, 
Uh, so I think one thing that I think women's history scholars are saying more recently is that um, we should probably stop talking about exceptions in a lot of cases that actually what we thought were exceptions because of lack of scholars are just it's normal actually for women to have a fair amount of authority. Um, and so I do think that's the case in late medieval Japan as well, that there's an accepted natural way of accepting women's leadership um, within households. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that we're talking about a feudal society where a lot of times class transcends gender. People know their place, and if your woman is a woman is above you in terms of class, and you accept her leadership and authority, um, and so. I, but I think there's a we should approach it more with a sense of normalcy, um, so that. Uh, and there actually are many, many more examples. So if any of you uh, want to study medieval history, there's so many women to study from the early 1500s uh, that need more work, and especially in English. Um, and so there are many more examples. And then the question about sort of a gender division of labor in terms of the household, I do think that's probably the case. And so it was kind of, um, you know, I kind of wanted to think that she's building a library for everyone to read, and it's for all the male scholars as well. It's not just for a bridal trousseau. But the fact is, is that when you say bridal trousseau, using that kind of English term, Sometimes I say that to people and their eyes glaze over, oh, it's just a wedding, you know? But in fact, it really wasn't necessarily gendered feminine. A bridal trousseau is about the union of two, usually two very powerful families, and it's a household. So it's important to think of women, too, as not individual women and gendered so strongly as being kind of co a collective of the house and sort of household activities then supporting, you know, sort of the power of the domain, the control over the domain and all of that. Um, so it's gendered and, and not. It's definitely something, especially when you think about the tale of Genji written by a woman, you can see why you would want a woman to be in charge of that project as well, because it has a tradition of sort of women's writing attached to it. She was trained by her mother, you know, to go to Ishia Madera and to see this site. So she had a particular kind of area of expertise to bring to this project. So in that way, it's, it's kind of gendered. But then I was happy to see the example of her mother, right, sort of patronizing a Buddhist temple, which, you know, you just associate as being, oh, of course, there's no women on a, in, a, in a temple like that, right? But think again, right? So she was creating the ground on which many of these important temples and ink painting examples um, stand today. So it, I think it's also important to think beyond those gender divisions of labor and patronage and to perhaps see women where you really wouldn't expect to find them. questions okay I think we'll move on thank and thank you, you. Oh, you hung, I'm sorry <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> no no that's okay um, yeah uh, thank you for this uh, wonderful um, discussion um, I have a question about this image uh, cover uh, uh, of the front and uh, back especially the way how the moon is used on this um, book Oops. on cover. Um, Sorry, that's probably the best image. Okay. <laughs> Oops, I'm so, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> so um, I'm wondering, uh, so apparently this uh, the front and the, the back are uh, designed together. Um, and then we also know that uh, the moon, um, the representation of Hmong and the reflection of Hmong in the water often appear simultaneously. So, um, so how do we, sorry, I, I don't know anything about uh, this materials. I'm just wondering uh, this, uh, um, uh, this parallels uh, of uh, this two Hmongs uh, here. Is there any um, other meanings <laughs> or just like a, some like a visual tropes here uh, to pair uh, the image? Yeah. Yes, most definitely. So um, Ishiya Madera was also considered to be Potalaka. And there are some uh, texts that talk about Murasaki Ishikibu as a kanon, sitting on the, perched on the rocks on Potalaka. And so her moment of envisioning the tale of Genji, of starting to write the tale of Genji, is sort of conflated with the kanon, looking at the moon's reflection on the water and having a kind of Buddhist awakening. Um, and there are those who actually theorized this, um, this idea in the 16th century. And so it does have all, all the connotations that you as a scholar of, of Kanon, um, I think, would appreciate. Um, are there any other that you're, others that you're thinking about? Um, I'm just, uh, it's uh, so fascinating to parallel this woman writers uh, in relation to Kanon. <laughs> 
uh, so um, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking about the writing itself. Um, how um, the writing is, um, I mean, I extra almost like an abstract uh, forms of writing visualized on this uh, two images, this kind of parallels. So what does it mean to think about writing here as a, I don't know, form of meditation or, I don't know, yeah. Yes, definitely. And the legend has it that she wrote on the back of a sutra. And so she starts writing what we think of as this very profane tale about, the, about romance and the tale of Genji on the back of a sutra. So they become sort of fused. And there is this kind of moment of non-duality between the sacred and the mundane in, in the legend. So it's quite a beautiful legend in terms of mingling these two ideas. Um, and then interestingly, in terms of the topic of the tale of Genji, she's said to have started writing with the Suma and Akashi chapters. And if you know those chapters in the tale of Genji, there's a moment in them when Genji, the main character, is looking at the moon's reflection on the water. So it's almost as though the author is having a kind of mind meld with her protagonist, Genji. And that sort of moment, that sort of time, completely becomes one. And she becomes her protagonist and envisions the moon in this complete kind of like empathetic, subjective experience, inter, kind of like intersubjective experience. Um, so the legend really accommodates all of these interesting interpretations. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce our final speaker, uh, Professor Emeritus Jean Phillips, Professor Emeritus uh, in Japanese Art History and the former Joan B. Mervis Chair in Japanese Art here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Over his 30-year career, Professor Phillips has been a leading scholar in the area of medieval Japanese art history. His monograph, The Practices of Painting in Japan, 1475 to 1500, published by Stanford University Press, is an essential reference work and a deeply insightful exploration of the complex landscape of painting production in late medieval Japan. Since embarking upon my graduate studies, Professor Phillips' book has been a constant companion on my desk, always close at hand. Little did I know that I would one day have the honor of co-organizing a symposium with Jean. Professor Phillips' scholarly publications have spanned a range of topics, from the historiographical legacy of the famed Kano School to medieval paintings, The Ten Kings of Hell. His research has been recognized by prestigious awards and fellowships from the Japan Foundation, the Metropolitan Center for Far Eastern Art Studies, and the Institute for Research in the Humanities here at UW-Madison, among others. During his time at UW-Madison, Professor Phillips has also co-curated to exhibitions on Japanese art at the Chazen Museum of Art when it was still called the, the Elvia Museum. Throughout his distinguished career, Professor Phillips has also made immense contributions to the field of Japanese art history as a manuscript reviewer and outside reviewer for tenure cases of numerous scholars working in the field today. And at UW-Madison, he has served in a variety of service positions, including two tenures as chair of the art history department. When I attended Professor Phillips, virtual retirement celebration in the spring of 2021. I was also deeply moved by his legacy as a mentor and teacher, beloved to his prior students and others who had the good fortune of receiving his mentorship. Finally, on a more personal note, Professor Phillips's kindness and hospitality when I first arrived in Madison in the early spring of 2022 was the best welcome that anyone could hope for and really predisposed me to loving Madison uh, and this university. Since starting um, in the fall of 2022, Professor Phillips has been a constant source of support, advice, and knowledge for which I am very grateful. It is thus with great pleasure and appreciation that I invite Professor Phillips to the podium.
I'm sorry, hold on just a minute. I think I put the label on the wrong time. I am, however, clever. Okay. Okay, sorry for the delay. <clears throat> uh, when I first proposed to Stephanie uh, the idea of a symposium on Japanese painting around 1500, I had a topic in mind that was quite different from the one I'm speaking on today. I thought I would use the symposium as an opportunity to finally delve into what occurred in the transition between the careers of Kano Masanobu and his son, Motonobu. <clears throat> in 1500, Kano Masanobu was 67 years old, and his son, Motonobu, was 24. <clears throat> that is to say, following the Japanese way of reckoning ages. Extant and datable works by either father or son from this time are extremely rare. Documents tell us that Masanobu produced a portrait of Hino Tomoko, wife of Shogun Ashikaga Yoshimasa, in 1496, but the work is no longer extant. We do have a work by Masanobu um, that was produced in the years just prior to 1500, um, and it's this a uh, painting of Hote uh, that's in a private collection. Um, and later biographies tell us that he lived until 1530 and thus died at the very ripe old age of 97. But no records of his activities in the 16th century are known. Turning to his son, Motonobu, there's a copy of a painting of a falconer um, with a Motonobu seal dated in an inscription by Tennin Yutaku to 1498, when he was 22. The earliest work ascribed to him, some, with some confidence, however, is a portrait of Hosokawa Sumimoto, painted in 1507, when he was 41. After reviewing the scant documentary evidence and the extant works, that were available to support a reconstruction of the transition between the careers of father and son, I realized that the best I could do was present a web of speculation. For this reason, I pivoted to a presentation on Ambagaiji Engi Emaki, also known as Kurumadera Engi Emaki, Motonobu's first recorded work in the narrative hand scroll format. Even though it survives today only in a copy produced about three centuries later. In part, this kind of work is a return to my academic roots. Long ago at Berkeley, I wrote a dissertation titled Kano Motonobu and Early Kano Narrative Painting. 
Narrative painting in this case, meaning the illustrations in, <coughs> in illustrated narrative hand scrolls or emaki. I had two wonderful extant examples to work with. Shakado Engi Emaki, also known as Seidoji Engi Emaki, produced in 1515, and Shuten Doji Emaki, most commonly get dated to 1522. At the time, I felt some sense of unease at not being able to see their predecessor, Anbagaiji Engi Emaki. <clears throat> and by the time a nearly complete copy of the lost Emaki came to my attention through an article by Aizawa Masahiko in 1998, my interests had moved on. So I gave it only passing attention. As is sometimes the way of things, nearing retirement, I suddenly felt a need to circle back and took an opportunity a few years ago to view and photograph the work in its entirety. It was still not until this talk that I finally began to delve into how such a late copy might help us understand how the original work fit into Kano Motonobu's Emaki oeuvre. Today's talk will begin with an introduction to the hand scroll and the copy, follow with a discussion of how it relates to Motonobu's extant hand scroll paintings, and conclude with whatever insights I might offer. Before I proceed further, let me say that I will largely be speaking as if Motonobu and other painters were sole actors in painting projects. This is simply a matter of convenience for this talk. Undoubtedly, clients and their advisors, along with assistants, all also played roles. Here is the first picture segment of the first scroll of Anbagaiji Engi Emaki, with a larger detail of its first scene. As was fairly common in such works, this one as a whole consisted of three hand scrolls with each scroll containing alternate sections of text and picture of varying lengths. Although the copy you see makes it hard to believe, Motum Nobu almost certainly painted it in rich pigments, including malachite, azurite, and perhaps even some gold, as you saw in the previous Emaki. One reason to believe this is that he undertook this deluxe Emaki project at the behest of Hosokawa Takakuni, one of the great lords of the early 16th century, who was among those who were contending for control of the capital, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, and as a consequence for a supreme authority in the country. The Emaki was dedicated in the sixth month of 1513 after Takakuni had come through a period of intense warfare with his rivals and gained ascendancy. Aizawa speculates that Takakuni's dedication was in repayment for his victory or as a prayer for protection uh, of the army. One of the two main deities worshipped at Kuramadera at the time was Bishamonten an image from the Emaki of whom you see here. Bishamonten was revered among, for among other reasons as the guardian of the north and the protector of armies. Since Kuramadera lay almost directly to the north of the imperial palace, the temple's particular Bishamonten had received special veneration from old times as protector of the northern part of the capital. Donation of an Engi Emaki by the powerful was not uncommon during the time of struggles that began in the last third of the 15th century and continued throughout much of the 16th. This commission had some special features, however. The copied colophon states that the, that the Bishamonten of the temple himself delivered an oracle to Takakuni through cleromancy, that is, the drawing of lots, commanding him to produce the emaki. As is typical of Engi Emaki, the main body of the work relates to the story of the founding of the temple and miracles associated with it. 
it is possible that Motonobu's work it's, was itself produced as a replacement for an early original that had been lost to fire or some other misfortune. One might ask why Takakuni chose Motonobu rather than a painter of the Tosa school or another lineage more strongly associated with emaki painting like a painter from the Tosa school. A partial answer is that by 1513, Motonobu was a go-to painter for Japan's warlords, other than the Asakura, and especially for those of the extended Hosokawa family, even when they were enemies. As already noted, he had painted the portrait of Hosokawa Sumimoto in 1507. At that time, Sumimoto and Takakuni were allied, but a year later, in the fourth month of 1508, Takakuni had driven Sumimoto out of Kyoto, but the latter remained a threat well into 1511. 1513, when the emaki was painted, was also, of course, the year that he probably painted the famous wall and sliding door paintings at the Daisen Inn, but we don't know any details about its uh, patronage. All that being said, surely Takakuni and his advisors on such matters must have had reasons for confidence in Motonobu's ability to execute such a commission. The simplest but only scantily documented answer is that Motonobu had learned much about the painting of Emaki from Tosa Mitsunobu about whom Melissa has spoken um, and others of Moton uh, Mitsunobu's circle. One tantalizing bit of evidence is a list of Yamatoe painters in the Nara area in Jinson Daiso Joki, dated to the 12th month of 1477. Including in the list are Tosa Mitsunobu and another painter he refers to simply as Kano, and notes that he is a Tosa disciple. Masanobu is a possible candidate but he had established himself as an independent painter in the capital by 1463. Still, the upheavals of the Onin Civil War, as you've already heard about, could have driven him to flee the capital and work under the aegis of a Tosa painter. Motonobu was born around this time, and Masanobu was back at work for the shogun in the capital by 1483. When, his, when Motonobu was about seven years old. It is only later evidence then of a possible closeness between Motonobu and Mitsunobu's son that lends a bit of weight to the idea that Motonobu's relationship with the Tosa remained close enough that he learned from them. However, there are different ways to interpret the evidence so I will put aside further talk on the exact nature of the relationship and move on to the focus of today's talk. As we take a closer look at Ambagaiji Angi Emaki through its copy, please note that I've used Photoshop to intensify the colors on the details since that gives at least a little more sense of what the original was like. I didn't do that on uh, the part above. Today the work is kept in the Yamaguchi Prefectural Archives as one of the emaki in the Kiyosue Mori family document collection. Like all of the emaki in this collection, it has been remounted in an accordion folded book form, but was certainly originally three hand scrolls as was Motonobu's original. Please note as you look at my uh, slides, uh, which are made from photographs I took myself. Uh, you will see various vertical lines, uh, and these lines may be caused by folds um, in the accordion book, or paper joins, or by my own clumsy attempts to um, stick things together in Photoshop to make a more panoramic scene. No inscription relating to the circumstances of the making of the copy exists, and it's only dated to the mid to late Edo period by style. The narrative content of the first scroll of the Emaki 
tells of the two stages of the founding of Kurumadera, and the second and third relate miracles associated with it. I will present the first scroll in some detail. The first segment, which is still on the screen, tells of the establishment of a proto-temple by Gante, who was a disciple of the famous Ganjin. He was at Tosho Daiji in Nara and had a dream about a spiritual place on a high mountain in the north. Upon awakening, he went in search <clears throat> of that place. While sleeping outdoors along the way, he saw a light along with purple clouds in the north. The next day, he pushed on to sacred mountains. While he was sleeping again, he saw a high monk in a dream and was told that the next day when he set out, an auspicious event would occur in the sky to the east. The first scene of the next picture segment begins with an extended view of the activity at the gate of Tosho Daiji. I'm sorry, the first scene of that first picture segment, which you see here, uh, begins with an extended view of the activity at the gate at Tosho Daiji and ends with a view of Ganjin and Gante inside an architectural setting. The former is reading from an open sutra scroll and the latter is sleeping and dreaming. The second scene shows us Gante crossing over a bridge on his way to find the sacred place. In the third, Gante is sleeping outdoors with a light to the left. And almost directly below it, near the bottom, we see Gante again advancing into the mountains, a motif that could be said to belong to the next and last scene as well. In the last scene, we see Gante entering the mountains um, the next day and the monk speaking to him in a dream. The final figure of the sleeping Gante almost merges with the curved trunk of the pine tree on which he rests, which you can just barely see. Sadly, the second segment contains one of the losses to the copy. The text tells us that the next day, there was a strange light coming from the peaks with a white spiritual horse riding on a purple cloud. It bore a saddle made of treasures that resembled a lid. Gante proceeded to the location of the horse, which abruptly disappeared. That night, an oni appeared and attacked Gante. He fled into the hollow of a dead tree in the North Valley. He concentrated on thinking of the three jewels of Buddhism and a dead tree fell on the Oni and killed it. In the morning, the Bishamonten image that trampled the Oni appeared. To repay this, Gante built a grass hut and lived there for over 40 years, worshiping the image. The depictions of the white horse and the appearance of the Oni are lost. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but just after the gap, we see the surviving half of the figure of Gante in flight, followed by a double scene of Gante hiding in the hollow tree and the Oni being smashed by a fallen <coughs> tree. And just to the left, Gante reverencing Bushamonten, or an image of him, who we see trampling on an Oni. Finally, in the last scene, we see Gante twice in the grass hut he has built, once praying to the image of Bishamonten he installed, and just to the left, sitting in the next room. Segment three and beyond relate the story of the more formal founding of the temple. Some years later, in 796, the nobleman Fujiwara Isendo wanted to find a fitting spot to enshrine an image of the Bodhisattva Kannon. 
In a dream, he travels to, the, to a rugged peak in the north of the Imperial Palace, where the owner god <coughs> of the sacred place, in the guise of a white-haired old man, tells him to build a temple there. Isendo headed into the mountains, where he turned loose his white horse, planning to erect a building where it stopped. There, Isendo found a grass hut with a statue of Bishamonten enshrined in it. In the first scene, we see Isendo riding, on a, riding a white horse uh, along with three attendants. The second scene, the second double scene shows Isendo listening to the deity and to the left, releasing the horse. Uh, so you have a melding here of uh, the event uh, in the wild and also the content of his dreaming. The, <coughs> excuse me. Two scenes in quick succession follow. One of Isendo passing into the mountains, presumably following the horse, and Isendo reverencing the image of Bishamonten after finding the grass hut. The last segment contains only one scene, since much of the text is non-narrative and one scene is lost. Isindo was uneasy because Kannon, to whom he had prayed and made a vow, was different from Bishamonten. But a heavenly youth told him that Kannon and Bishamonten were the same in their true selves. And with this, Isindo built, rebuilt the grass hut into a proper temple and had a 42 armed Kannon image installed beside the Bishamonten image. Um, a bit more. Uh, is said about the continued support of the temple by Isendo's uh, descendants. The depiction of Isendo receiving the message from the divine child is lost, so we only see him giving reverence to the image of Bishamonten with that of the Kannon on the left. Now the question of how faithfully this copy conveys Motonobu's original. In what follows, I am indebted to Aizawa's analysis, but also have some reservations about it. To begin, what does the copy as an object tell us? Is there anything to suggest that it is based on a tracing, for example? The paper that serves as the actual support of the painting is certainly thin enough that it would have allowed for an original beneath it to have been traced. However, as Aizawa notes, such a tracing would have functioned as an underdrawing, and some of its fine lines would be visible here and there on close examination. Neither he nor I much later could detect any in the copy, so the possibility of direct, direct tracing is unlikely. Comparisons with Ms. Mos Comparisons with Motonobu's other emaki thus becomes critical. Aizawa begins his comparative analysis with the text, noting that aspects of certain characters closely resemble those of the shoven in style around the time of Motonobu. Unlike Melissa, I have no expertise in this, but uh, for those who might, I am showing you here a segment of the Ambagaiji uh, Engi Emaki copy text, the original of which was brushed by Shoden in Sono, and another of scroll three of Shuten Doji Emaki, brushed by Shoden in Sonchin. Aizawa also points out that the distribution of characters is dense, with about 15 per line something often seen in Muromachi hand scrolls. All those give at least some support to the likelihood that there was an intention to produce a copy of Motonobu's original that was, at least in some important ways, faithful. 
Aizawa next turns to the paintings, where Motonobu's works feature strong, modulated brush lines, rich colors in gold paint. The Morty copy instead has lines that are generally loose, pale, and wide, and only light colors. <coughs> Where Motonobu's faces and garments are painted in considerable detail, the copy features eyes that are only dots and clothing that is simpler and lacks much in the way of designs. The comparison on the screen that I've made exaggerates those differences since the scale of the figures in Shuten Doji Emaki um, is much greater than in the copy. But Aizawa's observation generally holds up. All of these differences, including the thinness of the paper and the lack of rich pigments, can readily be explained if we conclude that the Modi copy was something of a low-budget project. In that case, one must believe that the priorities of the project lay in the underlying structure of the work. The copyist approach to motif formation and uh, composition suggests that th this is true. Aizawa points to several motifs and their features that are consistent with those seen in Motonobu's ex extant hand scrolls. These including the forms of trees and the lichen dots, which you can perhaps see in this comparison. But there are also um, architectural elements and the basic forms, poses, and garment types of the human figures. I won't take the time to repeat Aizawa's detailed comparisons here, since my main interest is in matters of competition, composition, but I found them convincing. Aizawa also notes the compositional affinities of the Mordi copy and the extant Emaki. And in particular, he emphasized the presence of what he calls the distinctive Motonobu diagonal composition. We can see examples of these in the final scenes of the first and third segments of scroll one of the copy, um, the latter of which you see here, along with a famous scene from Shakudo Engi Emaki by uh, Motonobu. Such compositions are typically understood as a reflection of Motonobu's training in painting eek lens landscapes in the Song Yuan Ming academic style. We can see strong diagona diagonality um, in his famous painting at the Daisen Yin, and no one would argue that Motonobu's whole earth does not feature a great many diagonal compositions. However, he is far from the only painter producing them, and strongly diagonal compositions are actually rare in Shakudo Engi Emaki, and I would argue, in any significant sense, absent completely from Shuten Doji Emaki. Nonetheless, I would like to proceed under the tentative assumption that the copy does, in fact, preserve at least the underlying structure of Motonobu's original. Otherwise, what is the point of producing a new copy at all? Copying structure and the basic forms of motifs was surely much less challenging than copying brushwork and less laborious than copying details of clothing. At the same time, however, <coughs> the choices made suggest how much value was placed on underlying structure and composition, whether the focus is on the emaki as a religious document or as a specimen of Motonobu's work. On the matter of diagonal compositions, I will have more to say. In any event, for my purposes, assuming the closeness and the of the composition allows me to delve into that which has always been my main focus in the study of Motonobu's emaki, which is narrative structure. If you will indulge me, I need to look back for a moment uh, to my dissertation from so long ago. In the second half, I was particularly concerned with elements of composition that articulated the narrative flow within picture segments. 
As you have seen in the first scroll of the Morty copy, the segments in Motonobu's hand scrolls vary greatly in length and may be depict only one, or one scene or uh, might have multiple events or scenes. Coming to this, coming to an understanding of the principles guiding Motonobu's articulations of transitions between scenes helped me to better situate his work in the history of Japanese narrative hand scroll painting. In situating Motonobu's work, I took inspiration and guidance from Murashige Yasushi, whose 1979 article um, in Museum presented a compelling argument that much of the style of both Kano Emaki and screen and wall paintings derive from Motonobu's study of earlier medieval Emaki rather than the works of his older contemporary Tosa Mitsunobu. To very briefly summarize key elements um, of Murashige's conclusions, he saw Motonobu's hand scroll painting style as closer to that associated with Takashina Takakane, who was active in the 14th century, than to that of his older contemporary Tosa Mitsunobu. In Genjo Sanzoe, which is associated with Takakane, the depictions of landscapes show rough brush lines in the strokes of the mountains and rocks as well as the careful application of rich pigments, including azurite, malachite, and gold, though not to the degree that Motonobu used. Uh, and, in, and they put this into the representation of landscape. The result was a new level of decorativeness in landscape painting. Murashige argues that many of the differences between the hand scroll paintings of Motonobu and Misunobu can be explained by the former reaching back to the Takakane related and even earlier works in his search for models in creating his own distinctive style. In Murashige's view, with which I concur, the works that inspired Motonobu would have been seen by him as representing orthodoxy in narrative hand scroll painting, just as the styles of those Chinese ink paintings uh, from which he drew inspiration did. In contrast, the work of Tosa Mitsunobu reflected a more contemporary, looser style that the Tosa painters developed in the years before 1500. And this is not a value judgment. Uh, it's just a, a, a difference in style. Looking back to earlier models that held a certain authority was a way for Motonobu to place himself as both different and authentic as he shaped the elements of a Kano style for new circumstances of patronage. While Murashige's, Murashige's focus was on decorative effects of ink and color application, mine was on matters of narrative composition and structure. After careful study of the hand scrolls to which Motonobu gave most attention, it seemed clear to me that Motonobu looked to these earlier orthodox, so-called orthodox, works for these aspects of his hand scroll paintings as well. I apologize from the photographed book illustrations, but I was in something of a hurry. Um, in Genjo Sanzoe, as in earlier works, such as Tose Eden of 1298, which Murashige suggests might have been considered orthodox by Takakane himself uh, and inspired him, one of the most common pictorial units is an asymmetrical three-sheet composition. Such segments feature compositions in which one scene or double scene in one setting occupies roughly two sheets, and another one or even two scenes occupy the remainder. For example, the fourth segment of the first scroll of Tose Eden shows the departure of Japanese monks going to China to find an ordination master and their search at many temples for one. The first and most of the second sheet are taken up by the scene of departure. The remainder of the paper contains a scene of the Japanese monks at a Chinese temple and finally a very cramped view of the monks continuing their search by traveling through the mountains. 
In a picture segment from Genjo Sanzoe, we see at the beginning Xuanzang and his two disciples at a gate being given directions by the viceroy of Guangzhou. Following this is a towering geological form that appears right at the join between the first and the second sheets of paper. Beyond it is a double scene of Xuanzang's disciples turning back one after another because of the harshness of the trip they are taking through the desert. The actions of the two are divided with one an from one another only by a stand of sparsely, sparsely growing trees atop a low hillock. Again, there is an asymmetry in this three-sheet composition. The first sheet is more decisively separated and bears a scene of preparing to set out. The two-sheet landscape setting with its two scenes that follows is continuous despite the stand of trees in the hillock. There is continuity not only in the landscape but also in the narrative in that it focuses on Xuanzang being abandoned by his disciples. The painters of both Emaki executed their asymmetric compositions on whole sheets, not sharing them with the text. I would argue that Multinobu adopted this asymmetrical approach, but often in a more compact way. His picture segments sometimes taking up only two sheets. For example, the first segment of the fifth scroll of his Shakado Engi Emaki contains in the upper right corner a tiny view of a ship and on the remainder of the paper an expansive setting for both the ship again and a temple. It is a double scene of the Japanese monks landing and the same monks having an audience in the temple. Thus, Motonobu's composition shows a variation on the sort of asymmetrical structure seen in the earlier two works just discussed. Underlying the asymmetrical compositions in the two earlier emaki is a conceptual scheme as well as a narrative one. The scene of departure or arrival is compact, while that of travel is expansive. From the example given here, it is not clear that Motonobu absorbed this rationale, but other painting segments suggest that he did and even went beyond it. Before looking at Shakado Engi Emaki again to talk about this, we need to take a look at the use of mists in clouds, um, those very artificial looking forms um, in the earlier scrolls. Although they are now faded, a bit of manipulation in Photoshop allows us to see that in the Tose Eden segment, the clouds at the top and the mists at the bottom nearly meet in the middle between the ship and the first structure visible to the left. The forms of these clouds and mists are also highly simplified with their rounded ends and thus stand out as a partitioning device. However, the painter used such a device quite sparingly. The same can be said of Takakane in Genjo Sanzoe, and his clouds and mists had less blatantly stylized forms as we see in the detail from a different segment. When we come to Motonobu, the use of such forms as partitioning devices is dramatic and regular. The third scroll of Shakado Engi Emaki offers a good example. The first segment of painting stretches over about seven and two thirds sheets. The fraction comes at the beginning and shares its sheet with the end of the initial passage of text. Obviously, Motonobu did not adhere to sheet integrity as uh, we saw in the earlier works. It holds only additional landscape and serves as a gentle transition from text to picture, which shows the temporary departure of the Buddha and its effect. The next sheet continues the hilly landscape but in the upper right, clouds part to reveal a heavenly palace. Coming from the left, mounted on a cloud, trailing vapor is the Buddha ascending. To the left, the subjects of King Udayama wail in anguish 
at the loss of the presence of the Buddha. In between, the clouds at the top descend somewhat, while those at the bottom rise ever so slightly. A slight narrowing occurs, but the very end of the Buddha's cloud trail runs through it, so there is little interruption. The next scene to the left depicts the circumstances in which king, the king, seeking to soothe his mourning subjects, summons carvers to create an uh, image of the Buddha. Preceding it is what <clears throat> I call in my dissertation a pause that spans most of one sheet. It is a narrative pause because the gap between the upper and lower row of clouds or mists narrows very considerably but does not disappear. It is like a comma in a sentence. Architectural elements visible in the gap serve to link as well as to help set boundaries. Just after the pause as a double is a double scene. To the right, members of what is presumably an atelier of woodcarvers or sculptors kneel before two officials. To the left, the master carver kneels before the king while the same officials stand to one side. No rupturing device interferes, intervenes between these two scenes, and the architectural setting is continuous. Since each scene takes place in an architecturally distinctive area, and the progress is in the normal right-to-left direction, I tend to consider it simply a double scene, as I've done before, though it could be argued that it is an example of E.G. Dozu, um, different times in the same picture. There follows what I have called a break because a bank of clouds and mists reaches unbroken from top to bottom. If we think of the painting segment as like a paragraph, this is analogous to a period. Next comes another double scene, this time on a bit less than two sheets. The king is twice depicted, once bearing on his own back the block to be carved and then <clears throat> to the left watching the actual carving. On the final sheet of the segment, there's another pause created by clouds and small trees, which is followed by a small fourth scene in which the king and his followers worship the image now installed in a curtain alcove. A new segment of text closes this first sequence of scenes. One might say that this sequence is like a brief synoptic pa paragraph composed of two sentences. The people wailed at the leaving of the Buddha. Pause. So the ruler summoned carvers and commissioned them to create an image of the Buddha. Break. The ruler himself brought in the block and the carvers carved it. Pause. After which the ruler prayed to it. Break. Each sentence represents a cause and a result. The first begins the emergence of a problem and follows with the initiation of a solution. The second sentence begins with an action and then represents the results of that action. The second sentence as a whole fulfills the promise of the first. The last sentence <clears throat> as a whole fulfills, I'm sorry, the last scene in the entire segment solves the problem created by the very first. This analysis, while certainly not offered as a perfect revelation of intention, does suggest that the narrative composition of the painting corresponded to the core story of the text with considerable precision. There is a conceptual component to the decisions Motonobu or his advisors made. I would argue that Modenobu gained his understanding of conceptual composition from the medieval hand scroll paintings, such as the ones we have been looking at, although not necessarily directly, but that his compositions went even further in that direction. An unsympathetic art historian or critic might describe Modenobu's approach to narrative structure in Shakado Engi Emaki as methodical. He, in, he tended to compose in shorter picture segments and to further articulate these internally, very deliberately, through the use of clouds, architectural motifs, and bits of landscape, thereby favoring tight structures over fluid compositions. 
One might ask how representative of Motonobu's works approach to pictorial narrative structure, Shakado Engi Emaki really is. To begin to answer that, I will turn back finally to Ambagaiji Engi Emaki. A comparison of these two segments requires a fairly extreme act of visualization. In mentally transposing the rich, vibrant colors of the Shakado original onto the Ambagaiji copy, but it's worth the effort, I think. As indicated by the arrows, there is a similar but not at all identical use of banks of clouds and mists as partitioning elements. In both cases, a fairly long scene begins the segment, and three shorter scenes with transitions articulated by breaks of clouds and mists follow. On the other hand, while the second bank in the Shakado picture is unbroken, none of those in the Anbagaiji picture are, nor do they articulate so strong a break in the narrative. One reason for this is that the underlying structure and character of the narrative is quite different. It features three dream scenes connected by images of actual travel. Thus, we see Gante sleeping three times and walking only twice. Another is the setting. After the first scene, everything takes place in what I'm going to loosely call the wild, so to speak. The clouds and mists then feel slightly less artificial. The third cloud bank even seems to recede into depth. Looking at parts of the two segments once again in greater detail, a strong sense of difference in the use of clouds and mists remains, no matter how successful we are in visualizing a more richly colored original of the Anbagaiji Engi Emaki. In the earlier work, there was not so great an effect of methodical partitioning. I would argue that this, I would argue that this difference stems not from changes in Motonobu's approach to narrative painting that occurred in the mere two years that lie between the two projects, but rather from their subject matter. Setting aside the first two scrolls relating to the life of the Buddha in Shakado Engi Emaki, the great majority of the settings, though not all, are details of palace architecture, where the clouds and mists feel more removed from any relationship to nature. At the same time, the settings belong to other realms and to sacred history. A certain degree of artificiality is to be expected. Even in the case of Shuten Doji Emaki, the artificiality of the clouds is striking. In this segment featuring scenes at three famous shrines, each view is from a different perspectival di distance, so there can be no sense of continuity, and the clouds function more as artificial partitions. Thus, while the settings are ostensibly located in Japan, the notion that the places visited by the warriors are either extremely sacred sites or parts of another realm in which demons hold sway elsewhere in the Emaki uh, is central to the tale. In other words, most of the set settings belong to realms of otherness, and their otherness is highlighted by the artificial framing of the clouds. In contrast, for all its sacred theme themes, the story of Ambagaiji Engi Emaki occurs in a place of becoming, where the natural world and the sacred coexist, and the discovery and even the production of the sacred in the wild is a core element and locality is also obviously a very important factor. Thus, I would argue that Ambagaiji Engi Emaki, however imperfectly it is preserved, allows us to see Motonobu's sensitivity to the particulars of the narrative content as he designed his compositions. And rather than a conclusion, what I have is a question that I don't feel I can yet answer. How does this strong preference for clarity and order in his Emaki painting relate to Motonobu's work in other formats, especially the expansive sliding door and wall painting 
compositions <coughs> that served as decorations for entire or nearly entire rooms. And how do such paintings speak to their patrons in times of great disorder? Also, was part of the appeal of Motonobu as a painter, not only his connections through his father to the revered art of the culture of the time of the eighth Ashikaga Shogun Yoshimasa, but also to his evocation of legibility and order. Thank you. Questions for Professor Phillips. I'm a Western European interloper, so we'll start my question that way. But I, I have, I, I love the talk, Jean, and its clarity, and you were talking about narrative structure. And as a Western European medievalist, it makes me think, first of all, about memory structures. And I wondered whether in the Japanese context there is room for thinking about locational memory uh, as, as a technique, and, and whether the way you've described it, these partitions between different episodes or different moments of the same narrative has anything to do with that. And a related question is, is there a performative quality to, to this? Um, is there a, a way, and again, this is out of ignorance that I ask this, is there a way in which these uh, narrative scrolls are being accompanied by an oral performance of the, of the text. These are ways of enlivening these, these moments of text in an oral delivery, or at least even a recitation among a group of people. Yeah, there are many different kinds of emaki that are treated in different ways. We certainly have evidence that uh, emaki might be read and in some case even performed, somebody with a pointer. Um, so that's certainly a possibility. Many, many of the emaki, though, spent almost their entire lives in storage. It, it was the gift that mattered, and, and uh, they weren't actually very often seen. Uh, but yes, there, there is very often a performative quality. Um, and as to this idea of, um, you know, it, if I think about Genji painting, n not necessarily in the hand scroll format, or Buddhist painting, this idea of, you know, like any sacred painting of having a, a framing, of setting it into a different space, a, a more sacred space, um, and uh, something uh, to be revered um, is in a sense to be separated. But this. I'd have to think a lot more about this question of memory. Uh, and it, probably rather than memory, I might think more of visions. Because, you know, the, the Ambagaji Enge Emaki is replete with people sleeping and having visions. And the purported whole reason it was made was uh, drawing lots and, and the being told that you had to do it. So um, I, I think. I think that's a part of it. More than, I, I have to think about the memory part, but I would think more about vision. Visions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jean, thank you for a wonderful talk. I, I um, visually, uh, I, I, it's so striking how different the emaki is, the shiten doji, as you pointed out, from ambagai. And I wanted to ask, um, if there's a possibility looking at Shiten Doji Emaki here that uh, it is somehow influenced by another genre that we know Motonobu gleaned from the Tosa, and maybe Melissa has something to say about this too, but that of Dakuchu Dakugaizu, because uh, that emerges in 1506, and we know that Motonobu is eventually involved in its production and the logic there is composite with these aerial views of small scenes and when you uh, look at Shiten Doji here it's striking how much it looks like a composite of different 
uh, places being uh, stitched together with uh, clouds in relation to the early Ambagaiji, which as you say is more kind of um, unfolding. And so I just wondered if that was completely off base or if you have any thoughts about this. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, I've always tended to look at that, um, and maybe I'm old fashioned in this, that in the Rakuchi Rakugaisu, that use of clouds was, uh, sorry, her name is just not coming to my head. Uh, she was the Japanese art historian at Yale long ago. Excuse me? Wheelwright, Carolyn Wheelwright. Carolyn Wheelwright, who talked about mandalas of Miyako and, and the fact that it's more like, it's a sacralizing element um, of making it more lustrous and special and so forth. So I think they're both drawing, I mean, in both cases, I don't think it's drawing so much from Rakuchi Rakugaisu as both are drawing from Buddhist paintings, but maybe even Zenji paintings, which had been sort of turned into the sacred, I mean, had become the sacred. Would you agree they've already yeah. become the sacred? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, as we all know, that boundary between the sacred and the sexual, are, it kind of needs emphasizing sometimes because in Japan it's so fluid. Yes. Anybody else? Okay, great. <laughs> I'm tired. Thank you for your questions. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, we're going to have a little short break while we set up for our panel discussion. Uh, we have a table and chairs to move in, things like that. So if, if anybody knows to Take a quick break. Now's the time to do it. What? Right now? Okay. Good. It's perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Mr. Dale. Yeah, that, it was a little bit funny to go all the way back to my dissertation, but. Always time to think. Yeah. Well, I'm turning the Ambagaiji material over to Melissa. <laughs> what? It, it's, it's very nice. It's, it's kind of sad with all the wormholes, but it's nice. Oh, yeah. I really like it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean the copyist, I think he just wasn't given much money to work with, but he did a really good job. You know, he couldn't make it luxurious. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, well, you know, there are those spectacular copies, but they're meant to be like an engi, of an engie maki to go to a branch temple, which are different, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm glad you like it because I'll, I'll send you. I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I think, for the Ten Kings of Hell, I put them on my Google Drive and just gave you a link. Yeah. yeah. No, I, it's well worth somebody's study. Even if not you, one of your students might be interested.
Yuki, why don't you go on the far end? Switch with uh, Yuki. Yukio? Sw go on the far end. Stay left side. Um, just because you're so tall. So the first one was for you, Keel. Do you think the artist has fudged the tone of the snow and rock in uh, Huika offering his arm to Bodhidharma to make the form of Bodhidharma the whitest and most empty? Uh, the, the term fudged, I, I like the use <laughs> of the technical term fudged here. Uh, but but uh, y yes, I, well, I think the, the, the whiteness of Bodhidharma is certainly emphasized. Um, and the ground is interesting because uh, if you don't know that it's a snow scene, maybe um, you might one might not notice it, but it it's definitely should be a snow scene. And uh, so, so the whiteness there, you might say, is both, um, it's a bit lessened in relation to Bodhidharma, but it still has to be there. And, it and it's also somewhere between snow, snow and uh, just aura. but it is a kind of long question regarding the implications of the rep for the reputation of this kind of painting, presumably um, the landscape hand scroll paintings, as a kind of stylistic archive as it features many disparate techniques. Do you think that this mix of techniques is at odds with a singular reading for the painting? Um, I think it is appropriate to think of especially hand scroll paintings as a kind of pictorial archive, and that's often, I think, how Professor Levitt has referred um, to, especially the long landscape as a kind of pictorial archive of Sessu's techniques. Um, stylistically, though, it is, I think, fairly um, unified. It doesn't, for example, feature splash ink or uh, other styles of landscape. So although there are, there's a range of techniques, um, I think they all kind of fall under what we would probably consider the kind of kakeyo, right, or the kake style um, practiced by painters, uh, and, and kake referring to the southern Song Court painter Xiaogui. Um, so I don't think that that is necessarily problematic in terms of reading the meaning of the painting. 
Does the idea of the grotto heaven provide an alternative explanation for this mix of particular painting styles? Um, yeah, I guess I, I would say that um, I don't see it as really embodying different styles per se. It certainly embodies a lot of different types of motifs. And um, I think the microphone just went out. Yeah, so I would say that stylistically, uh, the long landscape, uh, I wouldn't say is, is too varied uh, an amalgamation of styles. So um, in terms of the relationship of the style to the grotto imagery, we do see, as Professor Schmal showed in his talk and also Professor Lippitt, that there, is, there does tend to be um, more grotto-type imagery in paintings that are associated with Xiaogui or with the Southern Song court painters. So stylistically, there is that kind of association between um, the Southern Song court painters a and the grotto. But um, I'd like us to uh, open up our panel now to some broader themes. Did you want to, this, I don't know if this is working either. The house speakers just turned off. We can hear you in the stream still, but the, the house system just shut off. Oh, okay. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, I'll just. If you don't, move on up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the questions that we had thought to address was this question of artistic geography and sort of the importance in thinking about region um, when considering painting at this, at this period in history. So that, that's sort of the first maybe broad theme that I would present to the speakers because um, we have looked at different regions of Japan in considering these different genres, different subject matters. Maybe Shimao-sensei Shimao. would like to say a few words about regionality and... Okay, um... Nihongo demo ii desu. Nihongo demo ii desu. Yeah. I skipped the, you know, matter of part of co conclusion. So what I wanted to say is that that kind of thing. Mm. The, I mentioned many uh, painters with biography. That it's probably the various region, and that situation happens after Onin the Onin the Onin War. The before Onin War, the powerful daimyos are basically lived in Kyoto, and they, and so economies in their territories, and culture and politics in Kyoto. And but after the Oni War, so they, most of them, got back to their territories, and because they, you know, the both of the you, that region is in Kyoto for ten years with the military, so the territories, countries uh, became very unstable, and so they have to reconstruct the system there. And so they all get back, get back to their territories. So then they have to enjoy the culture of things, even the culture in his territories. So of course they need uh, some, for instance, uh, I introduced a Sogi, Arengashi. He invited Sogi from Kyoto. And uh, they need painters in his territories. So that, you know, the number of painters increased through that time. But of course, uh, artists didn't emerge overnight. So probably it took uh, 25 or 30 years until around 1500. And that is the, uh, you know, the why these painters appeared in the many places. And, 
And of course, the situation is uh, different depending on the place. For instance, Yamaguchi, the, it's a, you know, it's a hub of the trade with uh, China. And uh, by accident, or <laughs> accident, I don't know, but uh, say she was there. So it was, uh, it became a center of, uh, one center of the, the world of painting. And uh, Kamakura, the Shoke lived, was like that. And then Ichijodani, Asakura was like that. And uh, Tohaku's homeland, the Noto was like that. So and the situation is very different from each other. So, but uh, what I wanted to say is that, you know, basically the, uh, the you know, research is concentrated to Kyoto and then moved to Azuchi Momoyama. And, but the Azuchi Momoyama is a very regional <laughs> phenomenon. Almost Kyoto, around the Kyoto area, Kyoto, Osaka, mm -hmm. Nara, and Shiga, or that kind. So the Kanto is still Muromachi. <laughs> 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 so it's continued. The, there is a continuous situation in many regions. So the post oni no wa, oni war, post oni war is a, you know, the age of dispersed. So then it looks like concentrate to Kyoto in Momoyama period. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I took so much time, but. Mm. Yeah. I think one other thing that's I think interesting is the accumulation of wealth after the oni war, so you mentioned Ochi gaining wealth from foreign trade. With the Asakura, it's interesting because it's still a very much agriculturally based mm -hmm. situation where actually people in the capital have estates in Echizen and they need the Asakura warriors to get their taxes for them. And so that's one of the reasons they become so incredibly rich and then can buy their way into you know, commissioning all of these works and having house painters and house performers mm -hmm. and so forth. But it'll be interesting also to compare pre-owning wealth versus post-owning wealth in the provinces. Oh yeah, right. And uh, it depends on the, you know, daimyo, the full rules the division. Yeah. Asakura is a very, you know, powerful daimyo before owning world mm -hmm. already, mm -hmm. and also Hatakeyama and, uh, <laughs> you know, Ouchi is a m major start for the show, Ashikawa Shonen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is another area, for instance, uh, Kanto, uh, the after Kyoto Kunoran, I mentioned, again, the Uesugi clan divided in two and started war. <laughs> And so it's very fast to get into the, you know, Sengoku situation. So, I have a, you know, thinking about these people, like Motonobu, and before him, Sogi and others, and then later, people like San Norikyu, they could just move about, oh. even though, you know, they're going to the enemies different enemy groups, um, that sort of, were they just kind of treated as national treasures and, and you, 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 you sort of, uh, you didn't care if they had just been a week ago at your enemy's mm -hmm. home base, you just wanted their, is that accurate or not? Yeah, and basically, uh, for instance, uh, Sogi or Sishu, they are sort of monks. So they are out of the oh, social yeah. system. But, uh, but, but I wonder that uh, Motonobu Kano was uh, okay because of their merchant, or uh, <laughs> like a merchant, or right. they I'm not sure. N not the monk. Right. But yeah, yeah. And so sometimes if you wanted to move about, you shaved your head. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, and became Yeah, a so the yeah. Saigyo wanted to be, uh, <laughs> you know, Kajin. Yeah. Yeah. So then, 
he got out of Rome and stick here a while. So. Mm. Uh, go ahead. No, no. Well, with me, this is actually a question uh, for Eugene and the other panelists is um, with artistic geography. It's so interesting because all of the talks seem to um, actually engage the idea of a, of a matrix of connections that artists and patrons uh, seem to internalize after the owning war in particular. The networks of, of figures involved in any cultural production is always important, but after the owning war, it becomes even more uh, important. So there's Kenko Shoke, who uh, kind of absorbs the Ashikaga collection and its models and brings it back to Kanto. Um, in Asakura, there's the relationship with Sanjo Onishi Sanetaka and other courtiers. Uh, Motonobu is somehow getting access to early emaki from the Kamakura and possibly studying those. Then there's the China matrix, the, the China connections that Stephanie talks about. And um, one way of thinking about that is that it disperses the importance of artistic collections and centers. But another way of thinking about it is it actually makes it more, even more important uh, because Kyoto is very important through Sanjo Nishi Sanetaka. Um, the archives of Kyoto and Nara are important for Motonobu. Uh, Shagwe and the Ashikaga collection, or its memory, is important for Seshu and Geai. And um, in Kanto, uh, Geami, through Shoke and Geami, the Ashikaga collection, um, its influence can be said to thin out, but another way of thinking about it is it's all the more important uh, that, that um, the actual pictorial style is that of Kenko Shoke in Kesong, but what Kesong thinks he's doing is perpetuating the most, the, the important models of East Asia in, in landscape. So there's also a way in which the, the prestigious collections of, of Kyoto are that much more important in the 16th century. Maybe that's a contrarian view, but does anybody? I mean, for example, the Asakura famously were recipients of a copy of the Kundai Kansei Choki. So like that's you know the standard in terms of perpetuating the Ashikaga collection and display practices. So alongside their kind of courtier connections, they also were just as kind of active in the ink painting um, arena, which would you know back up what you just said about the collection becoming so important. Yeah. So it's not a per it's not a shift from center to periphery so much as a dissemination. A yeah, or a kind of, um, yeah, a, a, a reconstitution of the authority of the center within a new matrix or something. Yeah, I, I think it, if you could somehow tap into the authority, you know, uh, of something, even as what is the original source of the authority fades <laughs> into history, but if you can be the bearer you know, of, of that aura. Yeah. Um, I think it becomes more an, I, a matter of aura rather than a sort of resemblance or anything. Um, and, uh, you know, it's why later on you had <coughs> fights over who could use one of Seshu's characters in their last name and stuff, you know. It, it, it was about who has, the, who has the right and who has the greatest for how do you get the aura to stick to you, you know, and to your works? So I think I th that's how I often look at it, you know. And I think Motonobu, for example, he still to some degree because of his father, who his father was, he could tap in a bit to the aura of, of mm -hmm. uh, Yoshimasa's collection and, and so forth like that, so. Um, yeah, so, so I, I think it remains quite That's the interesting strong. thing about a painter, right? Yeah. Is that a painter doesn't necessarily have to just own the painting models, but you can actually internalize them by, by practicing them and copying them to such a degree that you, through bodily man memory, you are the models. Mm -hmm. you, you perpetuate the models uh, as a kind of intangible, bearer of intangible craft. And then you are, you are the tradition. Right. And mm -hmm. you could take it anywhere. Even though it looks nothing, mm -hmm. nothing. Even, <laughs> even though it ends up and looking like Kaesong. <laughs> what, what do you think about the Motonobu's case? Uh, I mean, Masanobu? Yeah. Uh, it's clear that, uh, you know, 
he knows many Chinese painting in the right. Chonet collections. Right. And uh, wh what do you think about Motonobu? He can really see that's a a have an access to the. That's why I changed topics. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> because, <laughs> because really, the you know the decade or two before and the decade or two after 1500. Mm. That's a decade before. It's really, for me, hmm. at least, kind of a mystery for the oh. Carmel. Oh. Like, what the heck is going on? Hmm. I mean, was so, but I think maybe when he was quite young, hmm. Motonobu maybe accompanied his father. Oh, yeah. And, and, and had some exposure to the great Chinese painting oh. collection. But I, I think things changed so much. Um, he didn't see, I mean, I'm, I'm, maybe this sounds crass, he just didn't see it as the way to fame and fortune anymore. Mm -hmm. He took a different route. But, but I mean, I think he was very, um, you know, conscious of expanding the possibilities mm -hmm. of patronage mm -hmm. or clients. Could we ask? Professor Shimao about this too, because uh, absolutely. In so Motonobu works with Soami yeah. in 1513 for Daisein, and if anybody represents the shogunal painting knowledge of the shogunal painting collection and its tradition, it's it's Soami. So they work together at Daisein in 1513, and I always wonder if uh, that's another source of proximity to the to the to the tradition that um, somehow is that. Affair to to think of that as a kind of a a, a master disciple or mentor mentee relationship, uh, Shimao Sensei. Ah, oh, oh, I don't know, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's not clear. But uh, I I think yeah, yeah Motonov got something from yeah. uh, Soami. From Soami, yes. And it's uh, still the fifty years after, almost fifty forty. Mm -hmm. Years after the only war, the war yeah. and then you you know the the financial Ashikaga shogunate had uh, financial problems, and so the after the only war, Yoshimasa sold it and uh, or used it for the daimotsu, yeah. the su substance for su substitute mm -hmm. for the event or something. So the probably the Motonobu sage. The, the shognet collection, we're not sure that there is no strict record, but uh, the not most, but the certain part of the shognet collection was dispar yeah. dispersed to the other daimyo or merchant or something. Yeah. I, I, I would just make a technical, or just because they both worked at the Daisenin, mm -hmm didn't mean they worked in any way together. <laughs> oh, mean, yeah, that, that, but uh, uh, what do you think about the uh, you know, reconstruction program? <laughs> the what? Reconstruction program, they <laughs> say. I, I, don't, I don't have thoughts on oh. that. But, but anyway, they are, you know, the corrupt, it's a corroborated work. Mm -hmm. that I said, and uh, so I mean, painting the center, central part, and then Motonobu, the next part. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, my opinion is uh, at that time, it's already in the age of the memory of Ashikaga Yoshimasa. Mm -hmm. So that uh, Kuntai Kan Sochoki, yeah. yeah. that's a, uh, you know, a sort of a secret book that so I mean, uh, compiled with the you know, no knowledge and memory of the Yoshimasa collection and the what happened in Higashi Yamada no they raised it. Mm -hmm. And also his, he was a Konosa at that time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, right. so we have Konosa. Right, authentication labels. Authent yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. By right. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, the, the, for me it looks like the situation is uh, Kanari completely <laughs> <laughs> changed. Mm -hmm. And so even the figures like Motonobu or Soami, it's not easy to access 
the you know famous, the very known Chinese painting like uh, in Zhongyu yeah. collection. Mm -hmm. right. I see. I wonder if we might um, switch gears to talking about Wakan, um, which is something that Professor Shimao actually just gave his last lecture about um, a little bit uh, for Gakshun and at Columbia and sort of think about how the t material we talked about today relates to these rubrics of, of Wakan. <laughs> Isn't that your part? <laughs> 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 Thank you. Maybe we should just elaborate more. <laughs> For those Europeanists in the audience. Explain what Wakan is. What Wakan is. Wakan. Oh. <laughs> Maybe Melissa, do you want to say, say a little bit about Wakan? Well, traditionally, there's been sort of a binary division in Japanese painting between wa, which means Yamato, or Japanese-style painting, and then kang, being Chinese painting or Chinese-style painting. And that kind of binary and definition is shifting constantly over the course of history. And, and every kind of region and era has a different take on this relationship, but it's one that generated a lot of creativity because the wa, the Japanese painting, becomes kind of emblematic of self-identity versus the outside Chinese identity and how those two can co-mingle. Um, and there is a lot of co-mingling and interaction that's quite interesting. Yeah, so the, this age, around the 1500, it's a you know the tra transitional age of even in probably Wakan, maybe Wa is a sort of concrete. So <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I think you know like um, a scholar in Japan, Takagishi Akira, oh, yeah. talks about how the artist that I showed today, Tosa Mitsunoko, oh, yeah, yeah. actually it's he changes the chi Japanese painting to look like Chinese oh. painting, mm -hmm. right? So all of oh, his yeah. brushwork it looks a little bit mm. like sort of the strokes of mm. Chinese ink painting a little bit. So he kind of has a new vision of kind of like creating Sinitic Japanese painting yeah. right in this mm. period. Mm. So the usual we say that it's a ja Wakan Konko or Wakan, Wakan Kentai, the mixture of the, you know, as a both, both of Wa and Kang in one person. But uh, th that scheme is a little bit too too simple. <laughs> so the in Karae Chinese style painting, it's a complicated that the Chinese paint Chinese painting by Chinese painter is Karae, and the Chinese style painting by Japanese painter is also Karae. So it's like a <laughs> Chinese cuisine. <laughs> so <laughs> and. The French is saying in Tokyo. <laughs> that, um, so that is the basically the Korea class, not the Korea classification. So, for instance, uh, our now washoku, the Japanese food is originally came from China. <laughs> so, and uh, so this age is a sort of the many types of things that happen between the Wakan. So for instance, uh, I eh, mentioned the uh, disciple of Shoke. He's just studied from Japanese painter, almost. Japanese karai, Japanese painter. So it's like a miso ramen or <laughs> something. <laughs> the ramen only <laughs> exists in Japanese. So. <laughs> and then Sesson. <coughs> and the, at that time, uh, it related to the, the previous topic, but the uh, Hojo, Go Hojo, came to Odawara, Kanto area. And he collected uh, some good Chinese painting and uh, brought a Kano painter <laughs> from Kyoto. So then the situation changed, and uh, Sesson went to Odawara, and look at that kind of, he could look at that kind of painting. So it's a sort of, uh, you know, the looking at Kyoto, sure not in it, uh, we can describe it, but uh, it's a sort of a network. Mm -hmm. Situation is a sort of network and uh, it's moving. 
from the side to side each other. And also the like uh, Sakura, the you know the information and uh, transportation of the painting or money or so it's very complicated and so. But I, may I add? I I, th I love the idea of Kyoto as thinking of Kyoto as a network uh, rather than a place for for artistic geography and um, for Wakang. Uh, Gene Phillips has a famous uh, article about uh, Motonobu, Kano Motonobu, in uh, later, lighter chronicles in the 17th century, there's a, uh, a painting history called Honchogashi, which describes Motonobu's primary uh, place in painting history as someone who synthesized Wai and Kang. And what's interesting about that, so he synthesizes Japanese uh, tr traditions as, as uh, epitomized by Tosa Mitsunobu and Chinese or Karai painting traditions as epitomized by Seshu. And uh, what's interesting about that is it's a narrative structure that, uh, as Jean says, to help us understand and conceptualize painting history in very simple ways. And in many ways, art historians have tried to go in and, and complicate that story with, as Melissa said, Takagishi Akira trying to say that, well, Tosa Mitsunobu has already been doing a little bit of that incorporating a little bit of karae, like uh, ink painting and, and so forth. And so there's wakang as a narrative device. And then there is uh, wai and kang as it, as it actually plays out in the art historical record. And so I guess I would ask, what is the current state of thinking about wai and kang in the actual art historical record? Um, is uh, So there's a lot of Chinese style painting already in Tosa Mitsunobu, who we previously thought of as a kind of Yamatoe painter. And there is Toskano Motonobu, who is doing a lot of things with emaki, which we previously thought of as a, as a Yamatoe. Uh, so, so what is the current state of thinking about why, why, and, why and Kang? Is, it, is that just a narrative construct that we should throw out and... Uh, I, <laughs> Is it not very useful for stylistic analysis or anything else we do in art history? Or? I, I think, you know, uh, it, pedagogically, if, you know, if you're, it's, it's very dangerous. <laughs> you know, if you say, okay, students, is this Wa or Khan? <laughs> Which in the past, you know, uh, was something people did. but. You know, I, I wouldn't throw it out, I, I think, because it's a problematic <coughs> that the people of the day dealt with, right? It, even if, I mean, if you read Honchogashi, good, goodness knows, it's all over the place. Um, and so I don't think you can throw out something that is part of the discourse of the periods you're studying. Um, um, you just have to, you know, you have to always be ready to complicate things or to accept complications to things. Um, and you know, <laughs> one of the things, uh, you know, uh, or something I was, ho someone we, I was hoping we could have here today is someone who specialized in Buddhist painting around 1500. Finding somebody like that was impossible. You know, it, it's um, because I think, you know, we, we can talk about emaki, we can talk about ink paintings, but what everybody's bread and butter was in many cases was Buddhist paintings. And that's where that whole Wakan thing really breaks down. Actually, Wakan is, the, you know, categories, there are only two. <laughs> <laughs> So it, it, it's a, you know, it, it's impossible to use a sort of classification. And, uh, I'm always saying that uh, it's a, that structure is a mist because the Kang, Chinese painting, Chinese style paint, Kalai is Kang, but that inside the Japanese painters were Chinese painting, and then Chinese paintings, Chinese painting here. So the karae kan 
inside of Khan, there is war and Khan. Right. And then that war, in that war, <laughs> the, there's many painters like you know I mentioned. So it's not that to just to divide it better. It's a nest structure, and it's sometimes the you know double and triple or the move like uh, for instance uh, Chano Yu. It was a Kang, Kang Chinese style in Muromachi period, but the Shiko appeared and the Senrikyu, and then moved to it's now the symbol of wa culture, right? <laughs> but it was Ch China Kang was when it was in Muromachi period, so it moved, <laughs> and Karaeto uh, Yamatohe. More. It's very complicated, uh, that kind of nest structure. Mm -hmm. In first uh, late 15th to 16th century, and in Edo period, so their labeling is michakucha, is very mm -hmm. <laughs> confused. The term of karae and kanga or uh, <laughs> nanga or mm -hmm. something, so that, you know, I didn't. But uh, it cannot, it doesn't work as a classification, but it's just a labeling. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah I, th I think exactly. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work as a classification, but it's part of the imaginary oh, yeah. of the yes, period. Yes. So that uh, not classification, but it really working, mm -hmm. like, like as <laughs> we, are, we are talking about that. Yeah, because yeah. Melissa's article mm -hmm. that I love so much, um, it, it really is as much about the imaginary. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, I, are you, were you going to talk about that? Yeah, I I, one thing also that makes it a little bit dangerous that the idea of a, a wa, a Japan, even if it has China in it um, and Japan in it, it has this idea of perpetuating this idea of a mono-ethnic Japan, a kind of pure Yamato that gets actually transported into the present day where we have a Yamato -e exhibition at the Tokyo National Museum that just doesn't really question the category. <laughs> and the public is presented with this idea of Japan as being kind of pure and total, where in fact there are other ethnic identities that are subsumed under wa. Um, so that's a kind of interesting and maybe tricky dynamic. The other thing is wa and kan also get gendered in the discourse. Yes. So wa becomes feminized, mm -hmm. and then kan becomes masculinized. Mm -hmm. And then the image of femininity sort of gets co-opted to create this pure wa realm that is monoethnic and monolithic in some ways. And somehow feminine. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it is an interesting thing, these you're saying this is self um, and you're a big bad warrior but it's also feminized at the same time I mean in their own discourse sort of it's it's, it's a kind of interesting thing I think um, yeah it was much more flexible in the pre-modern period actually it was always a set of um, almost playful imaginary coordinates with which people conceptualized their own cultural yeah. uh, position, and it could be playful like in the court, right? The Heian court, Wakando issue, where you just, mm. but uh, then it becomes reified in the modern era as something that is uh, into something that it was not ever in traditional Japan. Yeah, and, and mm. I think, you know, even going back to talking about Honcho Gashi, it, it really starts in the Edo period with, as you're constructing histories, sort of meant to totalize. Um, those categories can be useful as kind of br blunt tools, um, whereas subtlety is not going to convince everybody your school is the greatest in the world. You know, it, it's... Well, what's interesting about, uh, again, your article, Gene, is that why and come become associated with biographies. Right. And so the Confucian notion of writing history through biographies is applied to wakang, so moto, so uh, seshu is kang, and 
Mitsunobu is wa, and Motonobu is wakan. <laughs> wakan yugo, but that's a very schematic uh, way of telling history through the lives of mm -hmm. painters, right? right? Which is, again, a new notion in Edo based on Chinese precedent. Yeah. But anyway, it's a problem of the how we recognize our, uh, I'm Japanese, so <laughs> my culture. So <laughs> it's a very difficult question that uh, you know, now, now we don't use wakan today. And uh, it's moving to the local and global. But the local and global is not, uh, you know, inside and outside. But uh, we have inside we have local and global inside of our image, right? So it's something like a wakan. <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah. mm, mm, but we have to, you know, care about the, take, take care about the, you know, that kind of conception. Well, oh. Sorry. Um, but may I ask, is, is why in around 1500, uh, w what is, um, I guess I would, uh, it's why and Khan are very relational to one another. So they're always defined in relationship to each other, it seems, uh, and ever more so. But I was going to ask in the case of Seshu, uh, and maybe Stephanie, this is something that you can address. Um, is there any element of, of wa that will be, re and is the Ochi sphere have any wa that against which Seshu's activities are being uh, defined? Yeah, that's, I mean, in thinking about wakan, in the case of Seshu, I, I feel a little stumped <laughs> um, <laughs> because it seems so predominantly Khan. Um, but certainly the ochi themselves, I mean, you, you have the example of the... Their vassals. Their yeah. vassals, and you, you showed the interesting um, mini library that was once owned by the ochi. Right? So clearly they're also partaking of, and of course, sogi and so forth, um, visiting the ochi domain. But in terms of how Seshu was engaging with that, it's, it's really not clear. What do you think? It, the, you know, the Seshu's self image or function in the scheme is different when he is in Yamaguchi and outside, he went outside of Yamaguchi. Yeah, well, one, one thing um, that, I, that I think is interesting is the question of kind of the professionalization of the monk painter. And this, your question, Professor Shimao, brings that to mind because earlier that there was the comment about um, monks being able to kind of freelance more easily, especially in this period, because they're they're existing outside of the kind of dominant social hierarchy. Um, but I wonder if it's in the late 15th century or circa 1500 if it's so much a distinction between monks and lay people, or if it's more the kind of larger historical circumstances, the kind of decentralization, the dissemination, that means that painters are now working for more different patrons. And Kano Motonobu is probably a good, I don't know, example, because he is not a, a monk painter. Um, but we do see with Seshu, Right, predominantly working it seems with the Ochi, but also working with other clans, the Maida, and so forth. And that seems to be a, a kind of distinctive phenomenon that happens in this period, is the sort of freelancing <coughs> spirit of monk painters. And I guess my question is: Is it still is it still because they're monks and they they have this greater freedom? Uh, and the classic example would be like the Ami, right, who have that sort of flexibility to move between different, by virtue of their kind of monastic identity. Um, is it more a legacy of that or kind of a fundamental change in the way that patronage starts to, to be possible with different 
Actors. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I mean, Itsunobu did everything under the sun for yeah. every painter imaginable. I mean, every yeah. patron imaginable. Yeah. He just needed the money in some ways. Like, mm -hmm. he had his regular income from his estate, but then he needed the extra income from all the other wealthy patrons. Yeah. So. And we know that he, he went if, to yeah. um, Ichijo Dani to. I'm not sure he physically went Michael. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but he had, you know, the title of director of the oh, painting yeah. bureau, yeah. which didn't seem to, you know, meant he didn't meet, he wasn't the house painter of the court then by any means. He mm -hmm. was free to do what he wanted. The, the, the reason was that the e economic system changed after the only one on board. Anyway, I, yeah, I mean, Kanomoto Nobu too, I mean, he was far from being a monk, and uh, he seemed to travel fairly easily where he wanted to, you know, and late, late in his life, he served uh, the head of Ishiyama Honganji, which, you know, some of the military leaders hated, um, but he would also serve them, so... Um, I don't think you needed to be a monk anymore to, to travel about and cross boundaries. Except maybe uh, one thing that strikes me about Seshu and other monk painters is that you have to think about their uh, sense of identity according to a, a, synch a um, vertical and uh, a synchronic and diachronic axis, maybe. Synchronic is that, like Seshu, is a c sort of an attendant painter to the Oji. And does work for other daimyo, but he also has a, a dharma affiliation. So he sees himself within a dharma lineage in a certain uh, set of monastic associations. And by 1500, but he's conceptualizing a artistic lineage that's also a Zen lineage. So, you know, w you know Shubung and Josetsu, and it probably goes back to Mincho uh, as well. And he's moving within some kind of uh, Tofkuji monks, and that does actually influence the, the, the routes he takes, the, the, where he travels, and what kind of commissions he gets, most importantly. So uh, it may all come down to economics in the end, but at least in the way a monk painter like Seshu imagines mm -hmm. his own identity, he has certain uh, kind of coordinates that, that, that are governing his, his movements and actions and actually putting him in connection with, mm -hmm. with people in, in real ways. Uh, certainly that's also true of Kenko Shoke and other, and Sesong and other monk painters in the period. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point because even with the institutional affiliation, with someone like Seshu, you start to see even a kind of dabble, I mean, he, right, is a, a Shokokuji monk who somehow has a lot of affinity with the Tofukuji lineage, and that, as you said, is how he's those are the social networks that he's kind of leveraging to, to move around between Southwest Japan and <coughs> even to China. And then we also know that he has some uh, kind of affiliation, or maybe affiliation is too strong a word, but also some engagement with the Soto sect too. Yeah. So there also seems to be a kind of um, fragmenting of, of maybe that kind of institutional affiliation. And I, I'm always uncertain if this is something that, you know, is more widespread, or if this is something that begins with someone like Seshu. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's unclear, yeah. but at least the death case increased after well, the only war. <laughs> because the situation is changed, and everyone is uh, powerful daimyos are here and here and here, here. So they have to collect the information mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, the human network to you know, living in his territory. So he cannot, he cannot almost see the Kyoto or other places anymore. So the, they need... Uh, a certain vessels or uh, uh, the person like Seshu, a certain number of is their 
it's necessary. So the uh, mm. yeah. and even uh, some painters even go back and forth between being a monk and being a layman, right? So oguri soke is it so soke yeah. ga ano, mot, ano, yeah. he, 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 yes, he was a monk of Daitokuji. He was a monk and he abandons the priesthood, mm. yes. right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, Oguri Soritsu turns into mm. Geai. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, not, it's not clear, but uh, yeah. it's possible. Yeah. It's possible, yeah. yeah. So, so there's some sw secular sacred switching. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, oh my, we were, s are we supposed to end at four. It's now 4.20. Oh. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry, we um, probably should wrap things up, but I, we did want to also take this opportunity to acknowledge um, Professor Shamal's retirement and have a little gift of uh, a boutonniere and some flowers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Actually, I have imitated my my title in my PowerPoint. It was still uh, Professor of Gakushin University, but uh, <laughs> I could, <laughs> I could take, uh, Two weeks, two weeks ago. That means this is your Saishu Kogi. Mm. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. We have another event we have to run off to uh, since we've gone over time. And we should probably just run over to the chase. And <laughs> so thank